Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, the, the first session of uh, the, uh, the first talk of today's session. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Sohar uh, Komargotsky to tell us about topological methods in uh, quantum field theory. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Jake. I hope you can hear me well. <coughs> Just apologizing that I cannot be there in person. I had a rampage of COVID through my extended family, so that pretty much prevented me from going anywhere. So I was asked to give a review talk on the uh, uh, topological methods in quantum field theory, mostly emphasizing uh, very recent progress. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. There won't be uh, very many references at all in this talk because there are way too many papers on the subject to give any justice to. So instead, here I captured uh, four reviews and there are actually many other reviews. So these are just four out of probably a few dozens. Uh, but these are four reviews you might want to uh, look at at some point if you're uh, interested in diving more into the subject. And I'll also sprinkle a few reviews here and there or some papers during the talk, but very, very few references. So I apologize for that. All right, so let me begin. Of course, uh, symmetries have played uh, a huge role in physics for many centuries, but the role of symmetries has been elevated even further with the advent of quantum mechanics. Uh, so quantum mechanics promoted symmetries to even a higher uh, somehow in level of importance in physics and the applications of group theory have become uh, indispensable and we all know that so the role of symmetries in physics continues to grow and people are learning more and more especially with these recent ideas about generalized symmetries that i'll review so uh, since the subject might be a little bit abstract I'll first introduce a very elementary example that you can mention even to your students in the undergraduate quantum mechanics, which shows how important it is to uh, carefully understand symmetries and anomalies and some even more advanced subjects. Then I'll review a little bit the textbook notion of symmetry. I'll review the no, I'll, I'll review some recent generalizations of the notion of symmetry. We'll speak, we'll talk a little bit about what anomalies mean. And then I'll go quickly over additional applications. This will be very quick. I'll just flesh out a few applications of these things. In addition to this quantum mechanical example uh, that I'll try to clarify after we go over all of that. So let me begin with just ordinary plain quantum mechanics. It cannot get simpler than that. So what do we know about uh, a potential like this with two minima in quantum mechanics? So classically, of course, it has two ground states. So the particle can sit here and here. Quantum mechanically, one of the salient features that we teach in undergraduate or graduate courses in quantum mechanics is that, in fact, there is only one uh, ground state. It's non-degenerate. And it somehow spread equally over these two over these two minima. So the particle is in a superposition of being here and here. And uh, the mechanism which lifts the classical degeneracy is by instantons. So instantons in some situations provide a well-defined expansion that allows to understand how this degeneracy is lifted. These are, of course, uh, completely elementary comments that everybody knows. I'm just setting the stage. Now I'm going to slightly generalize this problem. Uh, I'm going to slightly generalize this problem and you'll see that it's becoming more and more uh, interesting. So in some models, you will see that there is a strange destructive interference between instanton events. And this cancellation between instanton happens to all orders and it leads to an exact degeneracy of the ground state. So you might remember that oftentimes in quantum mechanics, we're told that the ground state must always be symmetric and non-degenerate and instantons would always lift the degeneracy. So I'll show you now that this is actually not true. So let's start from a small variant of the problem that we had on the previous slide. 
where we have two classical minima on a circle. So we have a particle moving on a circle or a ring, and we have two classical minima at the upper end, the north pole of the circle and the south pole of the circle. So I'm just looking at a completely ordinary particle moving on a ring with a potential which is like a cosine of twice the angle. So there are two minima. Okay, what do we know about this problem? Well, here, of course, again, there will be quantum tunneling and instantons, and there will be a single ground state. So the particle will be equally spread between the north pole and the south pole of the circle. Okay, so now, um, yeah, so just to be more formally precise, uh, there are, this cosine potential preserves a shift by pi symmetry, just a shift by 180 degrees. And it also preserves a reflection around this axis. So the true unique ground state would be symmetric under those two operations. Okay, so now the very last step of the uh, introduction into this model is that I'll put a half a unit of uh, Aharonov bomb flux uh, through the ring. So classically, of course, it makes absolutely no difference because the particle never sees this solenoid, but as you know, in quantum mechanics, a, a solenoid with some magnetic flux where the particle is charged under the corresponding U1 gauge field can lead to this uh, Aharonov bomb phases. So when we write the Hamiltonian, this is reflected by a funny half in a, modifying the kinetic term for the particle. Now again, there are two ground states up and down and, you, and instantons might lift those, this degeneracy. But here comes the surprise. We will soon claim that for any value of the coupling G, even when it's a very strongly interacting model and there is no hope of finding the energy levels exactly, uh, there will be exactly a twofold degenerate ground state. So in this case, the claim is that uh, there, is no, there, is, there is a degenerate ground state. So, there is, so the usual lore about quantum mechanics is perhaps uh, violated. Okay. so. The G equals zero version of this model is trivial to analyze. G equals zero is when we have no interaction. Well, then it's just a free particle moving around in a Haronov bomb half unit flux. These are the energy levels. And obviously there is a degeneracy between N equals zero and N equals one. So the free model has this twofold degeneracy, but uh, the claim is that even when the interaction is added, with an arbitrary coefficient, uh, this uh, degeneracy is not lifted. So this is a weird, a weird model with two minima classically, which remain in the full theory non-perturbatively. So this is a very useful example, I think, because if you started to do instanton computations, you would see that something weird is going on that instantons cancel each other. And uh, you would not find an instant on the list of the jersey, but um, this is a very useful example to think about anomalies and discrete symmetries carefully, because really the explanation, the explanation of why there is this degeneracy comes from some pretty modern ideas, uh, which uh, yeah, might be unfamiliar even to experts. Uh, so that's, uh, that's the motivation. I'll try to explain this example at the very end and give a few more applications. Well, I was told that there are no questions, so I'll just keep going, uh, assuming that this was pretty clear. Just see if there is some. Okay, let me now remind you what is a, so hopefully this example gives you a tiny bit of motivation to keep following. And there will be more interesting QFT examples later on. So let me just uh, go over the notion of a symmetry to remind you what is a symmetry. Well, the textbook definition is that it's a continuous transformation of the equations of motion that does not change the equations of motion. So this leads a la Noether to a conserved current and then we can integrate this conserved current over some surface, which is D minus one dimensional. So if we're in four dimensions, this would be a three dimensional integral. And we exponentiate it and we get some quantum operator, okay? And now 
this quantum operator acts on the Hilbert space. It acts on the Fox, it acts on the in and out states if there is an S matrix. And this operator U alpha is oftentimes a, called a topological operator. So this is a very important piece of terminology that I have to introduce. It's called a topological operator because it's not really changing very, it's not gonna, as an operator that acts on the Hilbert space, it does not depend on the choice of this three dimensional surface or D minus one dimensional surface very much. So until this any small deformation of the surface is not gonna change U alpha as a quantum operator on the Hilbert space. So we call such operators topological oftentimes. Now this topological operator U alpha, if it encircles or wraps a local operator, it just leads to the usual action of a symmetry on a local operator. So the operator doesn't change very much if you change the contour a little bit, but if you cross a local operator, the price that you have to pay is that you have to act on the local operator by the usual adjoint action of the symmetry on local operators. So local operators furnish a representation, and then you just act on this local operator in the corresponding representation. So uh, of course, this, this uh, properties of U alpha namely A, that it's invariant under small deformations of the surface sigma, and B, that when it wraps a local operator, it leads to this uh, action on the, of the symmetry and local operators. This is what is used in all textbooks to derive uh, all the known word identities. Also, this is what's used to derive the constraints on the S matrix. Now, this is of course very well known but there has been um, there have been proposals for several generalizations of these canonical ideas from a hundred years ago. So let me go over the interesting generalizations to uh, these ideas. So the main idea, I mean the main the main rubric or paradigm, is that in quantum field theory in general there could be many topological operators, namely operators like U alpha, which depend very weakly. On the uh, on the surface on which on some on some surface on which they are defined, and so the idea is to associate any such object which depends only topologically, or only or is independent under small deformations of a certain surface sigma. We will call it a generalized symmetry. So you can think about it as a conservation law because it's independent of the space-like slice that you choose, or you can just think about it in Euclidean signature as a certain topological operator. And the point is that this doesn't have to be associated with symmetries of the action. There could be quantum filters with such topological operators that have nothing to do with the transformations that leave the action or the equations of motion invariant. And this is a very powerful generalization. Uh, since this idea was uh, advocated in various papers in mass, physics, I mean, condensed matter, high energy physics, people have found lots of uh, very interesting and deep examples of uh, conservation laws, if you wish, or word identities, if you wish, or topological operators that have nothing to do with the transformations that leave the equations of motion invariant. It is very confusing, but it's true. And by now we have uh, myriads of examples, but that's the main idea. So once you accept this idea as a valid generalization of the notion of symmetry, that any topological extended operator would be called a generalized symmetry, uh, you can think about many generalizations of Netter's ideas, right? So let me go over some generalizations. These are not exhaustive. So first of all, this is a completely trivial comment, ordinary discrete symmetries. So of course, we all know that discrete symmetries don't have a conserved current, but if you accept this generalization, they, I mean, uh, they still lead to a topological operator. So discrete symmetries don't have a conserved current, but in the abstract world of QFT, they still lead to an operator U alpha, which depends secretly on a D minus one dimensional manifold sigma. And it depends on this manifold in a very weak fashion, namely it's independent under small deformations. So ordinary discrete symmetries in this, in this sense uh, are also associated to topological operators of co-dimension one. Co-dimension one, I mean dimension D minus one. 
Of course, this is a trivial remark and everybody knew it probably from the time of uh, Wigner that uh, discrete symmetries also correspond to topological operators. But it's just useful to make this remark. Now, there are much less obvious generalizations. So nobody said that the topological operators in quantum field theory have to be associated to code dimension one surfaces, namely D minus one dimensional surfaces. So it's useful to introduce the notion of a p-form symmetry. A p-form symmetry is something that's associated to topological operator of code dimension p plus one. And then what we used to call symmetries, namely another type symmetries, they correspond to p equals zero and they correspond. So p equals zero means that a zero form symmetry it's associated to a code dimension one topological operator. But it could be that there are p-form symmetries in quantum field theory. In fact, there are trivial examples of quantum filters with a P4 symmetry. Let me give you the simplest example. Just take a free photon or a free, free Maxwell theory. So free Maxwell theory in D dimensions has a one form electric symmetry and a D minus three form magnetic symmetry. So let me construct the operators. In this example, since it's three, it's very easy to construct the topological operators. So you have no matter field, it's just a free Maxwell field. So one topological operator is to take the field strengths, take the Hodge dual, then you get a D minus two form and integrate it over a D minus two dimensional manifold that I keep implicit here. This will be a topological operator. What is the physical meaning of this topological operator? It measures how much electric charge you have within some region of space. And since there are no dynamical particles which carry charge in this model, this is conserved. So the amount of electric charge within any bounded region of space is conserved in, electro in free Maxwell theory because there is no charge creation. Okay, so and another analogous conservation law is called the D minus three four magnetic symmetry. It's obtained by integrating this a object which is a certain d minus two form then you take the hodge dual you get a two form you integrate it over a two-dimensional space this measures the magnetic charge within some region of space and this is the d minus three form symmetry in four dimensions both of them are one form symmetries since both of them are given by integrating over a two-dimensional manifold so you see this immediately shows that there are conservation laws that are not of the nether type they don't correspond to integrating a conserved current over a three-dimensional manifold in four dimensions. Here, we just integrate over a two-dimensional manifold in four dimensions in, for both UE and UM. And they don't correspond, these objects do not correspond to ordinary Nether transformations. This is, of course, a, a trivial theory. It's a free model. But the power of these ideas is that such symmetries exist even in SUN yang mills theory. And I'll mention that soon. So this is what I already tried to say that, I mean, these are conserved quantities. These weird integrals are conserved and they correspond to topological operators on the Hilbert space because there are no dynamical particles uh, with, which carry magnetic or electric charge. And another cute idea is that uh, you could say like generalized symmetries could be spontaneously broken in the same fashion that zero form symmetries namely ordinary symmetries could be spontaneously broken. So it is a correct comment to say that in four dimensions, uh, this one form symmetry is spontaneously broken, both the electric and the magnetic in four dimensions are spontaneously broken. And as such, there is a Golston boson, but the Golston boson now is a vector particle, it's the photon. So it is perhaps true that uh, like we have soft theorems for the pion, Self theorems for the photon might be possible to interpret in this language of spontaneously broken symmetry. And actually, even though this comment has been uh, very much advocated in recent years as the correct interpretation of the photon, uh, there is a there is a very the, we've, people found an older paper by Kovner and Rosenstein which has a very similar comment, though in a different language, of course, they didn't talk about one form symmetries, but it has a similar in spirit comment. 
Okay, let me now get to the final, final generalization of the notion of symmetry, which in the case of two dimensions is nicely reviewed here. Uh, so this is probably the most abstract generalization of a symmetry. So for that, I have to go back a few slides and give you some additional comments. So one property of these topological operators that uh, are given by Nutter charges is that as matrices on the Hilbert space, those are unitary matrices. So U, U dagger is one. Why? Uh, well, it's, the idea is that we take a current, it's supposed to be a Hermitian operator, we exponentiate it with a phase, and we get some group element acting on the Hilbert space. So it's a unitary. But if we accept this idea of generalizing symmetries in this way, that any topological surface would be, course, would be a generalized symmetry, there is no reason to expect that generalized symmetries are group elements or unitary matrices. So it, there could be topological surfaces of code dimension one or code dimension two, whatever, that are not even that are not associated to group element, and they might not even be invertible. So you probably see that there are nowadays there are papers on non-invertible symmetries every other day. So non-invertible symmetries are just operators which depend which are topological, but they are not unitary matrices on the Hilbert space. The most extreme example is perhaps in the two-dimensional Ising model, one plus one-dimensional Ising model, there is a topological symmetry, a topological co-dimension one surface, which annihilates a local operator. This is impossible for conservation laws that follow from Nutter's charges, because as I told you, uh, they must lead to some action on the operator in some representation. So by Schur's lemma, it cannot annihilate this operator. But with the non-invertible symmetries, they can even annihilate operators. So they're clearly non-invertible matrices on the Hilbert space. And you can show that this rule with some addition, together with some additional rules leads to, an, in, leads to all the correlation functions of the Ising model are consistent with this assignment, provided a few more rules that you have to learn how to operate with such non-invertible symmetries. So such objects that correspond to conservation laws not coming from any group, not associated to a group, are a, probably uh, the most abstract objects I'll mention here. Now I want to get um, to the last uh, topic that I want to review before running through a few applications, which are anomalies. So we talked about symmetries, generalized symmetries, and there is, of course, uh, anomalies. Um, as I mentioned, generalized symmetries could be broken very much like ordinary symmetries, and they could have anomalies very much like ordinary symmetries. So I want to quickly review what anomalies mean for this uh, generalized symmetries in that setup. Let me first remind you of a few things about ordinary anomalies that we learn about from textbooks. So ordinary anomalies correspond to the lack of symmetry conservation, charge conservation, when you have classical background fields. Here, I wanna make a very clear distinction between the ABG anomaly. So let me remind you that in QED, there is an axial U1, but that axial U1 uh, is really not conserved. It's not a symmetry. There is no topological operator corresponding to axial U1 because it is not an invertible one because um, it's violated by instantons of QED. So I'm not talking about those things. Those things for me are like non-existent sym symmetries that just don't exist. However, there are sometimes symmetries, ordinary symmetries, which are perfectly conserved and they have topological operators corresponding to them. But when you turn on classical background fields, like uh, a, a background field, like a background magnetic field or electric field, something that's not fluctuating, you can destroy charge conservation. Okay, so this is called the Tooft anomaly. And Tooft anomalies have had uh, probably their most spectacular applications in the QCD, where we have SU3 times SU3. It's a genuine symmetry. I'm not talking about the axial U1, but there is a Tooft anomaly for SU3 times SU3. And people have over the years worked out the consequences of those anomalies. You can find a lot of them in this review, but it leads to constraints on the neutral pion decay. It leads to constraints on meson scattering, 
Uh, in particular, it gives the leading amplitude for meson scattering that violates uh, G parity. So, Hooft anomalies are more physical than ABG anomalies. ABG anomalies just mean that some symmetry doesn't exist. There is no topological operator, so we don't care. But Hooft anomalies mean, yes, there is a topological operator, but there's something subtle about it in the presence of, in the presence of classical sources. So I'm only gonna talk about Hooft anomalies. Okay, so how do we generalize this idea to the world of generalized symmetries? So we generalize it, we can generalize it to these P-form symmetries and non-invertible symmetries uh, in the following way. So this is a little bit uh, abstract, but just bear with me for a few slides. So the idea is that we, the, ob the fundamental object when you speak about generalized symmetries are not the transformation rules or the currents since those don't exist. The fundamental objects are these topological surfaces. So the notion of a Tooft anomaly arises when you try to think about what happens if you put many topological surfaces which can even intersect on a general four dimensional or d dimensional space. So we say by definition that there is no Tooft anomaly if you can reconnect those surfaces without any ambiguity. So think about the two-dimensional torus, put two topological lines. You can, you, by a small modification, you can convert them to this shape or to this shape. These are just two allowed resolution of this intersection. And if all those resolutions can be done unambiguously, we say that the network can consistently reconnect and there is no Tooft anomaly. And this way of thinking about Hooft anomalies of, as reconnection of surfaces is extremely powerful. And it gives the correct generalization of a Hooft anomaly that we've been using for decades for ordinary continuous symmetries. So for instance, probably the most famous example is that a two dimensional system or one plus one dimensional system with only bosons, you don't even need fermions to have Hooft anomalies of this sort. Well, there could be a minus sign here. So when you try to reconnect these topological surfaces in this way, there could be a minus sign. This minus sign is the analog, is the analog of that Tooft anomaly that we've been computing since we are in grad school. But this minus sign is harder to compute. Like you can try to imagine how would you compute how this uh, topological surfaces reconnect. It's more difficult to compute. But if this minus sign exists, it's a Tooft anomaly for a Z2 symmetry in one plus one dimensions. So this kind of anomalies for discrete symmetries or generalized symmetries have almost as powerful consequences as the usual Tooft anomalies that we've been using for decades. And that's why this subject is useful because all of a sudden we have tons of new constraints as long as we can compute those anomalies. So of course, this cannot be computed from some triangle diagram. There are no currents, it's all about Z2, and there are not even fermions necessarily, it could be a bosonic system. So usually such anomalies imply that the ground state must be gapless. So there must be some massless modes. Uh, it could imply that there is symmetry breaking. And another scenario that could be implied by such discrete anomalies is that there is a topological field theory at low energies. So the constraints from having such anomalies are pretty severe. They imply that the ground state cannot be trivial. And maybe this now rings a bell with the quantum mechanical example, or we had uh, a, a gapless ground state. There was a twofold degeneracy. There are even papers recently like this one showing that sometimes these discrete anomalies have even more stringent consequences than those that I've just listed here you can sometimes even rule out this option. So sometimes you can really prove that this kind of minus sign, like I showed you before, implies uh, either massless modes or symmetry breaking. So sometimes you can really go very far with these discrete anomalies. So now I'm going to quickly revisit my undergraduate quantum mechanics example in the language that I've just introduced. So we are looking at this Hamiltonian and somebody came and told us that for any G, the twofold degeneracy of the ground state is not lifted. And this sounds weird, but we can explain it with anomalies. 
So first, let's identify the symmetries of this system. There is a Z2 times Z2, zero form symmetry. So there are no, it's an ordinary symmetry, not a generalized symmetry in this model. And this just corresponds to the obvious translation by 180 degrees and reflection along the uh, vertical axis. So this just forms Z2 times Z2 classically, okay? However, exactly this sort of weird minus sign, like in this example, arises in this example. So there is a minus sign if you try to commute, so you can construct for each of those symmetries the netter operator u, which is the top, you know, the topological local operator that measures the charge. But the algebra is deformed. There is a funny minus sign. And it's a very simple exercise to prove that there is a minus sign. You can compute this minus sign at vanishing g. It's a free field theory, free quantum mechanics. You can compute it, you can compute this minus sign at vanishing g. And then you just give a topological argument that this minus sign cannot disappear continuously. So it must be present for a non-zero finite G as well. So because of this minus sign, you can immediately conclude that the degenerate, non-degenerate ground state is forbidden. It's, per, it, it, it's not consistent with this algebra to have a unique ground state. Because of the minus sign, if there was a unique ground state, the left-hand side would give you plus one, but the right-hand side would give you minus one and you'd run into a contradiction. So, this is a quantum mechanical system with no fermions, obviously, it's just a boson living on a ring, which has a quantum anomaly, a Toft anomaly. So it's somehow this is the simplest example to show the power of these ideas. You can ask, why didn't we see it in undergrad? And their answer basically is that it cannot be achieved with just a Z2 symmetry. You need at least a Z2 times Z2. This has to do with the fact that these signs that appear in the intersection of topological operators are classified by a certain group cohomology. And for just one Z2, there is, no, there, is no, there is no possibility to obtain an interesting minus sign. You need at least two Z2s to obtain a non-trivial minus sign. So that's why uh, maybe it's not the first example you'd encounter, but it's generic, I would say. Okay, now in the last five minutes, I'll just quickly run over much more interesting applications of this uh, non-perturbative anomalies and generalized symmetries. This will be very quick, but it's meant to only give you an impression of what kind of things we can do with these ideas. So first, uh, let's start in one plus one dimensions, 2D. Uh, the system is the SUN gauge field coupled to a Majorana fermion. It's a very nice gapped, quantum field theory. It's a massless Majorana fermion in the adjoint representation of SUN. It's a very nice uh, you know, gapped, uh, confined, well, <laughs> we'll get to that. It's a, a nice gap theory that people have been studying for ages, at least for three decades. And uh, one can say a lot about it. This system has a generalized, one, a generalized symmetry. It has a ZN one form symmetry. This ZN one form symmetry is analogous to the U1 one form symmetry that we saw in Maxwell theory that corresponded to the conservation of electric charge. Here, because we have only a fermion in the adjoint representation, there is no conservation of electric charge, but there is a mod N conservation of electric charge because an adjoint fermion cannot cancel um, the Young tableaus if you measure the mod N. Also, this system has an ordinary chiral symmetry but really the reason that I'm telling you about this field theory is that this field theory has an exponential number of conservation laws that are completely non-obvious from the Lagrangian point of view. It has an X two to the power two N non-invertible symmetries. Uh, they cannot be understood in any classical way as transformations of this action, but they are genuine conservation laws. And so this model was revisited because, you know, after so many years of work, of work on this model, uh, it's only now become clear. It has only now become clear that there are so many new conservation laws that people have missed. And they actually have lots of consequences. So first of all, using these new conservation laws, it was proven that this model is actually deconfined. This might be a little surprising given that there are no fundamental fermions. So how can a Wilson line in the fundamental be screened? But it is screened. This model is deconfined. The adjoint fermion screens the fundamental Wilson line. 
Furthermore, there are tons of vacua in this model that are exactly degenerate, actually an exponential amount. And finally, you can even do something that can be compared with the lattice. You can put a small quark mass, ask what is the string tension, because then the theory is confined and the string tension is non-zero. And there is an exact prediction from the non-invertible symmetries for the string tension. This could be presumably soon checked on the lattice. Uh, I could, I want to make one comment about 3D. Probably I'll run out of time before I get to 4D. Uh, so in 3D, uh, this is the case which is most interesting to condensed matter physicists. And in condensed matter physics, this whole subject that I've been telling you about has come up in the following fashion. So they've looked at a model with the U1 gauge field coupled to two massive scalars. It's very simple. It's just U1 gauge theory with two charge scalars of charge one and some quartic potential. And by studying the phase diagram of this model, they have found several phases, which are called the VBS phase, uh, sorry, VBS phase and nail phase. They are inspired by some spin system in condensed matter. But the thing is that when condensed matter people have been looking at the phases of this model, they have never seen a phase where the symmetry is completely uh, completely unbroken and that the model is gap. So it's a system with a SO3 symmetry and U1 symmetry. But as you try to scan the phase diagram as a function of all these parameters, you never see a phase which is completely trivial with unbroken symmetry. And this violates, of course, Lando's, Lando Ginzburg logic. If you think about any Lando Ginzburg model with scalar fields in a representation of SU3 and U1, SO3 and U1, there will always be a phase where all the scalars are massive and the vacuum is unique. But in this model, there isn't such a phase. So the whole, con the whole subject of beyond Lando Ginzburg theory arose from such examples. And the explanation of how come that there is a field theory with such simple symmetries that doesn't have a trivial phase is of course due to anomalies. There is a discrete anomaly in this system. Even though there are no fermions and it's in 3D, you might, have heard that there are no anomalies in odd dimensions. This, of course, all is false when you go to the world of generalized symmetries and discrete anomalies. This system does have a quantum anomaly. It's very much like this funny phase that I told you about before. And this quantum anomaly prohibits the existence of a trivial phase. So these models are somehow really outside of the framework of landau ginzburg phase transitions. So that was very interesting to condensed matter physicists. Okay, I had some few more comments about 3D, a few more comments about uh, Young Mills theory with a theta angle in 4D, but I've reached the end of my talk. So I'll just uh, quickly summarize. These generalized symmetries and, this, and, this, and anomalies for generalized symmetries appear in all dimensions, two, three, four, with and without fermions, unlike what we're used to from chiral anomalies. They place very stringent constraints on the infrared physics. We've seen that they preclude the existence of a trivial gapped phase. They lead sometimes to exponentially, exponentially large degeneracy. Uh, there was a, well, a renaissance of analysis of various gauge theories in recent years because these new constraints could sometimes lead to new predictions. And some of them have already been tested on the lattice. And even an experiment in the context of condensed matter system systems. There are connections to mathematics. I just quickly touched on that. I told you that there is some discrete cohomology that is associated to this minus sign in the undergraduate quantum mechanics example. Of course, this can be pushed much further. And there is a whole subject of category theory that addresses these generalized symmetries. And I didn't even, of course, it goes without saying that it's a huge subject and I didn't cover lots of lots of aspects. So thank you so much. So, thank you, Zohar. Um, we have time for a couple of questions. Yes, Martin. Thank you. Does it work? Yeah, thank you, Zohar, for a very nice and clear talk. This is Martin Schnabel speaking. So I just didn't understand one minor point in your undergraduate example. Uh, the symmetry phi goes to minus phi seems to be broken by the Aharonov bomb flux. 
seems that oh, the, yeah, yes, can you comment on this yeah it's a great question um let me go back to the picture it's an excellent question martin it's a key point that i kind of jumped over okay so if you put exactly half flux then the symmetry phi going to minus phi takes any unit of flux to minus itself so if the, you have five units of flux after sorry if you have uh, let's say x x units of flux uh, uh, the symmetry phi going to minus phi will take x to minus x however the flux is defined mod one so putting a half integer amount of flux is fine because it takes a half to minus a half and a half and minus a half are exactly the same because we know that the integer unit of flux is completely transparent so if i put here an integer unit of flux it would be exactly the same model so putting a minus a half or plus a half doesn't matter because shifting by an integer is like a gate transformation it doesn't do anything okay thank you so it is a symmetry so the, sh the, the, the short answer is that a half integer unit of flux is symmetric under phi going to minus phi uh hi sahar this is julia thanks for a very nice review talk uh, Thank you. Can you comment on the explicit breaking of, of these more general symmetries? I mean, for, for an ordinary zero form symmetry, we know that we can add local operators for one form charge matter, but is there any general picture of how we can explicitly break these more kind of exotic kinds of symmetries? Yeah, if you're talking about, uh, the, so the question is again, very good. Uh, if you're talking about co-dimension one, zero form, yeah, uh, non-invertible symmetries, you can break them in the same way that you've been breaking zero form symmetries all, er all along. So local operators can break non-invertible zero form symmetry. Uh, in fact, this little computation of the string tension comes by adding a mass term for the quark, and you can show that this mass term breaks this exponentially many uh, zero form non-invertible symmetries. So this comment number one. But your question is probably about p-form symmetries. How can you break uh, by local operators a p-form symmetry? So let's go back to our example of Maxwell theory. I'll make a comment about it. So here is Maxwell theory. This is a conserved quantity, and this is a conserved quantity. Uh, it's, I mean, it's a topological operator. You can ask, can I add some non, can I add some, you know, higher dimensional operators like f cube, f the four, maybe f with some derivatives that would, that would destroy the conservation of these quantities, right? And the answer is no. So one form symmetries are extremely robust because there is no local operator that can destroy them. Okay, thanks. Hey Zohar, this is Lance. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if these uh, minus signs are, uh, could be uh, considered co-cycles? Yes. We, yeah, so that's another name for them somewhat. Or, um, or maybe you want to clarify, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the example that I gave in quantum mechanics, let me go back to that. Uh, in the example that I gave in quantum mechanics, it's literally a co-cycle in the sense that there are co-cycles of discrete groups. So discrete groups have a notion of group cohomology. You can construct co-cycles, and, and this minus sign corresponds to a co-cycle. Now, you can ask, is it really true more generally? that all those discrete anomalies are some sort of co-cycles, okay? And the answer is no. The answer is no. So let me give you a simple demonstration. So it's known that for bosonic theories in two dimensions of the sort that you studied in the 80s, uh, this, this minus sign is a sort of a generalized co-cycle, okay? But if you go to fermionic theories in one plus one dimensions, this can become an arbitrary root of eight, uh, uh, eight order root of unity. So instead of a minus sign, it could be an arbitrary phase, which is an eighth order root of unity. And then to really understand whether it's some co-cycle is not possible. It's not really a co-cycle. It comes from a certain co group. So you need some kind of higher mathematical structure to explain that, which is not just group cohomology, but a co group. Okay, so thanks. It's yeah. some, some generalization of the notion of co-cycle, co but it's not quite a co-cycle in any Cohomology, group cohomology sense. Thanks a lot. Uh, thanks for the review talk. 
I, I think I might, might have missed a basic point. So suppose somebody just hands me a Langrajian, then is there a general prescription or recipe that I can read off the generalized symmetries? Maybe, yeah, you can tell, no. No, no, in fact, the, this is the reason that so many papers are coming out on this subject now. People are finding new ways of detecting non-invertible symmetries or higher symmetries. And, you know, all of a sudden, people are discovering them in models that were being studied for ages. Uh, there is no general prescription of identifying these topological operators or, or there, so there is no general prescription at the moment, but this is why the subject is uh, rapidly evolving because people find all of a sudden new examples. So even in massless electrodynamics, okay, massless electrodynamics, it's, it's the simple in four dimensions. Recently people found new topological non-invertible surfaces that have been there for all along, but uh, they were not pointed out. So I would say there is no general prescription. It's a little bit uh, an art. You have to know where to look and how to look, and sometimes you get lucky. Zohar, I'll ask the, the last question then, the, Jacob. Um, well, of course, in, in scattering amplitudes business, there have been a lot of uh, purported or, you know, um, conjectured additional unanticipated symmetries that um, associated with celestial amplitudes or the Yangian. Um, do you see any connections there to um, new kind of generalized symmetries? Okay, so one comment is that the symmetries that I've been talking about, they exist in finite volume. So you quantize the system in finite volume. There is some huge complicated Hilbert space. And those symmetries are uh, truly defined in finite volume as well as at infinite volume. But infinite volume is always more subtle, as you know. Now, I guess the symmetries that arise in the context of amplitudes, they're uh, infinite volume uh, objects, not finite volume objects. So it's hard to say how they fit into this framework. I believe that uh, this kind of question was considered by many people and there is no conclusive answer. So for instance, the simplest analog of the BMS or the celestial amplitudes is of course the fact that there, are, there is a Katz-Moody algebra acting on a chiral boson, which is the boundary of chern simon theory. So uh, whether or not, I mean, let me not get into it. The, the, the bottom line is that the symmetries that people are considering in this context of generalized symmetries are true symmetries at finite volume. And while the celestial symmetries are artifacts of infinite volume, and nobody has been able to see if there is any connection yet. Okay. All right. Um, with that, let's uh, thank Zohar again. Thank you. Introduce our next speaker. Are we set up? So it's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker of this morning. Um, Sasha Zaboydev will tell us about scattering amplitudes from dispersive iterations. Okay. Okay, thanks. Uh, uh, Jake, and uh, I would like to first thank the organizers for putting together this beautiful meeting and for giving me the opportunity to talk. I will be talking on a series of work, uh, or which uh, all unified by the same themes I've been doing in the last few years with uh, uh, Miguel Correa and Amit Sever. They were both here. But uh, basically, m most of all, my talk is based on a, uh, an upcoming paper with uh, with Piotr Turkin. Uh, in this talk, I will focus on the scattering of massive particles, and uh, maybe a paradigmatic example would be scattering of pi and four dimensions. This is something we would like to understand better. And uh, there is this uh, well, very basic fact is that if we consider scattering of relativistic particles in space-time number of dimensions three or higher, 
We do not have exact solutions, but free fields. In two dimensions, in two space-time dimensions, we have a rich zoo of integrable matrices, but, and they are very useful, but we do not have such a thing in um, higher dimensions. And uh, one problem can say mathematically, just construct an S matrix or a compute set of amplitudes that satisfy the basic principles of analyticity, crossing, and non-perturbative unitarity. And this seems, this is a very hard problem. However, if you drop one word from the sentence, we end up in a miraculous world. And this word is non-perturbative unitarity. If you say that you are happy with perturbative unitarity, and for many purposes that's good enough, then you end up in the world of quantum field theory, effective field theory, and there is this very nice quote by Weinberg that quantum field theory is S-metric theory made practical. And this is really a magical world which we're still exploring. And uh, uh, my talk would be uh, going back to the original question and asking, well, what about non-perturbative unitarity? Can we just somehow uplift this magic or just go back to the original problem and revisit it? So that's uh, the, basic, the basic question. Um, it is still a little bit too hard, so I will focus uh, on, on this two-to-two two scattering. So the amplitude uh, will be uh, just two-to-two. Two. Well, be behind this box, nothing is important. So um, you, you've seen this picture. And uh, um, that would be the, the amplitude, the function of S and T will be the main, the main character of my talk. So this is a familiar object. And now let me just go back. Well, non-perturbative unitarity, you say S as dagger equals one. Uh, okay, that's definitely true. However, the, maybe one of the uh, key equations for my talk will be this equation, which simply, the, uh, and I see is that some of the things do not uh, sh show up uh, on the slide, but this equation is nothing but elastic unitarity. It's a statement that if you scatter a particle at low enough energies, where you do not have enough energy to produce an extra particle, the optical theorem just closes on the two-particle process. So the imaginary part, the discontinuity of the amplitude, gives the amplitude square. And, well, this would seem like a boring low-energy equation. However, it's uh, truly non-perturbative. And if you try to combine it with the crossing and analyticity, you, you realize that it's actually very, very interesting. And uh, because, uh, well, a priori, you start with one variable being low energy. You can take another variable, make it high energy. You can prove theorems about regular limit. So this is a really interesting and powerful equation, which we do not have, say, in conformal bootstrap. This is really s matrix theory. And so, and this is non-perturbative. Of course, if you compute, say, if you take phi to the four, you compute one loop, well, this is nothing but a unitarity cut, but here the point is that this is not, this is a really non-perturbative equation. I would like to solve it exactly. Well, uh, there are also other, oh, wow, things are really not came out well. There were two other points here. Um, uh, one is uh, uh, non-perturbative unitarity, which is a statement that if you have, a, say, strongly coupled uh, theories and the scattering. Okay. Shall, shall I try or? Nope. Somehow it's not working. Yeah, that looks right. Yes, very good. Yes, thank you. Um, well, no. <laughs> It 
it's a Mac, it's yeah, a Mac. In my computer it's Mac. So I downloaded it on the Indigo folder. Because it's time Yeah, I had this issue with Acrobat before, but Yeah, you know. Can we also see? I will put the key original key then. Okay. Also. I'm sorry. It's, 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 it's uh, okay, perfect, it's working. So um, let me continue like that. Uh, yeah, another, another thing which is, again, maybe not relevant in perturbation theory, but relevant in general, that there is an elastic unitarity, which is a statement that, well, if you, one way to say it, you expand the amplitude in the partial waves, and the partial waves satisfy this uh, non-perturbative equation, which simply says uh, that uh, even if you're above an elastic threshold, the probability of scattering partial wave J is less than one. Uh, and finally, the third version of uh, non-perturbative, uh, um, okay, can you scroll a little bit down? <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> yes. Is uh, what I called multi-particle unitarity, which uh, this has a statement about a two to two amplitude, but uh, in principle, we know that if you have a set of particles, two, three, four, five, uh, particle thresholds, you have a detailed structure of multi-particle thresholds, a detailed structure of Landau curves. So these are the things which uh, I called non-perturbative unitarity, and well, let me focus on just how do we solve uh, the first equation. Well, these others I also will be uh, uh, solving, but uh, let's say this is a non-linear equation which we would like to solve in combination with unitarity and crossing. And uh, yeah, that would be the simpler problem that I would like to solve is just construct uh, a function. Let's even put it like that. Construct a function of two variables in D larger than three dimensions that satisfies an elasticity crossing and non-perturbative unitarity. Elastic and elastic and multi-particle. And uh, up to date, we do not have a single example of such a function. Uh, however, uh, interestingly, one of the beautiful outcomes of the oldest matrix theory was a proposal how to construct such a function. And the proposal is very simple, I will try to explain it. It's you have to iterate dispersive representation of the amplitude together with unitarity. And the claim is that after you iterate it, as you iterate Feynman diagrams a little bit, but here it's a, you iterate kind of non-perturbative equations, you end up at a fixed point which solves this problem for you. Now, um, this has never been done, uh, and that's what we were doing. But also, uh, well, you would ask, why do you revisit this oldest matrix theory problem? Uh, there was a, a recently a big surge uh, of non-perturbative S matrix bootstrap methods, which you can check in this uh, SNOMAS paper, some of the activities that have been doing, and I will be more precise uh, further. So let me uh, come back what I mean by dispersive representations, and uh, well, as you all know in this audience, that what makes this matrix interesting is that there is a tension between analyticity, unitarity, and crossing. For example, take dispersive relation with two subtractions, something has been proven in the 60s. It makes it manifest that analyticity properties are fine and unitarity are easy to impose, but the crossing is not manifest because you have two channels in dispersive relations. Recently, there was also this crossing symmetric dispersion relations uh, re uh, revisited in this paper, their crossing is manifest and unitarity is fine, but analyticity is not manifest now. So again, uh, so what I will be doing in this, in this talk, I will take a third, uh, maybe the original dispersive representation, which is Mandelstam representation, which makes analyticity and crossing manifest, but unitarity is not. And that's what we will be, non-perturbative unitarity, what we'll be imposing. Um, so the goal is to construct such a function, as I said, and the algorithm is based on a series of work, well, it's mostly by Mandelstam, but also Jeffrey Chu, Ken Wilson, Martira Sian, Frauci, it's the first part of the development. And then there was a series of beautiful theorems by David Atkinson in the end of 60s, which are not widely known, which are in a very bootstrap spirit of today, where he proved fixed point theorems about unitarity and crossing. 
which I will review. And now uh, the new part which uh, we did is, uh, is a kind of revisiting some, some uh, moving parts here, multi-particle Landau curve, but mostly what I want to talk today is how do you implement this and actually construct such function in four dimensions. This has never been done, so here there were this uh, uh, volcanoes of QCD and string theory has erupted and all this was uh, uh, buried under ashes of this discoveries, so never been done. And of course, you, you need more powerful computers, so this was not possible in the 70s. So first, let me tell you the method. How do you construct such a function? Uh, you start with a Mandelstam representation with one subtraction, so that's what I mean. Write your amplitude as a function of lambda, which is a coupling constant, say phi to the f analog of phi to the four, but non-perturbative, plus three terms. Each of the terms has a, a single discontinuity, here it's a single integral and a famous Mandelstam double discontinuity here. And if you impose a crossing symmetry on this double discontinuity and you choose this subtraction terms as t and u to be 4m squared over third, this function, as you can see, all the permutations and crossing symmetry are manifest. And it also has manifest uh, what's known as maximal analyticity. So that's what I mean by if you take this uh, um, this function analyticity and crossing a manifest. What about, what about unitarity? Uh, now, there is a, this so-called Mandelstam equation, which is the same elastic unitarity equation, which I, I told you, but, uh, but dispersive version of it. And instead of usual optical theorem, so roughly you take Mandelstam representation or, or you take uh, elastic unitarity and you, you analytically continue it, uh, and or you plug dispersion relation in it and you find this Mandelstam equation. Uh, and instead of relating the first discontinuity to the square of the amplitude, like an optical theorem, Mandelstam equation relates a double spectral density to the square of the single discontinuity. And uh, physically what it does is uh, there is this fundamental property of partial waves in quantum field theory, which is, or in, in, in scattering, which is that they analytic functions in spin. So if the real part of J is larger than zero, you can uh, analytically continue your partial waves. And you can check that this equation is, is the same as elastic unitarity for all complex J with real part larger than zero. And uh, elastic unitarity at J equals zero have to be imposed separately. So for spin zero partial wave, again, below the multiparticle threshold, you have exact equation in terms of F naught. Above the multiparticle uh, threshold, you start having some production. Now, uh, let me briefly remind you what are Landau curves, uh, very briefly. So if you have, no, you know that if you have an amplitude, you have, say, a bunch of normal thresholds related to two, four, six particle production. So for, just for the first approach, Landau curves are, the, what normal thresholds are for the single discontinuity, Landau curves are for the double discontinuity. So if you look at the structure of double discontinuity, you find that uh, it has this uh, interesting support. If you go a little bit beyond in four in S and T, you find that the double discontinuity, there is a finite region where it is zero. Uh, this is a little bit in the spirit of Steinmein relations, but uh, in the, here it's an unphysical region and for two to two. And then you find a bunch of Landau curves. Uh, this strip elastic is where elastic unitarity applies and here you have this Mandelstam equation so you can analyze. Multi-particle region is, you see S and T are above 16, so here you start having truly multi-particle physics whereas in these strips, either S or T is below 16, so at least in one channel, you can, you can write elastic unitarity. Uh, now, what happens in this multi-particle region is not really known. People look at it briefly, and we, we revisited this, uh, this problem recently, and there was a poster by Miguel Correa, so we, we classified, uh, we believe we classified all the Landau curves between 16 and 36, and already here there were some surprises. Um, there are some accumulation points of Landau curves. We identified graphs. We made a computer-based search, starting from millions of graphs and imposing various constraints. So we believe we know all the Landau curves in this region. Uh, so, and this, uh, this Landau curves are associated to the graphs, which are in every channel have at least four particles. So they, in this sense, they're coming from a really multi-particle physics. But uh, let me go. Uh, back to the basic idea. So what's the basic idea? So if you, if you do Feynman diagrams, you start with Feynman rules, and then you, you go ahead. So here the proposal is you can start scattering starting from production data. So someone gives you uh, 
from the experiment or from assumption or just as ansatz or, or, or from finite graphs. Hence you, uh, the, the data for production, and by production I mean this truly multi-particle data, so uh, which is not, uh, let's say, this imaginary part of double discontinuity in this multi-particle region, and your task is reconstruct scattering. So it's a little bit like instead of uh, generating a scattering amplitude from uh, Feynman graphs, you generate it from given production. And, um, and the way you do it is uh, by, by doing, by, by iterations. So you, you just take your unitarity equations and you, you plug them in, uh, you plug given production and uh, in uh, the nth iteration and you use unitarity to compute first in double discontinuity and the next iteration. So you use Mandelstam equation, you crossing symmetrize, and uh, in other words, this is a comp computational scheme where you start with a given production and you start iterating unitarity. And uh, you hope that it converges to something, uh, or that's, the, and if it converges to something, this will be a solution to non-perturbative unitarity. So the idea is that you iterate unitarity, non-perturbative unitarity, and if iteration converged, you solved unitarity. That's the basic idea. Now, uh, the, the beautiful result by Atkinson was that he asks, what is the space of functions in which dispersion relations naturally live? Because you want to work in the space of function, which you plug them in unitarity and crossing in Mandelstam, and you get back the same class of functions in which you work. And so he identified them as, as a set of bounded Hölder continuous functions, and then he proved this theorem that if you uh, iterate unitarity and crossing, the, this operation is a continuum operators in this Banach space. Uh, and then, uh, with some extra technical things, you can use this powerful, whatever, Schauder's principle, which is the same as the fixed point theorem. Here's a toy example. Let's say you take a fun you have a function in the bounded region, in the compact bounded region, and this function maps uh, x to f of x. And then, if this function is continuous, and it, m and it maps this interval minus one to itself, then you see that you always have a fixed point. And so the, the claim what Atkinson did, he proved that the same happens for amplitudes, that uh, if, if uh, you start iterating uh, scattering amplitudes using non-perturbative unitarity, it's this picture. So it means that the, there should be a fixed point, uh, modular some assumptions about the production, and therefore you can, you can try to reach that. Uh, so here again, we, we were, uh, this equation is the analog of unitarity and x is an analog of the amplitude, and you want to solve x equal to f of x, this is a unitarity, and then if you prove that there is some bounded space in which this operation is continuous, you see that no matter which continuous function you draw here, it will intersect the line x, therefore you have a solution. Do you know anything about spirit? Exactly, very good. Uh, and that's a good spirit, interrupt and ask less. Uh, um, the Jake's question was, do we know anything about the uniqueness? So exactly, that's a theorem too which he proved, is that if an elasticity is small enough, the mapping is contracting and the fox fixed point is unique. And therefore, there is this contraction mapping theorem that the solution is unique and can be reached by iterations. And that's it. So therefore, if we are in business, we know that we can play this game. It's a computational scheme. And this provides, in principle, us with an infinite set of amplitude functions parametrized by productions that have all the desired properties. Can we construct them in practice? And here, I, I, I come to the, the, the new, new part. And, uh, well, what, what we did is that we just take S and T, so let's say we map them to the interval, like in the previous picture, 0 and 1, by this mapping. We introduce a grid, uh, so here is a, some example of a grid of the points, and then we discretize the whole problems, and then effectively we have some, uh, you know, kind of matrix operations on a set of points which implement iterations of unitarity and crossing. So we can go ahead with that. Uh, there is an interesting question you can ask, what does it mean in terms of Feynman diagrams and uh, why does this thing converge even though the Feynman diagrams diverge? And uh, I will not spend much time, but just let me say that here uh, it's effective, it's, a little, it's not exactly, but it's a little bit like uh, 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 summing up all the 2PI graphs, whereas all the, what I call production sits in the 2PI irreducible graphs. But let me, you can ask me later about the precise relation, but uh, that's, that's uh, the, the, the spirit. And let me maybe, maybe that's, uh, the, if you have never seen this, this slide, this is maybe the most 
uh, one of the most important is that you know that uh, uh, recently there was this exciting development with the 3D izing, which was uh, uh, where the, many of the physical data was found precisely by localizing it at some, as a, some special point in the bootstrap analysis. Then there was this uh, recent development in the S metrics, and uh, you take uh, the same bootstrap analysis in two dimensions, and uh, say by this paper by Lucia et al. They found this, again, the some bounded regions. This is some value of, say, uh, S metric at some given point, and uh, this colored region is a set of allowed S matrices. It's this little island, and you go to the boundary, you find special theories. And these special theories are integrable theories, which were known in two dimensions. So the excitement for me, at least, came from the next plot. In fact, uh, this plot, it just appeared a few weeks ago in this uh, beautiful paper by Chen Fitzpatrick and Karatev. But these two points on this plot were known since 2017, and this was, was the motivation for our work, which is that the same picture exists in higher dimensions. You take three or four dimensions, you play the game of bounding as matrix, and you find the bounded region. So all the allowed physical S matrices live inside this uh, little slit. So the axes are partial wave uh, of spin zero and its derivative at some point. And different colors are, are different dimensions. And uh, then you think, oh, well, great. Now, why, why don't we do the same as we did before? We go to the boundary and we just solve this problem. We, we now find exactly solvable non-perturbative S matrix in high D. So that would be very exciting. Um, however, what happens is that uh, uh, before at least this paper in 2017, you go to this, uh, yes, and into, let me just explain this. These two points of uh, maximum of two cusps, they were identified in 2017 as a maximal and minimal coupling or value of the amplitude at some given point. And this shape, uh, this element like shape, was found recently and it nicely interpolates between these two points. And the, the puzzle was the following, or is partially the following. You go to the boundary of this region, and you would like to find the analog of the malogic of S matrix in two dimensions, but in high dimensions, which would be amazing. But if you take these results, even though these bounds are very stable, thanks, you find that the S matrix that lives here, uh, somewhere close to the close to this tip, so close to this boundary, with the current S matrix methods, which we used to find this, it doesn't look like a physical S matrix. It has some. Um, strange oscillations, it does not develop thresholds. So it is not clear, okay, well, these are the bounds. Uh, what exactly is the nature of this theory at the boundary of this region? Uh, and one, another observation of this paper, and, and, and the same applies to this matrices found in this last paper. You go to the boundary, you find some funny oscillations. But what they observed experimentally is that if you take phi to the four at one loop, and you go close to the origin of this plot, which corresponds to roughly small couplings, uh, the bound seems like a saturated. So it looks like uh, this theory that lives on the boundary in high dimensions, in uh, between, say, two and four, is just phi to the fourth, massive scalar. That's very intriguing. Um, so then we would be able, try, we can try to solve this, this theory in high dimensions, and this would be the analog of Ising. So what we try to do is that, okay, here we, we try to apply this iteration method to construct S matrix uh, of this type. And uh, one, one observation also about this plot, which was puzzling, is that uh, the S matrix seems to be as elastic as possible. Like in two dimensions, you go to the boundary, the production wants to be as small as possible. However, in high dimensions, because of crossing and uh, and uh, unitarity, you know that production should be there. And again, it was a bit puzzling. It looks completely elastic, but on general principles, we know that in high dimensioning, scattering implies production. So, well, then it suggests us to, uh, to play this game where we run our iterations with as little production as possible. So we set the production in the S wave to zero, which tells us that if our iteration uh, converges, then the partial wave will be exactly one and uh, spin zero. And this is also what people observed. And then what we do is that we can also set the multi-particle uh, raw to zero to make it as elastic as possible. And interestingly, in the old days, this was called the strip approximation. And there is this funny quote by Weinberg who said that the strip approximation whose mention will, will bring tears 
to the eyes of those of us who are old enough to remember it. But I, I think you, sh you should not cry yet. It will be, it will be all good. So uh, we set these parameters to zero, and, uh, and so the, all the iterations are driven by, in some sense, the subtraction term, so phi to the four. Uh, and uh, so here are the results, and I will conclude with that, is that first of all we found that, and this was not obvious, that uh, we're doing this on the grid, the iterations converge for some range of lambda. Uh, then, and now, yeah. If you look at the S matrix that you get, as uh, in the paper of Chen Fitzpatrick and Karatev, you find that the S matrix that we generate lives, uh, lives on the boundary of the allowed region. Of course, I uh, it's, you, you, do not, you should not take it over seriously because here there are everywhere error bars, so it's at the moment approximately at the, at the, uh, bo re at the boundary of the allowed region, so it is kind of extremal. It exhibits, uh, by construction, double spectrum density, density along the Landau curves, which, um, which, okay, has to be there, but this is satisfying. So here, uh, this region where it's zero, it's, it's a Steinman-like region, and above it, it's where you develop a double spectral density by iterations. Uh, then the iterations converge uh, very quickly and uh, say to, to converge to the S matrix, sometimes it's allowed up to 10 iterations. If you, if you translate 10 iterations to the number of loops in the Feynman diagrams, it will be around 1,000 loops. But here everything is finite at every step, so you can just do it. Uh, and then uh, you go to the, say, spin two partial waves, and in agreement with general theorems, you see particle production. So it starts at some energies, and for different couplings, it, it is finite. We called it the ax bump because of this ax theorem, which predicts that the particle production should be there. It is very small, but it's stable, and it is uh, there. Uh, another feature, curious feature that we find is that uh, at large energies, partial waves do not go to one. They stay slightly below one. And uh, this might be the, the issue with other method of getting this as matrix because there um, it was uh, not, uh, okay, I'm, uh, it was, it was the, the, the partial wage for force to go to one. And uh, you see an emergent regel image which we do not understand. So in any case, we have a non-perturbative amplitude and uh, that's, um, uh, you can explore it. So uh, let me conclude. Um, and so there is a computational algorithm to explore, explore the space of non-perturbative as matrices based on the dispersive representation of the amplitude. And we just uh, saw that it works and there is really, really a lot of uh, things to explore and it exhibits uh, the, the familiar physical features. So the dream is would be, uh, of course, to maybe we can uh, start uh, exploring the space of solvable S matrices in D higher than three. Um, so I think there are many tools which uh, makes me hopeful at least that we might be able to, to learn something interesting here. Uh, well, there are also things which can be, and I think uh, this is an exciting uh, opportunity that there is an interplay of these methods with uh, perturbative methods. For example, the, here I use what is known, it's again uh, one of the outcomes of the oldest matrix bootstrap, so-called lightest particle ma maximal analyticity or Mandelstam analyticity. This is something I can try to prove in perturbation theory just by analyzing Landau curves. It would be very interesting to make progress using the modern techniques on uh, this hypothesis. Uh, I think, uh, again, no one has ever constructed the pion scattering of pions, which is crossing uh, analytic, and uh, you can put on latest data and everything which known from experiments. So I think with these methods, you can try to revisit this and construct a pion pion scattering amplitude and see how it agrees with the experiments. Um, finally, uh, here I put in, uh, I told you that we were generating scattering from production but there is a way you can try to close the system of equation. I didn't have time to explain that. Um, well, uh, I told you that the amplitudes only converge for some region, but there are other numerical methods. You can do Newton method. I guess after Matthew's talk, I couldn't, uh, yesterday I couldn't resist, but put 
machine learning maybe uh, could be useful here. I don't know. Uh, we can try to put in saturation of the frost R bound, and finally, uh, I think the basic idea, you know, dispersion relations, unitarity, these are things which are also true in gravity and in string theory. So you can try to extend it to gravity and strings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sasha. Time for a couple questions. Lance? So phi to the fourth in 4D is a trivial theory. Yes. And the Landau pole must get really close yes. when you have lambda equals five pi. Do you see any yes, uh, like uh, that in your uh, uh, that's, results? That's an excellent, excellent question. And um, the, so the, here the, there is something funny happening which we, we do not uh, really um, understand, but which, uh, which is that uh, when, you put, when you put this theory on a, uh, on a lattice, then we, we choose a finite grid, and therefore the, the true regular limit or true high energy limit, we, uh, we, in some sense, we, we do not access. We, we, we discretize it, and then we allow the system to take care, uh, takes care of itself. Um, what exactly, how exactly this algorithm uh, takes care of the regular limit, we do not fully understand. And uh, what we observe is that the results for the, say, low energy observables that we, which I told you about, they're not really sensitive uh, to this very high uh, cutoff in energy. Um, however, um, yes, uh, my, 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 uh, my answer would be that, uh, so in the space of the, say, amplitudes, at the level of the constraints that we are imposing, uh, you can construct an amplitude which looks like phi to the four at low energies, and at high energies it does what it wants to be. And uh, what exactly it corresponds to at the level of the Lagrangian, I already am losing this. So somehow this idea is that because the algorithm is non-perturbative at low energies, so the coupling is weak, you, you see what's happening, but then there is some emergent uh, amplitude which would be great to understand. But it's absolutely a um, valid question. Well, uh, the, maybe one, another answer is that in principle you can do it in three dimensions five to the four, and it should work the same way. She? Uh, yeah, actually I have a closely related question. Um, so I, I was wondering, so you can ask for the five-four theory whether there's a non-perturbative uh, completion of the perturbative five-four as, yeah. as matrix. As far as I know, I, I, this is not known to me, at least not yeah. to me. Does your approach shed light on whether you can uh, either rule out that or, or construct uh, a number, number of completion in the sense that it agrees with perturbed 5 to all others in perturbation theory? Um, okay, I, this, this approach will, does not answer this, this question. Uh, so, uh, and let me then go back to the slide which I skipped, which is in relation to um, to Feynman perturbation theory. And what happens is that if you try to understand what this approach does, uh, for example, take, uh, take this diagram in phi to the four. That's the first example. This is a, so we'll call it non-planar cross. It has uh, four particles in, uh, in every channel. Uh, but from this, uh, from the approach we having, you can throw away this diagram and run the iterations. So this, this, is, this diagram is a part of this, what I call production, and uh, you can, for example, set it to zero, and you get some S metrics. There is something interesting that we observed uh, a very tiny violation of inelastic unitarity, um, which scales like this diagram, which may, may be S metrics way to tell it that you are not allowed to throw away this diagram. But in general, in this approach in relation to phi to the four, um, we fix the production and the idea is that this corresponds to a, a choosing a subset of, uh, say, diagrams uh, and throwing away the rest. Because if we can take everything into account, we will just solve the theory. So here's the simplifi simplification compared to phi to the four. It really um, comes from the fact that you, you restrict the production part which, has, uh, which is, again, the part of the graphs which are more than two particles in every channel uh, to some 
subset. So, uh, and again, uh, what the outcome of this process is a two to two scattering amplitude, and um, it's a function. And the question, if there is a theory behind, is um, is is uh, is not clear. So maybe the the easiest way and the most controlled case would be to go to say three dimensions, uh, and study phi to the four there by these methods. And there, the, the idea would be that there is a true non-perturbative S matrix, and uh, with this algorithm, we we construct a set of non-perturbative two to two S matrices, which uh, say numerically approach it. Uh, but another way would be also here. I hope that uh, so after we look at what we got, maybe one can use this to improve the existing primal methods. For example, we find that the partial waves do not go to one, but in the primal bootstrap, uh, if you try to reproduce our curves with a normal primal bootstrap, you see that just it's inconclusive. That n max that people use is not big enough to see this feature. Somehow things oscillate and converge very slowly. And so one, one, one way would be that we can try to improve the ansatz and maybe use these this amplitudes as a guidance uh, to develop maybe even a better primal methods to approach these amplitudes also in some, some other way. Um, so yeah, there are these uh, various things one can, one can try, uh, but uh, I hope this, this algorithm which generates for us functions with these physical features can be also a guide uh, to, uh, to develop the better, better methods by other means. Um, one last question from Sebastian. Uh, thank you so much. This is really spectacular to see. Uh, I think you, you explained to us the uh, spin two contributions, yeah. what happens to other spins? Yes, uh, so to higher spins, uh, there, so let me explain this plot. So uh, the, in the old days, uh, there was also a version of large spin as matrix bootstrap, like in the recent days, there was a large spin conformal bootstrap. And uh, in this large J uh, as matrix bootstrap, there, due to crossing and unitarity, you map a near threshold expansion to the large spin behavior of partial waves. And what people understood uh, in old days, I called it drugged uh, Martin analytic bootstrap, is that if you go at very large spin, the partial waves become mostly inelastic. They become very small, but mostly inelastic. And this just follows from uh, unitarity and crossing. And not just this, there is a prediction. If you, if you take a ratio of an imaginary part to the say, square of partial waves, you take a log, there is a particular straight line with a particular slope which it should follow. And so here, this is, uh, the slope is 0 0.47 at some energies. And here we took spins, so the horizontal axis is a spin, and, uh, and the, the dots are the ratio. And so it's supposed to go to 0 0.47 at infinite spin. And here what we see is that, uh, uh, okay, it, it works up to some points and it stops working, then we improve our grid on which we are working, and then it works better. And so, and so it continues. So we see a clear, clear sign that it does, behave, it does, it does exhibit the 0 0.47. And uh, you see, so here for some, I don't know, grid with 3,500 points, uh, we still get something reasonable up to spin 60. And this is already quite impressive because all these partial waves are exponentially suppressed. So I would say that there is effectively a maximal spin associated to um, every grid. Uh, and below this maximal spin, all the partial waves will exhibit this ax bump, uh, so this inelasticity, which will go to zero. So that's, that's what happens in higher partial waves.
stairs of the Rudolfinum on the right hand side. We will, so we will try to make two photos, one in the, in the central, the taking, so, so the castle is on the photo, which would be a pity not to have it. And, but we are not sure how it, how it, uh, it looks, the photo, if it is taken from the, from the window of this building. And then we try to, to move to, on, the, on the stairs to be sure we will have everyone uh, clearly taken. Okay, thank you. And So, welcome to the second session of today, and it's my pleasure to welcome Sabrina as the first speaker of this session. Okay. Hi, guys. It's a pleasure to be starting this celestial session. And um, now I have a mic in one hand and a clicker in the other, so I can't talk with my hand, so hopefully this works fine. Um, but I'm happy to be talking to you guys about symmetries and celestial amplitude. So that's the nominal title of my talk. Um, and it's going to be basically trying to highlight a couple of small papers, but um, basically also really grateful to a lot of my collaborators, Andrea, Laura, Sebastian, and um, some upcoming work uh, that'll feed into how I'm presenting these things. So there's that. Okay, so very, very grateful to be able to be talking at Amplitudes. I um, know that's like celestial holography. People have kind of gotten their way into this uh, subfield, and then now let's try to see if we can um, kind of motivate or address this question that I kind of get first of the time, what has celestial holography taught us about amplitudes? So when you run into, like, okay, great, you want to look at scattering and this different basis, what's it gonna actually do for us? What has it done for us? So the title of my talk being Symmetries and Celestial Amplitudes is basically leaning into the things that we have already basically learned from this framework. So we can say the first part of the talk is going to be an apologia, not an apology for why we're going through this effort of looking at scattering in a different basis and just kind of mushing things up and looking at boost eigenstates instead of uh, energy eigenstates. So if we want to basically unpack what I mean by when I say I work on celestial holography, I want to kind of do a rebranding exercise. So I'm not going to say that we're going to take over all of amplitudes, but what I can say is that what we really do want to emphasize is that celestial means both flat holography and also this particular boost basis. And then the thing that I guess is the common core to like research topics that would be interesting to, to people in my subfield is anything where the fact that we're viewing amplitudes in terms of it being a hologram for flat space um, teaches you something about the scattering process. So for the first part of the talk, I want to not emphasize the fact that I'm actually looking at this particular boost basis, but by the middle or end, I'm going to try to motivate why that boost basis is interesting. And we can do a rebranding exercise where anything that uses flat holography to learn about amplitudes, I would say is celestial. Okay, so what are the tenets of celestial holography? If you're going to have a little um, cult, you want to have your rules for the cult. So the first thing is that we don't like the LSD formalism. When it comes to setting up amplitudes, we really want to think of things in terms of boundary correlators. And then when it comes to um, what we actually do in practice, the thing, like our preference is such that we always want to take large R first and kind of go to scry. So there's certain things that we're implicitly doing a lot of times when we try to relate expressions between asymptotic symmetries and amplitudes. Um, but the main, I guess, difference between how we approach things is really looking at this conformal boundary. Okay, so if I had a perturbative quantum field theory in the bulk, the objects that I would be interested in are correlators of these local field operators anywhere in this bulk space time. But basically, if once I turn on gravity and I think that the universe is gonna be holographic, I'm interested in basically only looking at correlators of fields near the boundary. And so one kind of nice approach to the same, like an analogous thing to what a lot of celestial people are doing is to, instead of looking at scattering amplitudes um, or looking at uh, celestial amplitudes as standardly presented, you can really do, like, think about correlators of these extrapolated fields near Scry. And uh, there's a lot of, like, a beautiful Carolian story for this, too, that Laura and others have been developing. Um, the connection between the civs is much older. Um, that should be the same thing. But there, of course, you now have a Scry plus and a Scry minus once I've pushed my Cauchy slice up to the boundary. And you have to worry about how to connect those two things. But in principle, you do have an extrapolate dictionary like you would in ads CFT. So what's the benefit of doing that? So in momentum space, if I was going to go on shell, I'm going to a light cone or like basically a mass hyperboloid. There, that's my co-dimension one. And here, my co-dimension one comes from going to the conformal boundary. Now, how does this holographic perspective possibly help us learn something about amplitudes? 
well, the talk, the type of my talk is basically symmetries, and that's something where we already have gained something from this perspective, but there's a lot of fun things you hear, like Simone talking and whatnot, um, that basically anything where you can look at that conformal boundary and learn something about scattering by <laughs> the point of view that, okay, here's the boundary space time, if something should be causally going through the bulk, what can I say about that? So I wanna kind of try to envelop, like basically bring Sasha back into the fold and adopt Simone and say that all of that is basically celestial. <laughs> But we'll see. Um, and one thing in particular is if you try to say that I want this amplitudes program to tell me how to go from on-shell data to some theory of that on-shell data to give you consistent scattering amplitudes, you already, from the bulk perspective, can learn something from the equations of motion near the boundary, and that's exactly how these constraint equations are coming about that give you symmetries. So this is like kind of like a standard way of if I want to say what is the theory living on the boundary, well, what's the theory living on the bulk as it behaves near the boundary? So you can kind of start already asking those questions or imposing equations of motion and correlators near that conformal boundary, so there's things you can learn there. So all I'm saying here is that anything where this holographic perspective of what the scattering amplitude is, I'm gonna claim is what I mean by a celestial-ish thing. So then what have we given to you guys? So I think the concrete thing that we have is basically the subleading soft theorem is a new result. So the connection between asymptotic symmetries and soft theorems is something that's been, I guess, like five, so more years now, like 2014, 2013, uh, or so it started. And that connection did lead to a new subleading soft graviton theorem by Kachelson and Strominger, and lovely spin memory effect with Sasha, and the fact that now your Lorenz group gets promoted to this different asymptotic symmetry group, so that's great. So the root of this connection, though, of course, is what I was saying before, this holographic perspective of looking at the S matrix. So the easiest way to see the extrapolate dictionary is basically to kind of do the, um, kind of the cheap thing of saying, okay, so near the boundary, I want things to basically be free. I have my free mode expansion. If I really go to the boundary, I get a little bit of extra help because the saddle point approximation is such that the uh, thing that dominates is when the direction on the night sky uh, is equal to the direction of the momentum. So you have this localization between the celestial spheres and position and momentum space, which makes things a lot simpler to try to translate between um, the amplitudes and the bulk perspective. So all you're doing here is the radiative graviton is some particular um, mode of the metric pushed up to scry. And so all you're doing is exchanging a frequency for a coordinate if you wanna go from a space-time perspective to an amplitude perspective. And that, Basically, now you have a simple thing where the directions of the night sky are the same, but there's a Fourier transform relating how you're smearing along generated scry to create the states that would correspond to a single particle Hilbert space uh, definite energy. So that's lovely, and I haven't talked anything right now about boost spaces or anything like that, but the point is, is that once you do have this understanding of what the amplitudes thing is in terms of the bulk, you have this beautiful connection to how the asymptotic symmetries are acting on that phase space phrase in the bulk perspective and you can match that to the soft theorem. So that was the origin of this thing from 2013 or 2014, and Sasha and Andy pointed out that, right, a step function Fourier transforms to a pole, and that's how the Weinberg pole reads off this memory effect for the leading guy. Okay, so that's 2014, long time ago. What have we done since? So it's kind of interesting that the space-time perspective does still help us uh, learn a little bit more about the symmetries, and then also I think it should basically tell us about collinear elements and things too, but let's, let me just stick with what I'm gonna say here in the talk and we can debate it for the questions. So basically, how is this thing that's a little bit older now, the space of perspective, really continuing to teach us about the uh, appropriate symmetry and representations, and that's the topic of these two little papers. So the first thing I wanna say is that we're really viewing celestial CFT as a particular dimensional reduction of scry. And the second thing then is once you see that, then the things that you think of as like the canonical charges for, um, that funny slice through the bulk, are gonna just give us these BMS fluxes. So you already see that the soft theorems are related to charges based on the fact that you're looking at the bulk in a very weirdly sliced way. And then the third thing is basically a particular nice thing where there was an ambiguity in the loop corrections um, when you try to just look at the leading IR divergence in the, in the scattering amplitude and match it to a correction to the stress tensor. Um, that is fixed from this point of view of looking at the canonical phase space and the fact that you need to be covariant under the super translations and super rotations. So that's a nice thing. But the first thing we're doing, so like uh, also thanks, shout out to Andrea and Laura with this. Um, basically, all I want to say is that I have now um, a particular way, like choice of a basis for operators 
um, because I want them to transform under the Lorentz subgroup of Poincaré in a certain way. So what I'm doing is I have, so if I had a conformal field theory in 4D, I could really map scry to a hyperplane, and then I'm doing a couple steps. So the first step I have is I have my local operators just put anywhere in the space time. Now instead, I look at them when they're restricted to a particular null hypersurface. And then besides that, I then want to phrase things in terms of the cross-section of that. So I'm basically doing one restriction of my operator locations and then doing basically a dimensional reduction to phrase that extra U coordinate or that time coordinate there uh, in terms of um, data that will now represent my uh, boost weight basically. So practically, I'm not like changing anything. I'm just like, trading one dimension here, this like null direction for a continuous spectrum of delta. And that's what the Mellon transform of the amplitudes is doing, or in this case, a particular Mellon-like transform, but notice the bounds of the integration is different there, along the generators of scry. To phrase these fields that we know are supposed to live in the conformal boundaries, we're just doing an extrapolate dictionary, in terms of operators that transform nicely as primaries under the Lorenz subgroup of Poincaré. So you still have Poincaré invariants, but we're just choosing to basically smear things along the boundary so that these things are uh, conformal primaries. So we make that choice, and one of the motivations for making that choice is going to be that you're basically separating out soft and collinear limits, so I think that people who study those things in amplitudes might appreciate maybe why, why one would want to do that, but let's just take a step back and say, okay, what are we really doing if we're gonna treat this thing as a 2D CFT? So I have my celestial sphere, I have my points in the night sky that I look at and the stars in the night sky to stare at, and if I really did say, okay, now I have this way of dimensionally, like just basically smearing along generates a scry to turn a massless amplitude into um, operators that are sitting at different points in the night sky. What if I really tried to pretend that it is a 2D CFT? So if I wanted to do radial quantization or think about the states on a circle on the night sky, what would that mean in terms of the bulk? So it's kind of nice to think about the fact that if I am going to basically boost and I see how like a, going into like hyperdrive, like how the different stars are moving in the night sky, Basically, the foliations of different like rings going from the North Pole around down to the South Pole um, would correspond to something that I understand also in the bulk. So let's take this simple case of taking my, um, so these are my coordinates near, that are good near future null infinity, and look at the slice x3 equals zero. So this is a hyperplane that's clearly not a Cauchy slice, but what I'm doing in these coordinates is literally just saying that I am on the circumference, so this um, diameter of the, uh, celestial uh, sphere. So I basically cut myself at the equator, and that is the surface, so that's what the, inter the intersection of this hyperplane with space-like normal and the celestial sphere looks like, but of course it's the next direction and you run along the generators of scry. So if I take that nice slice here, and then I look at boost images of it, I'm basically in the part of the Rindler wedge that where the, the boost evolution is space-like, and that's consistent with the fact that the celestial sphere is, is Euclidean. And I'm basically able to sweep out that same foliation by looking at hyperplanes with a different set of normals that are going from um, one, um, say, like uh, null direction to the antipodal one in this case, if I pick the north and south pole. So I could generalize that, and I know that if I take any boost of that, what do I sweep out? I had a space, a hyperplane with space like normal, and I'm gonna go through the whole uh, um, hyperboloid here of possible directions with space like normals. And if I look at what that looks like in the celestial sphere, those should be, Lorentz transformations should be Mobius transformations, so circles should map to circles. And so if I draw any circle in the celestial sphere, I can map that to a hyperplane um, going through the origin with space like normal. And curiously enough, just as a shout out to Sebastian, uh, we were basically, this is underlining our little Poincaré constraint paper, so um, cheers to that. But basically, this type of picture now is useful if we wanna think about what would it mean if we really do try to say like what is the uh, state of some contour on the celestial sphere. And so you have this beautiful picture that's on the cover of Andy's textbook where you have basically a celestial sphere and some punctures with like where operators are um, and basically the statement of like looking at the, the state created by some inserting some operators in this 2D CFT and mapping that to some scattering process in 4D. So let's actually unpack what that picture is representing. So clearly, we're co-dimension two instead of a co-dimension one hologram, that seems kind of fishy, but now we see that if I take, strictly speaking, like, okay, I have my celestial sphere, I'm gonna go co-dimension one in a space-like direction so I get a ring on the celestial sphere. How does that, if I try to lift it to this bulk picture, correspond to 
a uh, hypersurface in the space-time. And one can really think of, like, say, for a circle, some space-like normal hypersurface through my Minkowski space that'll intersect because of this weird order of limits where R goes to infinity first. This circle in the celestial sphere and extend along generated a scry. And so you can also see, I guess, this nice kind of, like, the way that if you look at boost images, it's going to go to, like, um, the antipodal matching of the, um, of the contour is kind of implicit there. Um, but the beautiful thing about it is it's much more like ADS-CFT, albeit with a weird slice, where if I take the canonical charges on this hypersurface, now because they're basically defined in terms of a two-form, I go to that boundary, that boundary is this contour across the, along the generators of scry, and if I literally evaluate the canonical charge for this aesthetic symmetry, then that is the, the, the soft theorem. So it's going to be a nice example here. If I'd want to induce a U1 gauge transformation, my two form is just proportional to the field strength. And instead of it being the FRU component, so like the, the standard radial electric field that I measure if I take a space like, or sorry, so like I take a t constant time slice or a space like Cauchy slice and look at what the, um, the charge would be there, that's the radial electric field. Versus if I instead do this weird slice where I'm going up towards scry, I literally get the soft theorem. And that's because this gauge parameter is uh, zero mode, so there's only Z and Z bar dependence. So basically you see that the soft theorem is the canonical charge for this weird slice, and that weird slice is natural if I'm looking at boost evolution in my space time. So the nice thing about this picture, okay, so radial equals Rindler lets you jump directly to the statement that the soft operators in the bulk are generating symmetries on the celestial sphere. And we also see that it's kind of like what we expect in ADS-CFT, albeit with this funny business where we see now okay, we're not, like, taking a Cauchy slice. We're doing some weird slicing so that we can see this foliation of the sphere uh, foliate the bulk, too. Or maybe foliate's the wrong word because there is, a, like, the, the fixed locus, but we have that. So can we further try to use this perspective to see why this might be a better basis to present the flat space hologram? And at least I'll give some motivation for how on the symmetry side of things you have it. So given the fact that, basically, uh, this particular way of presenting scattering um, is preferring, um, say, like the eigenstate center boost evolution. If you have something like a ward identity where you have two terms that have to add to zero, they should both be in the same representation. So the soft theorems are basically telling you that there's some radiative mode of the metric that is coupled to uh, the matter. So the fact that I have a mass that accelerates, that I know it'll radiate, um, those two things are different spin fields. And there's a relation between them, so there's basically a primary descendance so relation where that uh, operator that's in a descendant of this guy plus this guy is zero. So you can try to look at things that are in the same SL2C representations or point gray representations, go all the way to BMS. And the beautiful thing about that is that it gives you something that would be maybe a little bit difficult to try to identify exactly uh, just from the amplitudes themselves. So here's just a kind of shout out to this nice result where Doné and Rizzoconi were essentially looking at objects that transformed as conformal fields under the expected, um, the expected weights that you would find um, from an analysis of primary descendants, say. And these guys give you, because you demand the full covariance under the BMS and not just SL2C, um, a, a set of corrections to the subleading soft graviton and how it would be smeared to create the celestial stress tensor. So the beautiful thing about that is, okay, so you include both the leading soft graviton, the super translation Goldstone mode, and also super rotation Goldstone mode. So there's a lot of different components that come into giving you an object that has the right weights um, to basically couple to, uh, like, the, the matter. Um, and when you demand that that soft guy transforms covariantly under that group as a primary field, you have these corrections. And if you then squint at those corrections compared to this proposal from 2017 for the loop correction to the stress tensor, so there's supposedly this exact super rotation symmetry, and you need to go from beyond tree level to loop level, you need to start including these higher divergent corrections, you see that it almost looks the same, except for the fact that basically one of these Goldstone modes was replaced with the news tensor, so the memory mode, and there's this IR divergent uh, piece explicitly out front. And so the cute thing about it is, in hindsight, you realize I should trust the symmetries more than I should trust um, just trying to squint at uh, the expression for the amplitude and, and guess what the form of the soft uh, uh, vectors correction should be in terms of, like, um, a stress tensor now. And what we didn't appreciate at the time was really this beautiful work by the next uh, speaker will be is one of the authors here. Um, pointing out that there is basically um, this sector of the theory that corresponds to the super translations that you can dress away uh, in terms of a zero mode, like the Goldstone mode of the metric. 
And that if you take that into account, basically it's kind of an accident where you have no other soft insertions, insertions of the Goldstone uh, mode and the news are basically the same. And so the reason why you see this IR divergence uh, explicit in one of these presentations is because they're putting the wrong field in here. So it should really be the C here. And so there's this nice connection we're seeing that I wanted to look at the symmetries from the point of view of generating um, like the canonical transformations of these slices that are uh, different Rindler times really does point you all the way to the right form for the loop corrections for the stress sensor. That's kind of nice. Um, and so we have this kind of fun story of things. So there's this proposal to allow super rotations that came from, say, Barnage and others who uh, were in like the kind of like quantum gravity or whatever you want to call it communities. This prompted Cachazo and Strominger to uh, look for a subliminal soft graviton theorem. So then they found you guys a new soft theorem, yay. Um, and then the identification of Neuer effect, Sasha and me. And then meanwhile, basically, the fact that you then have this uh, promotion of the Lorenz group to this Vera Sonar symmetry, that's really cool. How does that constrain scattering? Well, it points to the fact that you basically now have this candidate stress tensor, and this whole celestial basis comes from the fact that I want to diagonalize the, the boost weights there. And in the end, you see that kind of following through that boost basis also gives you the corrections you needed to this, this symmetry, um, because you're really matching the space-time perspective with the amplitudes thing. And then I think the next talk is going to talk about this whole W infinity symmetry. And the beautiful thing about that is from the point of view of, like, say, even just SL2C uh, weights, you really do have null states at a full tower of integers. And basically, you would never even think of trying to look to all orders of the subliding soft theorem if it weren't for the fact that it seems like you have elements of radially quantized celestial CF, uh, radial quantized 2D CFT that you wouldn't necessarily expect. So that's nice. And so I just want to close with this theme, which is basically it's beneficial to think about the space-time and normal momentum space perspectives of anything that you're looking at. So amplitude people, think about what it means in the space-time. Um, and basically also that celestial CFT is further advocating for particular dimensional reduction because it elucidates a larger symmetry algebra. Um, and then there are various ongoing questions that um, I've been interested in, but I think you're going to hear a lot more uh, from, like, I mean, also Alfredo gave a talk, um, Natalie, uh, Sylvia. So lots of fun things people are doing, and here's just some lists. But thank you guys for your time. So we're a little bit ahead of schedule, so are there any questions? Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah. This is probably a dumb question, but no. you're talking about the loop correction yeah. to the stress tensor, and you said oh, it shouldn't have been the news tensor, it should be the asymptotic shear. Yeah. Now, sorry, I should probably know the answer to this, so I'll apologize in advance, but naively, that means that it won't be BMS invariant, right? No, ex exactly. So the thing is, is that the, it's supposed to transform, like the, there's a part that's supposed to transform under the super translations, and you're missing that. So like literally, I think if you stared at the original expression, there's something wrong with the covariance of it if you try to like look at the brackets on phase space. And that's why Joni and Rizzaconi, and, I, and yeah, I think those just those two, were like approaching it from like the canonical GR side, and they get from like some co-adjoint action this guess, and you're like, oh shit, that should be right. <laughs> like, like Andy made a mis not a mistake, but like there's an ambiguity. And one thing I want to say, because I don't want to say Andy made a mistake, is that it seems like when you do choose to dress your operators with these particular like vertex operators, those guys have a particular relation between what the memory effect is for them versus what the action of C contracted with those things is. So one could ask, <laughs> when you're trying to understand like this Fox space or what to do with these IR divergences, is there something? Um, it's, is it arbitrary, or do you need to basically have something where the, the correlations of the news and the, and the zero mode are related, and you're making that particular choice? Great. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions? Julio? Hi. Thanks for a very nice talk. <coughs> So I cannot resist asking after Zohar's talk. So in his talk, the, the field strength for U1 gauge field was uh, the current for one of these one-form symmetries. OK. And it also appeared in one of your slides as the current for one Yeah. Of these. OK. So, okay, can, so I'm going to, because I, <laughs> OK. So let, let me say what I think. So yeah, I'd love if somebody who does one-form symmetries wants to help me make this thing legit. But 
why, why I love my little solo paper about these like you know surfaces through neural infinity is you can kind of see that um, how would you enclose like so you have operators that are supported on one generator of scry that are charged, and then these surfaces are basically kind of a natural way of enclosing them. So I think that how do I want to say this? Like I, I think that this this perspective of like lifting the um, like the, the charges on this, this supposed celestial CFT to the, uh, these surfaces of the bulk that are picked out by our boost um, example can probably be phrased in terms of like different higher form symmetries. We want to look at different uh, objects. So, uh, how do I want to say this? Like, I want that connection to be made more precise, and I think it would be a really good excuse to, like, for, for that paper. But um, yeah, basically, the, the field strength. Is the, is the canonical charge, and it's just a matter of which surface you are and what operators you're enclosing. So you can think about like, acting on a state prepared by some operators by like, doing this like, insertion. Does that answer your question, or is that just me like, <laughs> Yeah, I, I think yeah. I, I agree it would be interesting to make more precise that connection, because they also say that the photon is a Gaussian for this spontaneously broken one-form symmetry, right? Yeah. And for you, you have that... Uh, that this no, I mean, I think it should, I, it, it should be, like, like, like I, I'm trying to really think of it as in terms of I'm putting operators on my Hilbert space and where these operators are supported. In this case, now I know what it is in the bulk. And so, like, you have these surfaces that are naturally going to enclose other operators, and you can kind of, it's a weird surface that you wouldn't really look at, but, like, I, yeah. Thanks. Like, it's or whatever. Okay. okay. Any further questions? I think... Then we can move on to the next speaker. So the next speaker of uh, the second session um, is Monica Pate, and she will talk about advances in celestial holography. Um, okay, so uh, thanks for the introduction. So my talk is also gonna be um, on this subject of celestial holography. And it's organized uh, to basically uh, address uh, these three questions. So the beginning part of the talk, um, I'll briefly review uh, what question the celestial holography program is trying to address uh, and how it aims to do so. Uh, the second part of the talk, um, I'll explain uh, what sort of evidence we have uh, that supports this approach to quantum gravity. And third part of the talk, um, I'll tell you a little bit about what we've learned uh, by taking this approach. Okay, so in a nutshell, celestial holography is the proposal that quantum gravity in 40 asymptotically flat spacetimes is holographically dual to a conformal field theory that lives in two dimensions. And the basic observation that underlies this proposal is simply that the Lorentz group in four dimensions, which is SO3 comma one, is isomorphic to the global conformal group of theories in two dimensions, which is SL2C. And so this fact alone ensures that scattering amplitudes for 40 particles in highest weight representations of SL2C will transform onto the Lorentz group like correlation functions of primary operators in a 2D conformal field theory. Now, to give you a little bit more intuition for particles uh, in highest weight representations, let me remind you of some basic facts about primary operators in a 2D conformal field theory. So these are labeled by left and right conformal weights and also the point on the sphere where the operator is located. And under the action of SL2C, these points on uh, the sphere are transformed by this Mobius action. Now, primary operators are constructed to simultaneously, simultaneously diagonalize the pair of conformal transformations that preserve the point where the operator is located. So these are dilations about that point and rotations about that point, and the left and right conformal weights parametrize the eigenvalues under these transformations. And so if we wish to, to interpret uh, 2D conformal transformations as the action of the Lorentz group, then, they, then these pair of conformal transformations must correspond to a pair of mutually commuting Lorentz transformations, so that is a boost towards and a rotation about a fixed direction. And so uh, one of the takeaways of this slide is simply that there is an identification between points on the 2D plane and spatial directions in four dimensions. The second takeaway is that particles in highest weight representations are simultaneously diagonalizing a pair of Lorentz generators. 
And as I'll now explain, there exists a simple construction of this type of state for massless particles. So let's begin with the type of uh, states we typically study of massless particles, which are momentum and helicity eigenstates. And so these, in particular, diagonalize rotations about the direction of the null momentum. And as everybody in this room is probably familiar with, uh, uh, experimental city variables are a useful way to label this state. So that is, we can decompose a null vector into a pair of two component spinners. And one reason we like these is that they transform non-trivially, but are eigenvectors of this rotation about the direction of the null momentum. And what you'll notice is that the thing that's left invariant by this transformation is actually the ratio of the components. And so we should think of this as really specifying the direction of the null momentum, which is also left invariant by this transformation. Now, under general Lorentz transformation, spinner holistic variables uh, transform by the action of SL2C. And if we look at the ratio of the components, well, it actually, in fact, transforms just like a coordinate on the 2D plane under a global conformal transformation. And so, therefore, it's sort of natural to label it as such. And this is an explicit example of this identification between points on the 2D plane, spatial directions, and four dimensions. And so this motivates to us to further parametrize null momentum by points on the 2D plane, so the ratios of the two component vectors. And then we also need a, a third parameter, which is essentially uh, parametrizing the overall scale of the null momentum. And so the upshot is that we can label massless particles and momentum helicity, and helicity eigenstates by points on the 2D plane. Um, helicity, which can be interpreted as the eigenvalue under a rotation that preserves that point. And then a third, and the fourth parameter, omega, which is the scale or of the momentum, or in other words, basically the energy. And so if we recall the labeling of primary operators, in fact, this omega is the only mismatch. And indeed, if we study how omega transforms under a general SL2C transformation, it transforms non-trivially, and so indeed it cannot be identified with the net uh, conformal weight, which is invariant. And uh, in retrospect, this is unsurprising because this delta was the eigenvalue of a dilation in 2D, which uh, corresponds to a boost in four dimension, and for in four dimensions and null momentum are simply not invariant under boosts. And so this is just to say that it's impossible to work with momentum eigenstates that are also in highest weight representations. And so if we're interested in such states, we need to change basis. Now, since we've already diagonalized rotations about the direction of the null momentum, the easiest thing to do is further diagonalize uh, boosts along that direction. And so under such a boost, a null momentum just transforms by an overall rescaling. And so uh, this omega likewise only transforms by an overall rescaling. And so this type of transformation uh, is diagonalized by an integral transformation called the Mellon transform, just the way that Fourier transforms, you know, diagonalized tra uh, translations. And so the upshot is that if you take a Mellon space, uh, momentum space amplitude and you Mellon transform uh, with respect to the energy of each of the massless particles, then you obtain objects that transform under the Lorentz transformations, like correlation functions of primary operators in 2D conformal field theory. And these objects um, are now called celestial amplitudes. And so uh, a couple comments is that this construction that I just described is not unique, um, or is not systematic. And so in particular, this is not the unique way to obtain highest weight representations uh, from momentum space. Um, but it will be the focus of the talk today. And this is because of this key property that points on the 2D plane actually correspond to points on spatial cross sections of null infinity. And this follows from the fact that we uh, were labeling uh, this ratio, uh, that the point on the 2D plane was the ratio of the two components of, this, of the spinner helicity variable, and that was actually labeling the direction of the null momentum. Okay, so that's uh, the first part of the talk, and so now we're gonna move on to the second part of the talk. And so uh, the first thing is that an immediate implication of the fact that uh, these points on the plane actually correspond to points on spatial cross-sections of null infinity is that a limit in which two of the operators approach one another um, is controlled by a limit in which two of the null momentum become uh, collinear. And you can see this explicitly by, if you write p1 dot p2 uh, in these variables, then you can see that it vanishes as z1 approaches z2. Now, in a standard conformal field theory, this limit is governed by uh, an operator product expansion. And so if we wish to interpret boost weight states as local operators, then we need collinear limits to admit a sort of OPE-like structure. 
And as I'll explain now, uh, the collinear limits of tree-level mass of scattering amplitudes do appear to uh, provide a sort of compatible structure. Um, so as is familiar to probably most in the audience, uh, the behavior of tree-level amplitudes in the collinear limit is dominated by a factorization into an n minus one point amplitude in the so-called collinear splitting factor, um, where here I've written it uh, in a way that sort of elucidates uh, its origin from uh, Feynman diagrams. So that is, as, be as P1 becomes uh, collinear to P2, uh, this propagator, which connects uh, a three-point interaction involving particle one and particle two uh, to the rest of the diagram, goes on shell, and the amplitude factorizes into the three-point amplitude and the n minus one point amplitude. And so now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use sort of two very uh, basic uh, features of collinear limits to learn something about uh, a putative uh, operator product expansion. So um, the first thing is that this collinear splitting factor can in fact supply singularities uh, in, in the coordinates on the plane. And this just follows uh, from this parameterization of the propagator. And the second fact is that uh, the collinear uh, limit, the overall scaling of the collinear splitting factor with energy uh, is uh, determined by the bulk dimension of the three point, uh, the bulk dimension of uh, the operator uh, that gives rise to the three point interaction. So that is, if there's uh, uh, an operator in the Lagrangian of dimension uh, dv, then this three-point amplitude will scale like energy to the dv minus three, and when we combine it with the propagator, we learn that the collinear splitting factor uh, scales like energy to the dv minus five. So therefore, a very rough picture of collinear factorization is that in the limit that, uh, two, that uh, z1 approaches z2, we have a pole in uh, Z12, we have energy uh, to this particular power, and then we also have some factor of uh, Z bar 1, 2 to some power uh, that right now I'm gonna leave unspecified. And so what this implies is that uh, celestial amplitudes uh, emit this sort of OPE-like uh, limit, where uh, the first thing is that this singularity in Z12 uh, tells us that actually uh, boost weights behave in some sense like local operators in the sense that as they approach one another, uh, there's some singular behavior. And the second thing is that actually using uh, this uh, energy scaling of the collinear splitting factor, we can deduce a fusion rule for these operators. So that is all we need to do is we need to power count the powers of omega that appear um, uh, 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 on, on the, uh, we need to power count the, uh, we can deduce this fusion rule from the powers of omega. So here what we have is that the Mellon integrals for each of uh, this delta one and delta two each contribute a factor, each, for operator one and two, each contribute a factor of delta one and delta two. And then the collinear splitting fi spac factor uh, contributes an additional uh, shift by delta dv minus five. And so we like to interpret this inter interpret this factorization as arising from an operator product expansion um, of this type of form, um, where now, in fact, we can deduce this P, which before I left unspecified, by comparing the transformation of each side under 2D conformal symmetry. So in other words, uh, matching the net delta weight, we find that P is equal to uh, dV minus four, and matching the net spin, we find it's related to these combination of the spins. And indeed, if you're actually more careful about the precise form of the collinear splitting factor, you can explicitly compute uh, this OP coefficient. And this was done uh, first by uh, this group in 2019. But instead, today what we're gonna do is we're gonna provide a holographic, you know, first principled uh, derivation of this OP coefficients from symmetry. And so actually, uh, a couple years ago at Amplitudes, I described this type of analysis using uh, subleading soft theorems uh, in einstein yang mills um, But today what we're gonna do is we're actually just gonna use Poincaré symmetry uh, to determine these leading OP coefficients uh, between sort of generic uh, massless particles of different spin. And so why is Poincaré sufficient? Well, for many of you, basically, uh, you can see that sort of those leading OP behaviors are just controlled by three-point interactions, which are known to be fixed by Poincaré up to the overall coupling coefficient. Um, and sort of, oops. Another perspective on it, or, is that, so we're uh, massless particles, 
which are by definition irreducible representations of Poincaré, are represented in these amplitudes by a family of operators of fixed spin S, or helicity, and varying boost weight delta. Now, an operator product expansion involves primaries of fixed boost weight, and so the grouping of boost weights into a single 4D particle is actually captured by a non-trivial dependence of the OP coefficients on the boost weight. And so our goal will be to determine this dependence, and the basic logic is that 4D translations are actually going to be relating different conformal families and thereby imposing further constraints on the OP coefficients of the primaries. And the payoff of this analysis is that we'll learn how 4D particles, in other words, irreducible representations of Poincaré, are emerging from the 2D CFT data. Okay, so the basic logic uh, of symmetry constraints on the OP is that if you begin with some onsets, and symmetry implies that if you act on both sides, uh, that it needs to be equal. So as I said, the symmetries of interest are Poincaré, and so here the Lorentz transformations just uh, act as standard global tra conformal transformations on primary operators. And the novel thing are the translations. And so to understand the action of, of these uh, charges, uh, so here was our parameterization uh, in uh, momentum space. So the z and z bar just come along for the ride, um, but uh, this omega, when we take a Mellon transform of it, what it does is it acts now as an operator and shifts the dimension up by one. So this is the action on a primary, on a, of translations on a primary operator where you can see it's shifting the dimension of the operator up by one. And the second piece of information we needed was, this is not to be, oh, is that a battery? Okay. Um, is that uh, we needed an onsatz and so this was our onsatz from just the very sort of basic facts about collinear limits. And actually in this onsatz uh, to perform this analysis, we'll need to include some of the descendants essentially because this translation, the action of translation will mix primaries and descendants. And so here I've shown um, the contribution from just the right moving uh, descendants. And so this parameter M is labeling the level of the descendant and that will actually be enough for this analysis. Okay. And so what do you get from this analysis? Well, essentially what you get is you get recursion relations. And in order to uh, sort of orient ourselves, I've actually shown first the standard type of recursion relation one gets from one of the global conformal generators. And so this is a recursion in M, which was the level of the descendants. And so this just uh, is the familiar um, fact that the coefficients of the descendants are all determined by the coefficient of the primary. Now, if we look at the second one, now that is uh, one the constraint you get from one of the translation generators, and here you can see instead it's a recursion in the conformal dimension. And so this is just the fact that translations are actually relating uh, different conformal families. So the third, third equation is basically uh, the constraint from the other translation, and one of the other translation generators. And here this is both a recursion in the conformal dimension and the level of the descendants, but if we combine it with the one um, the first equation, then we actually get this bottom line here, which is a second recursion relation only in the conformal weight. And so um, if you take these two equations, uh, these are, in, and you stare at them hard enough, then you actually realize that these are the recursion relations for the euler beta function, which can be written as sort of that combination of, um, of uh, gamma functions. And so therefore the solution um, to the fixed, to the constraints at fixed M is this um, Euler beta function. And if you actually use the global conformal uh, constraint, then you find that fixes the relative coefficients between the different M. And so this equation is the solution um, for the OP co coefficients, which is a determined, which is completely fixed up to this sort of overall undetermined spin coefficient, spin dependent coefficient. And you can verify this formula um, by Mellon transforming uh, the collinear splitting factor. And here, then you realize this gamma is just the coupling constant for a three-point interaction between 40 particles of spin S1, S2, and then P plus one minus S1 minus S2. Okay, so that is uh, the second part of the talk. And so two, the two pieces of evidence we have that support this proposal is that there is a sense in which these boost weight states actually behave like local operators in two dimensions, and that you can determine their uh, operator 
uh, OPE coefficients using Poincaré symmetry. And so let me just uh, make a comment about what we've done so far. So at the beginning, we used Lorentz symmetry to motivate this idea that there might be a 2D hologram of 4D scattering. In the second part of the talk, we used Poincaré symmetry uh, to deduce interactions, or in other words, the OPE coefficients for different massless particles. And in the third part of the talk, what we're going to do is we're going to turn this around and now use um, these OPE coefficients that we determined from Poincaré symmetry to discover um, some, some new symmetries of this theory. So now that we have this solution, um, let's study properties, properties of it. And so one of the first things you'll notice is that actually these OPE coefficients have poles uh, in the conformal dimension. So if effectively, if the conformal dimension is a small enough integer, uh, then there's a pole. Now, to understand why we care about these, uh, let's trace back their origin from momentum space. And so to do so, uh, consider the Mellon transform of a function with a Laurent expansion about omega equals zero. So the first equality just shows um, the definition of the Mellon transform. And then we replace F with its Laurent expansion. And what we see is that what a Mellon transform does is it transforms powers of omega into simple poles uh, in delta at integer values. And the residues of those poles uh, give the Laurent expansion coefficients. So this infinite tower of poles and the OP coefficients are really capturing a series expansion in energy. And the reason we care about this is that we know that for scattering amplitudes, this series admits universal behavior that's characterized by soft theorems. So more specifically, soft particles behave like currents that generate infinite dimensional symmetries whose word identities are soft theorems. So let's study this in a little bit more detail uh, in the case of uh, uh, when the particles are actually soft gravitons. So uh, we can do this uh, by first beginning with our our general solution for the operator product expansion and specifying to the case uh, that describes the minimal coupling of a positive helicity graviton to matter. And so here what we'll notice is that the leading pole in the dimension of the, uh, uh, in the graviton dimension, or at the graviton dimension of the largest value is at delta equals one. And the residue of that pole, by this analysis I described, is actually really telling us about the coefficient of the one over omega term and the expansion of the graviton about small energy. And so therefore, this uh, residue is really the content, precisely the content, of the leading soft graviton theorem. But in addition to this uh, pole at delta equals one, there's an infinite series of poles at all smaller uh, energy values of delta, and what this suggests is that there's in fact a universal symmetry action associated to subleading soft theorems that persists to all orders. So given that, a natural question to ask is what is the algebra that's generated uh, by the soft graviton symmetry actions? And so uh, we can determine this uh, from a current current OPE where the currents here are the so-called conformally soft gravitons, and all that means is that there are these gravitons in these boost weight states uh, that have been normalized to extract uh, the residue of the pole when the conformal dimension is a sufficiently small integer. And so in particular, well, we can begin with our solution for uh, the general OPE solution specified to the case of positive felicity gravitons take an appropriate residue when we find essentially this current current OPE. And then further mode expanding, computing, computing a commutator and doing a, a particular sort of relabeling, what one finds is that the symmetry algebra associated, uh, generated by the, the soft gravitons uh, can be put in uh, the form uh, shown in the yellow box. And uh, the reason why this is interesting is this is in fact a known symmetry algebra uh, called little w1 plus infinity. Now, uh, a couple days ago, Alfredo already told you um, some, some facts about this w1 plus infinity symmetry algebra. So let me just uh, sort of supplement those. Uh, so here, this p, uh, uh, takes on integer and half integer values greater than or equal to one, and the, uh, the lower uh, mode number m is restricted to this wedge, um, which uh, means that it's really actually the wedge subalgebra. Um, so to orient you, when p is two, that's actually generating an SL2R action, SL2R action under which uh, the other 
um, uh, WQs transform like primaries of weight Q. Uh, those with P less than or equal to two uh, form a closed subalgebra, which is essentially the Poincaré subalgebra up to a possible central extension. And the W5 halves is the thing that generates uh, the infinite tower corresponding to the, uh, to the infinite tower, which is the uh, infinite number of uh, subleading uh, soft theorem symmetries. And this five halves uh, generator is really the content of the sub subleading uh, soft graviton theorem. And so uh, the final thing we'd like uh, to know is um, does, and if so, how, this W1 plus infinity act on generic massless particles, in other words, not just the soft other soft gravitons. And so this can be determined um, from a current matter OPE, which again can be deduced from our general solution. And uh, so that is, we take our general uh, solution for the OPE, we specify to the case where one of them a, is a positive helicity uh, graviton, and then we you know, uh, compute an appropriate residue, and we get this current uh, matter OPE. And then we do the same thing, a similar thing as before, mode expand, compute the commutator, and relabel. And one finds this sort of complicated action um, uh, on uh, uh, a sort of generic operator representing uh, a massless particle in a boost state, boost eigenstate. Um, uh, but so you didn't need to absorb that equation, but you can show that, uh, in fact, that action uh, uh, respects uh, these uh, equations, which is just to show that the massless particles do, in fact, transform uh, in non-trivial representations of W1 plus infinity. Okay, uh, so uh, let me summarize. So in the beginning part of the talk, we just began with a very simple uh, observation that the symmetry, Lorentz, uh, observation about symmetries, that the Lorentz symmetry in uh, four dimensions is isomorphic to the global conformal symmetry uh, in two dimensions, and, and you use that to motivate this idea that quantum gravity in 4D asymptotically flat space times is holographically dual to a 2D conformal field theory. And in the second part of the talk, um, I describe some evidence that actually supports this idea, which is the first that massless particles and highest weight representations do behave like local operators in the sense that they admit, admit an operator product expansion that contains some singularities. And uh, then we used Poincaré symmetry uh, to fix the leading, uh, the, the coefficients of the leading terms in this operator product expansion. And the final part of the talk, uh, what we learned is we learned something about uh, a large symmetry algebra that underlies uh, gravitational scattering. So that is using um, these leading OP coefficients, which we fixed um, using Poincaré uh, for gravitons, we found that the algebra of soft symmetries organizes into a known symmetry algebra called W1 plus infinity. And now you might ask, can I further turn this around and use this W1 plus infinity symmetry to learn something more? So we, in fact, per perhaps find additional constraints um, on the operator product expansion. And so, in fact, if you actually try and do a sort of basically follow through the same analysis that we did with Poincaré with these um, uh, W1 plus infinity uh, symmetry generators, uh, when you do this on the leading coefficients, you find that they are consistent with, but not further constrained by the W1 plus infinity. Uh, but ne nevertheless, that's not the only type of symmetry analysis one might do, and so um, there's still room uh, for, for learning something new. Okay, that's it. Thank you for a clear talk. Are there any questions? Lance? Uh, thanks for that nice talk. Um, some of what you said seemed to be generic to uh, massless field theories and not just gravity. So uh, I know that in massless gauge theory, there's a collinear behavior of some amplitudes, which is uh, more singular. It, it would be a double pole, I think, in, in, uh, as the two uh, Zs approach each other. Um, these funny splitting amplitudes that split, flip helicity around. Just wondering, does that change the interpretation of the celestial OP? 
Um, so not necessarily a more singular splitting, sorry, a more singular term in Z12, right, can just be accompanied by a, a different sort of operator. Uh, so you, yeah. it would all fit in the same framework? Um, or, I think so, okay. yeah. And then there's on the other extreme, there's like phi to the fourth theory, which has no uh, collinear singularities, but it has like three particle poles where I guess three, three guys come together at the same time. Yes. I don't know so if uh, that's been looked at. Good. So there's not, right, so I guess this gets often asked, how are you supposed to, rep how are you supposed to reproduce um, uh, singularities that are known to happen in amplitudes that involve multiple particles, more than just two? And that has not been uh, adequately answered yet, but one thing to notice is that in the, you know, uh, conformal field theories, which are supposed to be celestial, you really do have translation invariance, which means that you have any, you have an infinite number of primaries. You have to. So basically, like, for, for any conformal family, you have an infinite number of them because they're related by the symmetry algebra. And what people have found is that some of the sort of more surprising things in scattering amplitudes from the perspective of 2D conformal field theory actually arise because you've summed up the contributions from effectively translation invariance. So I think one idea is that maybe you can reproduce these sort of like three particle channels by appropriately summing over the, the things that you generate by translation invariance. But yeah. that's not been shown. So. Yeah, thanks a lot. Any other questions, Julia? Thanks for a very clear talk. Um, I, my question, so this W1 plus infinity algebra, does it fix the full series expansion in the energy of the amplitude or, or not? Good. So, um, so here what we, uh, so first of all, here what I showed was actually it fixes um, the series expansion of the singular, of certain singular terms in, in the holomorphic variables. Now, in a standard conformal field theory, you know you can basically use uh, arguments about, uh, you can use analyticity arguments to figure out what the, the entire amplitude is from just those singular terms. And in this case here, um, you cannot do that uh, for uh, right. So, like, let me say, in this case of the sub sub, so in gravity for leading, sub leading, and sub sub leading, those uh, soft theorems are known to factorize. So basically you have, you take one of the soft part particles to be soft and the amplitude is actually the product of some soft factor in the minus one point amplitude. And so in that case, you can do the sort of uh, analog of the contour argument in, in, in a conformal field theory and, and get reproduce that. In the further subleading cases, the contour argument actually breaks down because these operators, oops, have basically unusual conformal dimensions from the point of view of a conformal field theory. They are not um, the standard, you know, so current single conformal field theory are like usually one comma zero or the stress tensor two comma zero, and these things don't have that. And so that breaks down, that means that you can't apply this analyticity argument. And similarly, there actually is not a factorization of the amplitude at the further subleading orders until a universal soft factor multiplying the n minus one point amplitude. So do we know what this implies for the amplitude? These like uh, other conformally soft gravitons which go beyond the case for leading, subleading, and sub subleading? Uh, when you say do we, as in like do we know what the soft theorems are? In some, is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah. What, what, what does that tell me about the amplitude? The fact that I have this whole tower beyond the sub subleading soft graviton theorem. It tells you, so unfortunately it doesn't tell you, it tells you a piece of the ampl amplitude, but not all of it. 
So you might say, I know the expansion of the amplitude to all, you might think that this tells you an expansion of the amplitude to all powers in the energy of the graviton, and it doesn't. It tells you an expansion of, unfortunately, a piece of the amplitude. But there's a well-defined projection operator you can, well, I mean, maybe you care, maybe you don't, but like, you can define a projection operator which projects out this, this piece, um, and that, that was done in the literature, but yeah. Thanks. Okay, let's thank this speaker again, and move on to So the final speaker of this session is Mark, and he will tell us about effective filters with celestial jewels, and it will be on Zoom. Uh, thank you, Emil. Can, can you hear me? Okay, I'll assume you're able to hear me unless, unless I hear you screaming otherwise. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation, and thank you especially for allowing me to give you uh, this talk by Zoom. I'm really very sad that I was unable to make it to Prague this year. I was really looking forward to it, but in lieu of that, uh, even though it's only 6 a.m. here, I've already prepared myself a nice Pilsner, so I'll be sharing lunch with you uh, virtually um, right after my talk. Um, so let me start with the most important slide of my talk, which is currently projected on the screen. This shows you all the wonderful people that I've had the pleasure of being able to collaborate with um, on celestial things uh, over the past year, but also on non-celestial things in the past and in the future. Um, here you see our uh, two newest graduate students at Brown, Rishav Bardwaj and Shunak Day. Then Yang Rui Hu, who has just graduated and will be joining the Perimeter Institute imminently. My current uh, graduate student, Luke Lipstru, Anastasia's graduate student, Li Cheng Ren, our fantastic postdoc, Akshay Yelishpur Srikant, and of course, Anastasia Volovich. Unfortunately, only three of us uh, were able to make it to Prague this year. This is indicated by the little Charles University insignias uh, there at the bottom. So please go. Uh, meet these three individuals if you can and uh, learn from them everything you aren't able to learn from my talk, which will probably be um, a lot. Okay, so um, the outline of my talk today will, will basically have two pieces. Only the first piece will correspond to the actual title that I gave. Um, that is based on a recent paper we had, uh, 2206083 through 2 on effective field theories with celestial duels. And then beside, because I decided that would be quite brief, uh, it's quite simple to explain, I'll give a second part of my talk, um, just a couple slides on an additional paper to appear soon. Okay, um, so overall the theme of this talk is um, more or less uh, what I've done during my uh, one year sabbatical from high loop amplitudes in N equals four Yang Mills theory. Um, okay, so you've already heard two lovely talks on uh, the celestial program, so my review will fortunately be able to be brief. Um, celestial CFT refers to the hypothesis that scattering in a four-dimensional space-time can be encoded by some kind of CFT on the celestial sphere. Now at zeroth order, you already heard from Monica, of course we have the obvious fact that Lorentz invariance in the bulk is realized by the SL2 global conformal group on the celestial sphere. But of course, uh, before you would want to call something a CFT, you would want more than that, more than just that fact. So, and it's clear uh, from examples that have been looked at so far that any putative CCFT must have some very unusual and exotic properties, properties that, you know, ordinary people who study ordinary CFTs might uh, turn up their noses at. Uh, uh, for example, we have, might have to abandon the notion or modify the notion of unitarity. The spectrum is very weird. There are lots of uh, unusual and exotic properties. And so at some point you may, you may start to call in the question, well, are these properties so exotic and so unusual that they call into question the very utility 
of using the framework or the language of C CFT at all. Um, in other words, if I were to, you know, to, to really be uh, um, bold, uh, you could ask the question, how much is too much to give up? Okay, I'm just gonna throw that question out there. I'm not gonna answer it one way or the other, it's just something to think about. So um, uh, the first part of my talk is gonna focus on um, something that Monica already uh, beautifully introduced. And this has to do with the operator product expansion for conformally soft graviton modes. And one of the properties of a CFT that you might or might not be loath to give up is the idea that you have an operator product expansion that is associative. So let me quickly review uh, the story. Again, I'm glad that Monica went right before me. Um, so the idea is that uh, for positive helicity gravitons on the celestial sphere, you have an operator product expansion, which uh, I've written below. Um, uh, it has a one over Z pole, and then I've expanded it in powers of Z bar. Sometimes you'll only see the first term in this infinite sum if you're not, if you're not interested in keeping track of the descendants. Um, you've got the Euler beta function in there. That's the coefficient. Uh, delta one and delta two are the conformal dimensions of the primaries appearing on the left. And for now, just think of them as arbitrary parameters. They're not, as far as we know, fixed by anything, they're just, they're, there's a family of primaries and they're labeled by delta. Uh, the, there's an overall coefficient kappa that appears and um, for reasons that will become clear later, I'm denoting it by kappa two comma two comma minus two. And you should really think about this as the three point coupling for uh, gravitons. In other words, the square root of Newton's constant. Okay. This OPE was worked out in, in two different ways. First of all, by essentially taking the Mellon transform of the splitting uh, of the, you know, the collinear limit of uh, two positive holistic gravitons by Fan, Fotopoulos, and Taylor. And alternatively, it was uh, derived by an isometry argument by Pate et al. Um, in the reference that I've given at the bottom of my slide. Okay. Now, as Monica already noticed, the OPE coefficient from the beta function has poles, and that motivates you to define conformally soft graviton operators that basically read off the residues of those poles. Then you do a mode expansion like you normally do in conformal field theory, and um, the operator, the commutation relation, you can read off from the operator product expansion. This was done by Guevara et al. And then after a suitable rescaling, Andy Strominger showed that it is equivalent to this W1 plus infinity algebra, or more specifically the wedge subalgebra thereof. Okay, so that story was beautifully reviewed um, in the previous talk, and I think is um, there's there's still many open questions. Oops, my laptop is uh, unstable. Okay. Uh, there's still many open questions um, specifically about what are the full set of implications of this symmetry in in various kinds of uh, amplitudes um, it's really an interesting story um, that still deserves a lot of attention um, there's an analogous story for gluons where they uh, live in a certain representation of the w1 plus infinity um, algebra okay so um, the title of this section of my talk, you already saw, contains the word EFT. So uh, in a paper last year, Himwich et al. considered corrections to the operator product expansion from non-minimal couplings. So instead of just taking uh, Einstein gravity, you might want to consider Einstein gravity with an R-cubed interaction, or maybe throw in a scalar field and consider R squared phi or R phi squared, various different kinds of uh, uh, deformations to Einstein gravity. And in a subsequent paper, Mako et al. Uh, with the Brown people worked out the corresponding corrections to this algebra. Okay, so in order to uh, review their results, let me introduce just a little bit of notation. Um, I've already done this, but now let's, I'll explain what it means. When you see kappa, 
kappa H1 comma H2 comma H3 refers to the three-point coupling uh, for helicities H1, H2, and H3. So for example, there in the first line, you see the Einstein term, which for example, gives you a three-point uh, 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 amplitude. Uh, here I've drawn the MHV bar, I could have drawn the MHV, um, but you see uh, it's just the usual um, uh, three-point amplitude there. And then in the second line, I've shown you an example of an amplitude that you get from an R cubed interaction that's in a three positive helicity gluon interaction again with the coefficient kappa two, two, two. So the only purpose of this slide is to, to make you familiar with what my notation uh, for kappa means. Okay, because we'll be labeling the, we'll be using these kappas, they're the Wilson coefficients of the EFT that we're, that we're considering the deformed W infinity algebra in. Okay, so in this paper, um, they computed the algebra or they computed the commutation relations from the OPE, like you normally do in uh, conformal field theory. And they found that the uh, commutation relations satisfy the Jacobi identity only if the Wilson coefficients satisfy certain very particular constraints. Okay, and here I've written three of the most interesting constraints. Um, and then in red, just in case you haven't internalized it yet, I've just highlighted who some of these players are. For example, we've already seen the kappa 222. It's the R cubed turn. Um, and then in the second line there, you see a kappa 111. That would be if you had a, an F cubed interaction in yang Mills theory. So the logic here is I'm just considering this, I'm, considering gravitons coupled to a uh, uh, yang mills theory, so Einstein-Maxwell, um, and then um, I'm throwing in also a massless scalar field. So that's the zero that you see on the left-hand side as I'm allowing for the possibility um, of a scalar. Okay, so these are rather um, unusual constraints. Uh, when people, uh, you know, in the recent literature, in the recent literature, there's been a lot of work on various types of bootstrapping amplitudes from various different perspectives using unitarity, analyticity, etc. cetera. Um, and often in various bootstrap approaches, you get interesting inequalities on Wilson coefficients. So this is kind of a really unusual um, result in the sense that you get these actual equalities. And it's, it's really interesting to ask various questions like, for example, do these equalities sit on interesting uh, boundaries of, of regions that you get uh, from inequalities in various other bootstrap approaches? Okay, this is an interesting question. I don't know the answer to off the top of my head, but that's not the question that we explored in our recent paper. Um, the, the question we explored in the recent paper is, um, first of all, uh, so this is the paper 2206-08322. We reformulated the condition for OPE associativity uh, directly at the level of momentum space scattering amplitudes. And we found exactly the same constraints that I've already just advertised. And uh, we also, you know, coming from a more, with the intention of appealing to people from a somewhat more uh, traditional amplitudes background, we were interested in answering the question or asking the question, what are the implications for the amplitudes in a theory that obeys these constraints? In other words, is there anything special about the amplitudes in an EFT whose celestial dual has an associative OPE and whose couplings satisfy the constraints that are written here, okay? Um, and the answer, uh, yes, the answer is yes. Um, in fact, it turned out uh, unbeknownst to me, uh, but the three tenths, for example, is, is famous. So there's this um, rather striking three tenths there, and that's famous in certain circles. If, if you don't know it off the top of your head, I'll explain it to you now. Um, here, the idea is let's consider a, uh, an all positive helicity for graviton amplitude. And importantly here, I should have written it on the slide, 
But I have in mind that I'm using the all line uh, recursion relation to constructively recurse higher point amplitudes. Okay, now that's not valid uh, in general. There's a condition on the um, dimensions of the operators that you're adding uh, such that the you know, when you do it, when you, when you construct amplitudes by a recursion, whether it be BCFW or whatnot, you have to worry about the possibility of a boundary term at infinity that spoils the usual argument that you can construct the amplitude recursively. So anyway, I'm, at, I'm only going to, for now, I'm only going to look at amplitudes which are constructible via an online recursion. And here's an example of how you would compute the four positive graviton amplitude using that recursion. There are two different types of exchange graphs. First of all, there's a graviton exchange. Of course, that's going to probe uh, the various graviton couplings. And then there's a scalar exchange, if I'm allowing my EFT to have a scalar field. And then there are various permutations of these diagrams. Okay, well, if you work them all out, um, I'll just show you the interesting part. The relative coefficient between the graviton and the scalar coefficients, uh, contributions, um, it turns out to be three tenths. So this amplitude vanishes precisely uh, when the coupling constants satisfy that constraint um, that we got from the imposing associativity of the OPE of the celestial dual. Okay, and we look at several other examples. Um, and in fact, we showed that all, all line shift constructible four point amplitudes involving external scalars, gluons, and gravitons must vanish on the support of these constraints. Okay. Now, the, ca the caveat um, all line shift constructible is important because there are, uh, there are four point amplitudes that are not constructible. Um, here's an example of one. Uh, this particular one was computed by Burdell and Dixon several years ago. And I just, I show you the answer here. Um, it's not zero, but it doesn't violate my um, previous sentence because it's, it's not uh, all line shift constructible. Okay, uh, now for, for higher point amplitudes, it's basically the same thing. If the amplitude is all line shift constructible, the general statement is that, you know, you might have a contribution from many, many diagrams, many terms, uh, when you, as you're recursing down to build everything up in terms of three point functions, the general statement is that all contributions that involve purely holomorphic or purely anti holomorphic vertices vanish on the support of these constraints. Okay, now um, we had a little bit of confusion about this for some time, but I think we figured it out now. Um, the vanishing of the four positive helicity graviton. Uh, is not by itself enough to guarantee associativity of the corresponding celestial OPE, but it does serve as an interesting and simple and powerful check. Um, and it's, it, I sh maybe I could have mentioned this at an earlier time. Um, uh, there's an interesting recent paper by Costello and Paquette who showed that the celestial dual of self-dual Yang-Mills theory does not have an associative chiral algebra unless one adds, adds a funny kind of axion field with a very specific coupling constant. So that's, that's again an example where you see that a, you have a coupling constant that has to take a very particular value uh, in order to have associativity. So it, it's, it's not directly related. The analysis we did, it would be interesting to redo our analysis to allow uh, the way we didn't did it, we're not sensitive. Self dual Yang Mills theory and deformations of self dual Yang Mills theory are not in the class of theories that we were able to look at, but it would be interesting to do that. Thank you, Emil. So, um, uh, some rampant speculation. It seems that most 4D effective field theories do not have celestial duals with an associative OPE. There's a question mark after the word seems here because there are many caveats here. Um, you know, really you would want to make a statement about the non-perturbative amplitude. Here we're looking at tree level contributions. We only looked at massless 
uh, states what are the possible contribution for massive exchange. Uh, I understand there's some interesting work to appear by Guevara on that. But anyway, uh, to continue my rampant, or to begin my rampant speculation, I basically want to throw out the question, many people in the audience might be wondering, uh, for a person interested only in four-dimensional amplitudes, what is the value of asking the question, does the celestial dual have an associative OPE? What would that tell a person who's interested uh, in just, you know, who maybe has no interest in celestial CFT, but is interested only in 4D amplitudes? So I'll throw out some speculations that have been made um, by others. Um, maybe this is a property possessed by certain very special uh, four-dimensional amplitudes that possess some kind of integrability, in quotes here. Uh, here I'm, I'm taking comments made by Kevin Costello at a talk he gave in April, and the vanishing of certain amplitudes, like the all-plus graviton amplitude, you know, when you have amplitudes vanishing, uh, that maybe could be taken as a sign of some kind of integrability. Uh, 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 another item of rampant speculation is maybe these strange coupling constant constraints uh, should be interpreted as kind of a swampland constraint that only, quote, good theories of quantum gravity satisfy these constraints. And the good theories of quantum gravity are the ones that have, an that have a celestial dual that has an associative OPE. Okay, and I'll just throw out a, the, the, the interesting fact that, for example, the all plus four graviton amplitude does vanish in heterotic string theory, but does not vanish in bosonic string theory because there's a non-zero contribution from the R cubed term. Okay, this is a comment that's made, been made by Strominger. Um, so it belongs on this slide called rampant speculation. Um, since I have three minutes left, uh, I just want to briefly advertise a paper to appear. Um, and the idea here is that a lot of the work in celestial, uh, celestial CFT is hindered by the fact that we don't really have many exact amplitudes to play with. We're always limited to low energy expansions or perturbation theory. And it would be really nice to have more exact uh, uh, amplitudes to play with. Now, in the case of n equals four super yang Mills theory, where the S matrix is zero, if you wanna have an interesting uh, exact amplitude, you need to go on to the Coulomb branch where you give the scalar fields an expectation value. Now here, I just wanna to advertise to all the students and postdocs out there in the audience that the Coulomb branch is vastly unexplored compared to the number of people hours that have been spent on, on perturbation theory at the origin of moduli space. But anyway, it's also much harder, perhaps. Um, there's a very, very specific corner of the Coulomb branch that suits us well. And that's the corner where you break the UN symmetry to UN minus M cross UM with the N much greater than M greater than one, giving the off diagonal gluons a mass M. In this limit, the dominant contributions to the scattering of the massless gluon. So here I'm drawing the UM gluons as purple, the UN minus M, well, the UN indices in purple. I have, this is a fat graph. Uh, the UN minus M uh, indices in, in brown. And then I'm tracing, I'm, I used red just to trace the, you know, the massive propagators. Okay, so the dominant diagrams in this corner of the Coulomb branch uh, all come from graphs that have that are framed by a single external loop of massless gluons, and then all the internal loops are massless. Okay, so this was studied several years ago, um, in particular first by Alde, Hen, Plefka, and Schuster, who suggested that the exact amplitude has a BDS-like form with the mass M instead of epsilon playing the role of an infrared regulator. So here I draw, I show you the four point MHV amplitude. It's the tree level term times this exponential that involves the cusp anomalous dimension gamma, a version of the collinear anomalous dimension G, some function of the coupling and then plus order M squared. Um, since I'm running low on time, uh, I'll delay, I'll be very brief on the advertisement one nice feature of this is that when you expand the exponential, 
There's no pollution from cross order. There's no cross order contamination. Thank you, Emil. Uh, that can happen in dimensional. So in dimensional regularization, you have a one over epsilon squared here that when you expand out the exponential can pull down higher order terms in epsilon and make them contribute at finite order. That doesn't happen here because the limit of m squared times log m squared is zero, even if you raise, you know, even if you raise them to various integer powers. Anyway, I'm almost done here because now we can compute the celestial avatar of this amplitude, although the, ascent, the calculation was essentially already done for us in the literature because it's identical to the calculation of Gonzalez, Pum, and Rojas, who did it for the BDS ansatz. And from this result, we can read off the all loop OPE, which takes this form. Okay, so it's similar to the formula I showed you for the graviton OPE. If you only focus on the blue, that's the primary contribution to the, the OPE of two positive helicity gluons. And then it gets modified by this exponential factor. Again, essentially, um, identical to the one by um, uh, Poom et al. that I already cited, um, where this curly D is a certain differential operator. Okay. And interestingly, we've also shown that this is the OP of the hard gluon operators. So um, as, as you know, in, in, uh, there's a factorization of the soft and hard pieces uh, in uh, gluon amplitudes and at the level of celestial correlators, that corresponds into a factorization of a hard, of a soft piece, um, and then a and then a hard gluon operator piece. And uh, if you work out the OP of the hard piece, it's exactly what I've shown there. I love that slide, Emil. Okay, so uh, by way of conclusion, uh, just to summarize, we've looked at the implications for amplitudes and EFTs whose celestial duals have an associative OPE. We've looked at an example of an all loop OPE, which exhibits some unusual features. In particular, I didn't mention this at the time, but the logarithms you get here are rather, un I mean, they're untypical. In, in CFT, <coughs> if you encounter logarithms, there are at least two possibilities. One is just that you're looking at the perturbative expansion of something like like if you have an anomalous dimension and you do a perturbative expansion of a correlation function, you'll see logarithmic terms that have to resum eventually into something non-logarithmic. Alternatively, a more exotic possibility is that what we have here is what's known as a logarithmic CFT. Like for example, the CFT of a massless scalar in, in two dimensions, the, the X field on the string world sheet where X with X is log Z. Anyway, since I'm out of time, uh, let me just then say that many of the natural questions that you in the audience might have would greatly benefit from studying simpler examples that can be more explicitly worked out. For example, self-dual gravity or Yang-Mills theory, the N equals two string. I mentioned that because of a, of a possible connection um, to the work of uh, Costello and Paquette. Um, there was also a nice, interesting recent paper by Garcia Sepulveda, Guevara, Culp, and Wu, who looked at the exact four pion uh, amplitude in the large end limit of the three dimensional ON sigma model. So it's nice to look at exa exact uh, examples because you can ask interesting questions about contributions from non perturbative effects or resonances or massive states, things like that. But anyway, I'll end for now and thank you again for uh, allowing me this Zoom talk and I'll happily take any questions. Thank you for a nice, clear talk. We have a few questions. Uh, I think Yara was first. Yeah, um, hi Mark, this is Sierra. Thanks a lot for a great talk. So I have a question about these all plus amplitudes. So in your three level analysis, you got a constraint that they must vanish. But we know that in Young Mills or Einstein gravity, they are generated at one loop. So does it have an interpretation or can you imagine <clears throat> what it might mean here? Right, Ex excellent question. So our analysis was entirely at, at uh, right. It, um, the calculations we did were entirely at tree level, but it's, it, it's natural to speculate that if you have a non-zero amplitude generated at one loop, 
that would give you a non that would give you a celestial dual with the non-associative OPE. So if uh, it's it's natural to expect that, um, I would expect that. So that's why if it's true that the correct way to think about these constraints is some kind of uh, uh, swampland idea, then you would really want to impose these constraints at the level of full exact amplitudes. You want to you would. You would want to say that celestial dual requires the four point all plus amplitude to be exactly zero. Um, but again, that's just speculation. Um, it, it would be interesting to, to study further. But again, it's, it's hard to do much when we're limited in many of our calculations to using crutches like perturbation theory, or et cetera. But thanks, excellent question. question yeah. yeah hi mark this is lance thanks for a great talk well the obvious cure to make the all plus amplitudes uh, vanish is supersymmetry of course <laughs> and, and it works non-perturbatively and it makes the prediction that super partners are degenerate with the particles we've already observed which isn't quite verified yet but <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's uh, an interesting comment. Do, but do you know? Do you know if uh, if you impose supersymmetry, can you actually prove associativity? You know, to higher yeah. orders, or have people looked at that? There have been some initial uh, looks at uh, supersymmetry, uh, very preliminary studies in the celestial context. That's an interesting question because these constraints, when they pop out, they don't appear to have anything to do with supersymmetry. But it would be interesting. It would be really interesting to explore that question. Uh, uh, I have a question, and uh, maybe it's related to the first one. Uh, you show us the constraints on the Wilson coefficients. I wonder when you consider the operator mixings and renormalizations, will these constraints still hold? Uh, yeah, that's my question. Well, yeah. Um, Again, since we're amplitudologists, we, yeah, it would be nice if, I prefer to formulate everything at the level of amplitudes, actually, not at the, um, not at the level of uh, um, uh, Wilson coefficients. And because, because we did our analysis at tree level, we're not sensitive specifically to the question you would ask. So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and speculate even though this is not really proven, uh, I'm gonna again speculate that maybe the right way to phrase it is to say the, van the vanishing of the, let's say, the vanishing of the all four positive velocity graviton is the right takeaway, not exactly the, <coughs> uh, the, the uh, constraints you saw written on the couplings. But, but, but again, that, 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 should, that needs to be investigated further. Oh, thank you. Final question. Um, I just had a maybe dumb question about one of your rampant speculations. Um, so naively at tree level, I think the vanishing of the all plus amplitude says that you have a consistent self dual sector and then integrability would follow from the vanishing of the one minus rest plus yeah. amplitude. So, so do you get any constraints on that one? I mean, that's an excellent question. So that's why, um, that's why I put the word integrability in curly quotes. Um, because, so I, I showed you this, ex I specifically showed you this example um, where the one minus is non, it, it doesn't, I don't know if you're able to see this, are you able to see the slide I'm on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, yeah. Um, it doesn't appear that there's anything in the celestial OFT telling you that this has to, van you know, this has to vanish. Um, may, maybe, maybe there's something we forgot to, uh, you know, maybe, 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 um, maybe there are other OPEs you have to look at. Uh, maybe if you look at the plus minus OPE, although that one has its own confusions. Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I, I don't know what to say, except I can evade it by saying that I put integrability in quote, in curly quotes. So fair play. Yep. Yeah. Light of time, I think we'll stop here. So let's thank Mark again. Thank you.
So we will go right now for a photo and uh, uh, Mr. Martin, our technician, uh, is, is still in the room so you can leave the things here if you want or yeah, it's up to you. So we will go out to this green square first uh, in the central. Be careful crossing the road <laughs> and then we will take another photo from the stairs.
okay, I'll, I'll just click it. Let's keep this one up. I'll yeah, just I'll read it. Yeah. 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 Uh, welcome to the afternoon session. Uh, our first speaker is Andrew McLeod, and he's going to tell us about novel analytic constraints on Feynman integrals. Okay, thank you. Is this on? Yes. Okay, well, first, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak and for putting on an excellent workshop or conference. Uh, before I really get started though, I want to officially announce the dates for Amplitudes 2023, which will be held at CERN about a year from now on August 7th through 11th. We will also have a school the week before from July 31st to August 4th, so please uh, put these dates down on your calendar and we look forward to seeing you all there. And we'll make sure this data gets on the uh, current Amplitudes website as well. Um, so today I'm going to be talking about one branch of a larger research program that I've been involved in with uh, my collaborators, Hofi Hannes Doder, Matthew Schwartz, and Christian Bergu, um, all of whom are here this week, where we've been trying to understand um, what types of analytic constraints can be put on Feynman integrals from basic principles such as causality. So a large part of our motivation for looking for such constraints comes from the surprising um, empirical properties that have been observed in many Feynman integrals over the last decade or so. So these include, for instance, um, the fact that the locations of branch cuts in large classes of Feynman integrals, especially in the supersymmetric context, um, have been seen to exhibit intriguing connections to cluster algebras and related algebraic structures. And so this observation has actually given rise to a wide body of literature. Um, so I apologize for those of you who are being cited in the ellipses here, because there's far too much literature now to cite. Um, and then moreover, the sequential discontinuities of many of these Feynman integrals um, also have been observed to obey generalized versions of the Steinman relations, where we recall that the Steinman relations are the statement that if you take a double discontinuity of an amplitude in partially overlapping momentum channels, you always get zero. Now, while the original Steinman relations from 1960 say this about the first two discontinuities of an amplitude or a Feynman integral, um, what's been observed is is that in many Feynman integrals, actually, this is also true for all sequential discontinuities. So for instance, the third and fourth discontinuity, or the fourth and fifth. Um, and very notably, actually, um, recently, this has also been observed in the non-planar sector by these authors, so, but only in some cases. So for instance, in this non-planar hexabox integral, extended Steinman has been observed to be satisfied um, in um, partially overlapping channels, as shown on the left, but not in the example shown on the right. So these are the types of questions we would like to better understand why things like extended Steinman are satisfied in some examples and not others. Um, so more specifically, we're interested in asking the question of whether we can derive these types of properties of Feynman integrals directly from Landau analysis, where by Landau analysis, I mean the study of uh, the singularities of, of Feynman integrals and how Feynman integrals behave near these singular points. Um, so, to this analysis, we also bring a detailed knowledge of the types of iterated integrals that have been observed to appear in Feynman integrals. Um, the simplest class of which have, we've seen um, plenty of times in this conference already, which are just iterated integrals on the uh, Riemann sphere with some punctures, otherwise known as multiple poly algorithms. Um, but more pragmatically, we can just talk about multiple poly algorithms as functions that have the property that they're differential is expressible as a sum of d log forms times lower weight multiple poly algorithms, where the arguments of these d logs are just going to be algebraic functions of, um, for us, the kinematic variables. Um, so as we've seen in other talks in this conference, um, it's also useful to define the symbol of multiple poly algorithms, which we do just by upgrading this total differential to a tensor product, where we take the, each d log and we just add a tensor factor um, using the argument of the d log, and we do this iteratively so that we end up with a symbol that takes the form of some n-fold uh, tensor product. So just to give a few examples of the types of functions um, that we see in the class of multiple poly algorithms, we have things like the logarithm, because of course if we take a differential of that, we get a d log back, and then the classical poly algorithms, which are defined at weight one as to be um, minus log of one minus z, and then at higher weight by iteratively integrating over the lower weight poly algorithm 
with the integration kernel DT over T. And then we can compute the symbol of these classical polylogarithms down here, and we see that this symbol uh, just encodes all the information about the integrations that went into the definition of this function um, from the back using the, uh, the iterated derivative structure that we can see by iteratively applying this. So just to drive this point home, if we have a Feynman integral, which um, depends on some external kinematics and masses, which I'll collectively denote by P for the rest of this talk, then we can really try and expose the analytic structure of this Feynman integral, if it can be expressed as a multiple poly logarithm, by computing its symbol. And in particular, we can read from uh, this symbol from right to left, and there we learn about the iterated derivatives of this uh, Feynman integral. Or we can also read the symbol from left to right, where we learn about its iterated discontinuities, because this is, in this order, we're learning about the uh, integrals that went into the definition of these multiple poly logarithms. Um, so with this in mind, my collaborators and I have been following two broad strategies for constraining the analytic structure of Feynman integrals. Um, in the first strategy, we're trying to constrain the symbol of Feynman integrals from the front by studying what sequences of discontinuities are allowed in these integrals um, by looking at where they can develop singularities. And then we can also try and constrain symbols from the back by restricting the derivatives of Feynman integrals by studying their behavior when we expand them around these branch points. So we'll actually hear more about the first strategy in the next talk from Hofi, and I'll be focusing for the rest of this talk on the second strategy. So just to get started then, let me recall some basic facts about the singularities of Feynman integrals. Uh, the first is just that these singularities can only appear on the support of the so-called Landau equations, where we associate uh, an equation of this form here with every edge in our Feynman integral, and as well, we associate a Landau loop equation with every closed, independent closed loop in our, in our integral as well, where the um, alpha and the E are just the Feynman parameter and mass associated with each edge, and Q is the momentum flowing through that edge. Now, the types of solutions to the Landau equations that we'll be interested in in this talk are the ones that put exactly one constraint on the external kinematics of our process. And so, as we approach one of these singular uh, points, which I'll denote by some kinematic variable phi approaching zero, then um, we generally expect that the leading non-analytic behavior of Feynman integrals will take this form, where we have this small variable phi uh, raised to some power gamma times some um, logarithms of phi potentially as well. And just to be clear, I'm going to be focusing on the leading non-analytic behavior, meaning I'm going to be caring about terms that have things like logarithmic, logarithmic branch cuts and algebraic branch cuts, such as square roots. So just to see a very explicit um, example of this type of behavior, we can look at the class of what I'll call all mass Feynman integrals, which are integrals that have both ge generic uh, internal and external masses, and I'll consider these in D dimensions. And Landau um, showed, oh, about 60 years ago now, that the uh, leading behavior of these types of integrals as they approach one of their branch points is controlled by this so-called uh, Landau exponent here, which depends on the space-time dimension in which we're observing our uh, Feynman integrals, or studying our Feynman integrals, and then the loop L and edges E, number of edges E, associated with the Landau diagram that um, gives us the branch point we're approaching. So once we have determined this exponent gamma in the example we're looking at, then the um, leading behavior as we approach this singular point for one of these integrals will either go as phi to the power gamma, or phi to the power gamma times log phi if gamma is a non-negative integer. So just to be very clear about what I mean, uh, let me show a quick example. So we might consider the two particle thresholds or pseudo thresholds in our theory. And these thresholds are associated with the bubble Landau diagrams. And by that, I just mean if I solve the Landau equations associated with this graph, I get the constraint that the momentum flowing through my graph is going to um, be put on to either the threshold or the pseudo threshold singularity. And so if we want to study these branch points, we just look at this Landau diagram and read off the correct value of gamma by noting that it's um, got L equals one loop and E equals two internal edges. So this will give rise to different types of leading um, non-analytic behavior in different numbers of dimensions. So for instance, in three dimensions, we'll find that we expect our uh, Feynman integral to go as log phi as phi becomes small. Um, in four dimensions, we actually expect algebraic branch points to appear in the form of a square root. And then as we increase the dimension by two, we just multiply these 
um, predictions by another power of the small variable phi. So this is just an example. Backing up a bit now, we want to ask the question, if we're able to uh, predict the leading non-analytic behavior of Feynman integrals, um, an example such as this, does this inform us actually um, about what the symbol of these Feynman integrals looks like? Can we put constraints on our Feynman integrals from this knowledge? So the general strategy we're going to follow to try and address this question is first we'll assume that we have some knowledge of the um, leading non-analytic behavior of Feynman integrals near some branch point, and then separately and in parallel we'll study how generic multiple polylogarithms behave near one of the singularities that appear in their symbols. And then by comparing these two expansions, we can translate knowledge of our Feynman integral into constraints on its symbol. So um, we've seen examples of um, Feynman integrals where we understand um, the leading non-analytic behavior near certain branch points. Now let's look at how generic multiple polylogarithms behave near their branch points. So we start by studying the contribution that comes from a symbol term where we just have a single symbol letter um, that becomes, that vanishes as phi becomes zero. And then the rest of my symbol letters, A1 through AN, I'll assume are finite in this limit, well behaved. So in order to understand the contribution coming from this symbol term, we need to rewrite it as an iterated integral. And so we can do that as follows, where we just upgrade each of our symbol letters to a D log form, which then need to be pulled back from the space of external momenta, uh, P and phi, to some auxiliary integration variables, or stated differently, we just have some function sigma that parameterizes the integration contour in the space of external kinematics. So we can actually be very explicit about this just to make our life simpler. So for our purposes, it's sufficient to consider a straight line integration contour in the space of external kinematics that just goes from some arbitrary integration point P dot to the value P of the uh, external momenta where we're considering our symbol term. So we want to understand the contribution coming from this iterated integral. In order to do so, it turns out to be useful to rewrite the integration such that we do the integral over the d log of phi uh, last. So we want to do the integral over t last. And we do this by defining two new iterated integrals, u and v, which now depend on this variable t. So in particular, um, this u is just defined as the first m minus 1 integrations of the iterated integral on the last slide, except now the upper integration boundary is t. And v is very similar for the last n minus m integrations, except now the lower integration boundary is t. Um, and then the last uh, component of our integral here that we can make a little more explicit is if we choose the integration base point in the variable phi to be 1, then we can just use the um, chain rule, write out a very explicit form of this d log um, in terms of the uh, variable t. And once we do that, it makes very clear that if we're interested in the singularity that happens as phi goes to zero, we're going to be interested in the end point of our integral here as t approaches one, because otherwise we'll have some um, finite factor here that will regulate that divergence. So with that in mind, let's look at how these functions u and v behave as t approaches one. Well, in the case of u, it's no problem. We assume that all these symbol letters are nice and well behaved as phi goes to zero, so we just, at leading order, replace u of t by one, but v is going to vanish, and it's easy to see why. That's because the integrations um, in the defined v are going from t to one, and that integration um, contour is just going to vanish as so I take t to one. And in particular, we're going to have n minus m such vanishing integrations. So if we want to learn about the leading non-analytic behavior we get from this integral, what we do is we expand u and v to leading order as t goes to one. So as I just discussed, we can replace u by its value at one. And then we tailor expand this function v to leading order, which requires taking n minus m derivatives, because that's how many vanishing integ uh, integrals I had. And importantly, that gives us this factor of t minus one to the n minus one, n minus m power out in front. Um, and so this remaining object here will no longer depend on t, and we can just evaluate this integral explicitly. So doing so, and dropping all the rational terms, because again, I don't care about things that don't have branch cuts in them, what we find is that the contribution from this symbol term goes as phi to the power n minus m times log of phi. Or if I refer back very explicitly to the symbol term we started with, what I'm finding is that the branch cut log of phi is suppressed by the number of symbol letters that appear after it in this symbol term. 
So the last few slides are a bit dry, so I apologize, and if you zoned out, here's where to come back, because uh, here's the upshot of this argument. Um, if we have a Feynman integral, where we know the leading non-analytic behavior goes like phi to the gamma times log of phi near some branch point, then there are two things we can conclude about the symbol of this Feynman integral. The first is that we can have uh, no symbol letters that vanish as phi approaches zero in the last gamma entries of the symbol, and that's just because if we did have that, then we'd have some super leading behavior compared to this prediction. And also, we have to have at least one term in the symbol where this branch point at phi equals zero does appear in exactly the n minus gamma entry, and that's because we need at least a chance to be able to reproduce this leading behavior. So these are new constraints that we can place on our symbol just from this knowledge in the region of uh, phi goes to zero. So let's go back to the all mass example and just see what types of predictions we can make there. So we saw in even dimension, or sorry, in odd dimensions, um, that we have logarithmic branch points developing. And so we can just um, use the predictions and bounds that I wrote on the last slide. So for instance, in three dimensions, we have uh, the prediction that the variable or the branch point in phi should appear in the last entry of the symbol, whereas in five dimensions, we expect the branch point in phi to appear in the second last um, entry of the symbol and not in the last entry, and so on. We can go down to any odd dimension we want. And in the specific case of the one loop integrals of this type, the n gons in n dimensions, the symbol of these Feynman integrals is actually known, and so we can just go and explicitly check these predictions. And what we find is that this analysis correctly predicts the position of all logarithmic branch points in these symbols. So not just the ones associated with the two particle thresholds, which I use as an example, but the branch points associated with more complicated Lando diagrams like triangles, boxes, pentagons, and so on. But if we recall back to our all mass example, um, we'll remember that in fact the two particle thresholds also were expected to give rise to algebraic branch points in other dimensions. So it's natural to ask, can we also make predictions or put bounds on where these algebraic branch points can appear? And so the answer is yes. So if we instead just consider a symbol term that has some symbol letter here that has algebraic dependence on phi as phi goes to zero, so we have a square root um, branch point in phi, then we can do the same exact type of analysis um, by just replacing the d log of phi with the new d log of this symbol letter. So we just take the total differential of uh, this d log and consider it in the phi goes to zero limit. And running through the same analysis as before, after pulling back to this um, um, space of integration variables, we can do the integral and we find that phi goes as m, uh, goes to the power m minus n plus one half, where m and n are both gonna be integers, so this is also gonna be an odd or a, a, half, a half integer. So we can make similar conclusions as we did before. In particular, if we have some Feynman integral that goes as phi to the gamma, um, where gamma is a half integer um, near some branch point, we can conclude that uh, no symbol letters with algebraic dependence on phi will appear in the last gamma minus one half entries. And similarly, we must have at least one symbol letter that has algebraic dependence in the n minus gamma plus one half entry. And we can go back to the one loop examples and see that these predictions are exactly borne out to all weight. Um, so we can continue with this game um, and consider, for instance, symbol terms that contain multiple logarithmic branch points as phi goes to zero. And I'm not gonna bore you with all that analysis, but the upshot is if we have R repeated uh, logarithms in, or logarithmic branch points in phi, we'll just increase the power of the logarithm that multiplies this um, power of phi to the um, n minus m. Whereas in the algebraic case, actually we find that in increasing the number of algebraic branch points in the symbol, we still get the same exact type of contribution, which is actually a, a bit interesting. But note that actually these two types of contributions won't mix in the end of the day because if you pay attention to the function u that we pulled out in front, which will still have dependence on the external kinematics, that function will have some transcendental weight associated with it, which will be different for these different types of contributions. But then the upshot is that we have a dictionary now that we can use to translate between the leading in, um, behavior of Feynman integrals near their branch points and where these branch points can appear in the symbol. So before I wrap up, I just wanna now return to the Feynman integral side of things, where I've discussed the example of the all mass Feynman integrals. Um, unfortunately, um, making these types of leading order predictions for generic Feynman integrals is a little more subtle. So I just wanted to mention two strategies where we can try and approach this problem um, in a more general context. So uh, one approach that we've started to look at 
is to expand around kinematic branch points in DIMREG while we keep all the dependence on epsilon exact. So this is um, already something that was looked at by Polkinghorn and Screton all the way back in 1960. And just to connect to uh, Sebastian's talk on Tuesday, it might also be interesting to see if their type of tropical analysis can be used, uh, can be extended to the case of kinematic singularities um, and used to augment this analysis as well. However, let me just highlight that, in fact, although I've seemingly only talked about the class of all mass integrals today, uh, the analysis I presented already goes beyond this because really what matters is that the Landau diagram that's left over once I've set some number of Feynman parameters to zero are all mass Landau diagrams. So that means that if I start with some very complicated Feynman integral and I consider a branch point that's associated with a, um, uh, a Landau diagram that itself is, has totally generic masses, I can use these same types of bounds. So um, with that said, I can conclude. Um, so in this talk, I presented a new method for deriving constraints on where logarithmic and algebraic branch points can appear in the symbols of polylogarithmic Feynman integrals. Now there's a few um, natural extensions of this work that we would be interested in pursuing. So the first I already mentioned on the last slide, which is developing a more general method for um, predicting the leading non-analytic behavior of Feynman integrals near their branch points. Um, it would also be interesting on the side of the symbol level analysis to extend this analysis to the case of elliptic polylogarithms so that we can cover a larger class of Feynman integrals as these types of elliptic polylogarithms are known to already appear, for instance, at two loops. Um, and then it will be very interesting in the future to combine these new constraints that I've described in this talk with the constraints that Hope is going to talk about in the next talk um, in order to try and uh, bootstrap these types of Feynman integrals um, directly, and I think that should be possible in the very near future. So with that, uh, let me thank you for your time, and I'm happy to entertain any questions. Thank you, Andrew, for this great talk. Uh, you finished a little bit ahead of schedule, so we have time for several questions. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot for a great talk. Can I ask you, is it uh, possible to do this analysis also for integrals with Feynman propagators which don't uh, form a diagram? If you start to combine things together, something which is Feynman integral, but it's not a diagram. What do you mean by not a, I, I don't really follow. Not a diagram. Yeah, for example, if you combine ah. For well, example, two diagrams together into one function, and now it's no longer a diagram. Um, well, the bulk of the analysis at the moment is that, that we've done that's new is really just about the symbol and polylogarithms. So if you expect the integral should be expressible in terms of a polylogarithm, we can still use this asymptotic analysis on that side. And the question just becomes, can you predict um, the leading non-analytic behavior of the integral you're looking at? And that's still a little more of a case-by-case -case analysis um, regardless of whether it's a diagram or not, I'd say. Do you require the integrals considered to be pure? Um, oh, good question. Um, I don't think we do. So I should say I do want them to be finite for the analysis I just did. I, I have not done anything with UV or IR, IR divergences. Um, I don't think... I don't think there would be an in principle issue with applying this to non-pure integrals. I haven't given it a huge amount of thought, but at different parts of the analysis, I think you could, uh, you could separate out the different um, contributions a different way be, by being clever. If, for instance, with the functions u that appear out in front. But I, I would have but to think about it a little more. The power so counting analysis would... Pre -factor, it can absorb some power counting. Yeah, the power counting would change a bit, so I'd have to think about it. Thanks. Thanks for the good question, though. In the back. Yeah. Oh. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, yes. Uh, you made the, you made the statement about the general loop diagram. I don't think that's on. Uh, you made some statement about a uh, general loop diagram. I was wondering what the simplest example of a 
Feynman diagram, which is simultaneously has generic masses and is polylogarithmic beyond one loop. I, I didn't quite hear everything. W was it a question about higher loops with generic masses as yeah, a polylogarithm? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so uh, I agree. So in, in that moving in the um, higher loop direction for all mass integrals, I agree they're not going to be polylogarithmic in general. Um, so that's why maybe looking at elliptic symbols would be interesting. Um, however, we can also just try and apply these to more general integrals, like I mentioned, so where you have Feynman integrals that have massless particles, but then when you consider the given Landau di diagram you're interested in, those propagators are contracted because you set the relevant alphas to zero. So I think there we should still be able to make predictions, even um, in the non-generic mass case. Hey, thanks for a nice talk. Perhaps this question is a bit too general, but you, you discuss these algebraic branch points that yeah. come from this A plus square root over A minus square root. But typically, m m many times when we have one of these things in the symbol, the leading singularity of the diagram is also algebraic and has a square root. So there's actually, if you include it back, there's no, uh, there's no algebraic br branch point. Do, do we know examples in amplitudes? What is the simplest example where we see one of these square root type branch points in the actual amplitude? Um, in the prefactor? Oh, sure. That definitely shows up even in the all mass n-gons. So I've chosen the examples here such that I didn't care about it, but we can definitely take those into account. Right. But do you know any amplitude where we actually see a prop, like after you include all the rational prefactors, a square root type, type branch point? Or? Um, I'm, I'm not quite understanding the question, I think. Um, okay, maybe we can discuss it. Yeah, I mean, I would just use a leading singularity type analysis to know exactly what's multiplying it out front and then mm -hmm. split that part of the analysis off. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I see no more questions, so let's thank and Andrew again. Our next speaker is Hoffi Hannan's daughter, and uh, she is going to tell us about co oh, compatibility of Landau singularities. Yeah, thanks. Thanks so much for the introduction. And I want to start with uh, thanking the organizers for putting together this wonderful conference. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, so today I'm happy to tell you about this work in collaboration with Andrew McLeod, Matthew Schwartz, and Christian Virgo, who are all here in the audience. So the outline today is that we're going to start talking about singularities of amplitudes, uh, go on to talk about how we take discontinuities and how to derive formulas for uh, computing discontinuities. And then we're in a good shape to go on to part three, where we derive relations for sequential discontinuities. So let me start with one. So then the motivation uh, is broadly, how can we exploit the analyticity properties of Feynman integrals to our advantage? So of course, there is a long history of this, and the program dates back even to pre-1960s. And as we all know here, there are many modern applications of constraining amplitudes uh, using analyticity. For example, generalized unitarity, perturbative and non-perturbative bootstrap, dispersion relations, on-shell recursion relations, et cetera. Uh, as many people in the audience have worked on and we've heard about already. But let me start with a very simple example of a, a non-trivial analytic structure. So we'll talk about the triangle Feynman integral in four dimensions with massless internal particles. So up to some prefactor, this integral is given by the expression written on the top line. Maybe I can have, yeah, the pointer. Uh, where the z and z bar variables are given in terms of the Mantle stem as written below. And what we can note about this example is that the dialogarithm has a branch cut starting at z equals 1 with a discontinuity given by 2 pi i times the log of z. But then the logarithm itself has a branch cut for z less than 0 with a discontinuity of 2 pi i. So what I wanted to highlight here is that uh, the dialogarithm, if we uh, look at the point zero and try to analytically continue around zero, there is nothing funny going on. But after taking one discontinuity, we discover a new branch point at z equals zero. So this illustrates that there is really structure in new branch points when we take sequential discontinuities. And let me mention one more thing here. 
um, what we want to do here is that we want to take the discontinuity as the monodromy around the branch point. So that's why we end up with an analytic function on the right-hand side here. So I'm going to use the words discontinuity and monodromy entirely interchangeably in this talk. And as we heard about uh, from Andrew McLeod in the previous talk and from the talks yesterday, the symbol is really the structure that makes the se sequential discontinuity structure manifest. So for example, the dialogarithm, the symbol of the dialogarithm is minus one minus e times z, which precisely exhibits this discontinuity uh, around z equals one followed by a discontinuity around z equals zero. So here we're investigating constraints on consecutive symbol entries by investigating constraints on sequential discontinuities. So why do we want to look into these constraints on the discontinuities? So the broad goal is to learn about the analytic structure of uh, amplitudes and perturbation theory from the location and types of singularities as Andrew McLeod talked about. So for example, whether they're logarithmic and square root and where they appear in the symbol. So this constrains symbol entries uh, we also want to study sequential discontinuities around branch points, which constrains consecutive symbol entries. And then, as we'll see in this talk, um, we'll also get additional constraints in physical regions, which basically fixes constant factors between different terms in the amplitude. So in this talk, I'm f I'll focus on points two and three. So how do we find branch points? I'll be very uh, quick on this, since we've seen it a few times this week already. So let's start with an amplitude um, where I set the numerator to one for simplicity. So I will work with Feynman integrals in this talk. I'll use K for loop momenta and Q for internal momenta and little m for internal masses. The reason why I said n to one is that we could include some non-trivial spin structure, but they will only make the kinematic singularities better. So it doesn't hurt us to just take n to one. Uh, so the saddle point analysis of this integral showed that we can have branch points when alpha times q squared minus m squared is zero and the sum over alpha times q equals zero around a loop. So the solutions to the Landau equations give us co-dimension one or greater constraints on the external kinematics, which we can contrast with UV and IR singularities that occur for any kinematics. So I'll also talk a lot about Landau diagrams, which are sub-diagrams of the original diagrams where we put all lines on shell. So for example, if we take the Feynman integral for the box, which is the blue one here, then we get some Landau curves from the solutions to the Landau equations where all the blue lines are on shell. So these are uh, plotted here in this plot in S and T. Uh, but we also have singularities, for example, at the normal thresholds of the bubbles and the pseudonormal thresholds of the bubbles, which are here for equal masses at s equals 4m squared and t equals 4m squared, plotted in red. Um, the singularities on the physical sheet are special. Th those are only for solutions with alpha greater than or equal to zero, so that will be important for us later. And here, this is more or less true by the definition of the physical sheet, because I'm defining the physical sheet as the one where we don't have to deform our integration contour in alpha. I'll also talk about pseudo thresholds, which are solutions where at least one alpha in the Landau solution is not uh, positive or zero, so it can be either negative or complex. There is a nice reinterpretation of the Landau equations, uh, which is as follows, that branch points occur when the projection map from internal plus external variable space to external variable space drops rank. So the way to view this pictorially is that we have some external variable space here in blue, and then we have the on-shell constraints in red and sea green. And when these two become tangent, that's where we get a singularity down here in the projection down to external variable space. Uh, so as a glimpse of the results, before we go into the technical part of the talk, uh, just to give you a flavor of what kind of constraints we're gonna be exploring, we're gonna start with some Feynman integrals. So say, for example, this Feynman integral of the box. And we'll get two types of constraints. The first one are non-hierarchical singularity constraints, or Steinman type. So what we're gonna constrain here are discontinuities corresponding to Landau diagrams where one is not obtained by the other by shrinking some edges. So an example of this are, for example, the S and T bubble over here. While the other class of constraints that we're gonna get are hierarchical singularities, which are, for example, the bubble followed by the triangle, 
And these, uh, in the Simon case, will predict when some things are zero. Uh, and in the physical region, for hierarchical singularities, we'll get relations like this one here. Uh, so many of these constraints were worked out already in the 60s by Lance of Femme and Stepp. Uh, they were inspired by uh, non-perturbative S-matrix theory, but we're gonna try to work this out in perturbation theory. And just to establish more notation, uh, I'm gonna note, denote Feynman integrals with I, uh, diagrams with G, and Landau varieties with L. Let me also highlight the difference between different types of discontinuity constraints. So one thing we could do is that we could look at, for example, the amplitude in the complex S-plane, where S is, say, uh, our incoming momentum squared, and there we can have branch cuts, for example, on the real axis, as we saw this morning in Sasha's talk, starting at 4m squared, then we have another branch point at 16m squared, and all of these branch cuts are on top of each other. So there, what we're computing is the total discontinuity across this branch cut, or the imaginary part of the amplitude. Uh, a couple of years ago, we worked out constraints from time order perturbation theory. So what we did there was that we related contours in time order perturbation theory to contours in external variable space that I'm denoting here with uh, P, and this is a very abstract picture, but what it's supposed to illustrate is that in time order perturbation theory, you don't have a handle on which branch point you're encircling, so you might, with your contour, encircle many branch points at the same time. While in this talk, I'm gonna be focusing on encircling one branch point at a time. So we'll need, as uh, Andrew McLeod talked about, we'll need sufficiently generic masses to be able to separate out the different branch cuts, although I'll also go on to talk about what happens if you don't have these generic masses and how we wanna take this, these methods forward. So that concludes the first part of where we wanted to find singularities of amplitudes. So let me go on to talk about how to find discontinuities. So let me start again with a very simple example. Let me start with the bubble example in two dimensions. So in Schrodinger parameters, this is an easy integral to write down and to compute. And in d equals two, it evaluates to this logarithm over the leading singularity square root over here. So how do we compute discontinuities around branch points? So for example, the discontinuity around the normal and pseudonormal thresholds in S equals M1 plus or minus M2 squared. So we can do three things. We can either start with a full expression and just brute force it, just analytically continue S around these two thresholds in this full expression. However, that's of course uh, not what we want to do because if we knew the full expression already, then we wouldn't have any problems. We could use the integral representation, which I'll show on the next few slides, but then there is actually a shortcut to that method number two, which is to use the picard lifshitz theorem, which is also the one that will generalize more, most easily to sequential discontinuities. So let's start with the method of using the integral representation. We start by writing down this integral, and it's easiest to do it in Schrodinger parameter space to begin with, although I'll show you how it works out in Lupamenta space in a minute. And the reason for that is simply that we just have one parameter, so we can draw everything in the complex plane. But unfortunately, we cannot draw in four dimensions, would, which would be needed in momentum space when we have two propagators. So let's draw what happens both in the complex space of S and in the complex space of uh, alpha. So what happens, we push the singularities off the integration contours with our plus and minus i epsilons here. So if we start cranking up S, what happens, these two roots, they, as we approach the pseudonormal threshold at m1 minus m2 squared, these two roots will in principle collide. However, it's far away from the integration contour which runs from zero to one and is marked by this h over here. But if we keep analytically continuing s and get close to the normal threshold, then the two roots will meet again and now they would pinch the contour. So this is why the uh, normal threshold is a singularity of our Feynman integral while the pseudonormal threshold is not. Let's try a different analytic continuation where we analytically continue S in a circle around the normal threshold and see which discontinuity we pick up by doing that. So what happens to the two roots is that the blue one starts over here, the red one starts over here, and then they go in a circle and right when we cross this branch cut way at the end of the analytic continuation, 
we'll see that to get back to the point that we started at, we have to start deforming the integration contour H to this new H prime so that we don't hit the singularity. But note also in this example that the roots here, when we take a circle around the normal threshold, they're actually never close to pinching the contour actually. But we still need to deform it in the end. So this gives a nice introduction to the Pigor Lipschitz theorem because now we can use the Pigor Lipschitz theorem as a shortcut to do the computation that we just did by tracing the roots. Instead, what we can do is that we can compute the variation of the contour as the difference between the new contour and the old contour. And what we're supposed to do, according to the theorem, is that we're supposed to look at the segment between the two roots, uh, which we call the vanishing cell. Then we're suppo supposed to be find the boundary of the vanishing cell, which are the two blue points here, the boundaries of this line segment. And then we have to go to one higher dimension and take the co-boundary of the boundary of the vanishing cell. And that's our new integration contour. So this is a shortcut to computing the monodromy. And this is a slide for the experts. If you haven't seen this before, don't worry, we're not gonna need these, this technical part. Uh, the important part is that we can generalize this, of course, to higher dimensions and more propagators. So the discontinuity around the Landau branch point that corresponds to the on-shell surfaces S1 through SM, where uh, each S here is given by the equations Q squared minus M squared, it's given by this formula here. So the variation has a prefactor uh, that's either plus or minus one. And then we have the integer valued intersection number between the contour and the vanishing cell. And then we have a new integration contour, which is as I showed you on the previous slide, it's the co-boundary of the boundary of the vanishing cell. And I should also note that what's, uh, we've kind of shifted the challenge to computing this intersection number here between the vanishing cell and the contour. And what's gonna be important for us is to show that this intersection number is in some cases zero or one. So let's go back to momentum space. Uh, near the normal threshold, we have these two on-shell surfaces. So now we're plotting the momentum space of the bubble in two dimensions. So we have K0 and K1. And the two on-shell surfaces are simply given by the two on-shell equations. And another thing to note here is that we, instead of using the plus or minus i epsilons, there are no plus or minus i epsilons here, we've instead deformed our contour. So the little arrows here on the singular surfaces represent the imaginary part of the contour. So again, we can draw this in four dimensions, but imagine that the, um, if we could, then these arrows here would represent precisely the imaginary part of the contour. So near the normal threshold, we have this bounded vanishing cell here. And if we go down to the normal threshold here, I'm taking the masses to be one and three, so the normal threshold is at S equals 16. There is a pinching of the contour at the normal threshold, S1 and S2 are tangent, but you see that we can't choose this imaginary part consistently with the I epsilon prescription. And another way to see this is to look at the vanishing cell and look at this vector field, the imaginary part of the vector field, and there has to be a sink inside the vanishing cell where the vector field vanishes, and this is precisely uh, the intersection between the vanishing cell and the integration contour. So here we see that the intersection number is plus or minus one, depending on our sign convention, but there is really one sink inside the cell. We can keep going, and we can keep going down to the pseudonormal threshold. So here there is also a pinching of the contour, but Sorry, there's still a vanishing cell between these two, but there is no pinching of the contour in this case. So the vanishing cell exists, but the contour is not pinched. So this leads us naturally to Kutkowski's formula. So if we apply the pigor lifshitz theorem to a Feynman integral, that gives us a Kutkowski's formula for encircling individual branch points. So this is different from Kutkowski's formula where we compute the imaginary part where we sum over all cuts of the diagram. Here we're encircling one branch point at the time. So if we encircle the Landau variety L, what we have to do is that we have to use this new integration contour, which is a co-boundary of the boundary of the vanishing cell. And in the physical region, we can write this out in terms of delta functions as we're used to. And you might also be used to seeing some theta functions in this expression on the right-hand side. And those theta functions are hidden inside this U 
because the theta functions tell us that we, only, we should only care about the co-boundary of the boundary of the vanishing cell corresponding to the normal threshold. So this one that I drew earlier and not the, not the other one. So what do we learn? We've learned that the picard lifshitz theorem uh, is what's natural to use to prove Kutkowski's formula, and we now have the tools to generalize to sequential discontinuities. So that brings me to the third part. So let's first discuss where are the singularities of discontinuities. Note that in the, when computing the monodromy, we got some delta functions on the right-hand side, so we're actually localizing uh, on the on-shell surfaces, so we have to be consistent with that, and uh, new singularities can therefore only appear in larger Landau diagrams. So for example, if we take the diagram with the Feynman integral of the ice cream cone, and then we take the discontinuity across the bubble threshold, then the discontinuity, we would expect that to have a singularity at the ice cream cone singularity or at itself. However, when the Landau curves correspond to non-hierarchical diagrams, for example, the sunrise and the bubble, we can work out that the Landau curves intersect transversally, as shown in this figure here, where this is, could be the Landau curve for the sunrise and this could be the Landau curve for the bubble. Uh, it's a property of this uh, space that the paths commute, so this would probably be obvious, again, if we could draw it in four dimensions, if we had two more complex dimensions to draw. But basically, the way we can imagine this is that we can more or less just slide this, these sea green contours through without the other variety um, interrupting it. So the sequential discontinuities in physical region is given by iteratively applying picker lifshitz and it's given by cutting or all particles, as shown here. So in the physical regions, what we get is that we get the intersection number between the vanishing cell and the new integration contours, which we can write out as these delta functions. But as a corollary, if the Landau equations give incompatible conditions on the loop momenta, then the sequential discontinuity has to vanish. And I've written out some technical points here that go into the rigorous proof of this formula. So we have to assume that there is no on-shell loop with all alpha equals to zero, so we can contract a loop, but it cannot be on-shell with all alpha equal to zero. We have to assume isolated Landau curves, as I talked about in the beginning, and we're working in integer dimensions, so we have to assume UV and I are finiteness. So a picture that illustrates this is basically that whenever the varieties intersect in the external variable space, so for example, S and T here, but they don't intersect in the bigger space of S, T, and the loop momenta, and this is very schematic, these should of course be of higher dimensions, that the sequential discontinuity is zero. So for a generic mass configuration, a Landau diagram must factorize to have a non-zero sequential discontinuity. So for example, an allowed singularity would be the double triangle singularity of the double box. So let me emphasize that the Landau diagram has to factorize. It does not mean that the diagram itself has to factorize. And we can represent this diagrammatically uh, by what we call fan diagrams, where we put the original diagram here in the middle, the Landau diagrams for the two singularities in these two places here, and then all of these should form uh, short exact sequences, and moreover, we can check using this diagram that the kernels of these two contractions have to be the same. Um, if they're not the same, that means that for generic masses, the sequential discontinuity will vanish. So this very naturally, as a corollary of this, are the Steimer relations, which say that there are no sing sequential singularities and partially overlapping channels in the physical region. And we've already heard about applications of this in the talks yesterday. So here, for example, the amplitude cannot have a term uh, of the form log s minus 4m squared times log t minus 4m squared. However, the same proof shows that we cannot have sequential discontinuities in channels with incompatible kernels in the physical region. So for example, here, the amplitude uh, cannot have a term of the form log p1 squared minus 4m squared times log p3 squared minus 4m squared. And we can again draw these diagrams, and now we see that the kernels up here, the red ones, uh, don't match. So again, for a generic mass configurations, uh, these sequential discontinuities will vanish. However, what happens is the ma if the masses are not generic, if we go to some special mass configuration in which 
these two loop momenta that uh, the Landau equations give are really just the same. So we can work this out, we can impose this, for example, on the box diagram, and we can find configurations like this one here. Uh, if we force the Landau equations to be compatible, then we indeed expected to have sequential monodromies. And what was interesting to me about this example is that here we can access this with positive S and positive T in Lorentzian kinematics, but you can see that in the center of mass frame of the incoming particle, all of these vertices are allowed. And what happens is that the bubble triangle and box branch points collide in physical kinematics for this case. And I should emphasize that this uh, also includes the masses case. So it's not surprising, for example, that the uh, box with all masses particles has a sequential discontinuity in S and T. We can find more examples. Uh, for example, in 2,2 signature, when the quarter mass is equal to twice the internal mass squared, we can look at the full expression and see that the symbol factorizes in this case, and this factorization seems to be characteristic of allowed sequential discontinuities. So it would be interesting to explore these special kinematic points and see what it implies. Um, the other type of constraints are in the hierarchical case. So this would be diagrams like, for example, the ice cream cone, and the sunrise, where the ice cream, where the sunrise is obtained by shrinking an edge of the ice cream cone. So in this case, we can work out that the curves intersect tangentially and not transversely as before. So there is a more interesting relation between the paths in this case. And the, because of this relation, the sequential discontinuities in physical regions obeys this um, constraint here. And the way to explain that is that they meet at this point where the alphas are zero for the edges that we shrink. So if they're all positive on the left-hand side here, then the, one, the branch for the bigger diagram has at least one alpha, which is uh, negative if we're working in every, where everything is real. Let me just mention in continuation of what Andrew said that this is precisely the structure that we see in the symbol of the all-mass n gone in n dimensions, where we know the answer. So we see precisely the logarithmic and square root branch points, including the one in the prefactor here. And moreover, in Lorentzian signature, there is this formula from uh, Almodo's paper. I'm not sure why the reference vanished, but anyway, um, this is from Almodo's paper from 1977 where he works out basically the tail terms of the symbol um, uh, with some factors between them which match the expectation from the sequential discontinuity analysis. Furthermore, we can compute the cuts of the one loop n-gong, uh, which is the same formula as in this paper. And we can again see that it matches the expectation with Kutkowski. So that brings me to my conclusions. We've explored two types of constraints on sequential discontinuities of massive amplitudes. The non-hierarchical or Steinman type, uh, which constrains something like an S-bubble followed by a T-bubble. And the hierarchical constraints, which uh, constrains something like the bubble singularity, the bubble discontinuity of the box integral followed by the triangle discontinuity is the same as the triangle discontinuity. Then we also explored some special mass configurations where sequential discontinuities may become allowed. And I think it would be really interesting to take this idea further, especially, uh, for example, in uh, theories with masses particles, n equals four, et cetera, where we have some uh, additional symmetries and look at whether we can derive some constraints in those cases using the same methods. But with that, let me thank you so much for coming. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you, Hoffi, for your talk. Uh, we have time for questions. Um, so, perhaps I didn't understand this point you made about the masses having to be sufficiently separate or different. Mm -hmm. So, would this analysis still hold, say, on a one mass box where you've only got one mass and the rest are all massless? No, so what needs to happen, let's go back to that slide, maybe. Here? Yes. 
Um, so if we are to use, for example, Kutkowski's formula to isolate different branch points, then for the one mass box, we would have a discontinuity in S equals zero and T equals zero, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, we would also, wait, let me think. Oh yeah, so I guess in the problem in that case would just be the masslessness, which would correspond to basically the Lano equations having um, not, uh, we would have an extra parameters in our solution for alpha in that case. So that's why we have to focus on massive internal particles. But what I also wanted to illustrate with this figure was basically the difference between, for example, this uh, branch cut starting at four M squared and this branch cut starting at 16 M squared, which overlap because we've, because we've projected to the uh, complex S plane. Um, yeah, so the important part is to have all the branch cuts separated. In addition, we have to figure out how to better derive this for massless particles, where we have this extra parameter that we first need to integrate out before applying the picard lipschitz theorem. Thank you. So that's work in progress. Thanks for the question. Uh, other questions? Uh, you mentioned in the, at the very end that you were considering looking at it at in n equals four. Yeah. Uh, what kind of simplifications would you expect to find uh, in the FOIA method? Yeah, I think what would be interesting in that case is basically to um, work out, for example, what the Lano equations look like in that case. And as shown in some papers by Spradlin et al. a few years ago, like we expect some simplifications uh, in n equals four. And for me, it would be interesting to explore whether we can put similar constraints on basically, as uh, Andrew was talking about, when we have Steinman versus extended Steinman, whether we can understand that from this point of view of the loop momenta being incompatible. Um, so basically, this figure here, if we, if we can figure out that in, in some theories that we still have the separation in loop momenta space, then the sequential discontinuity would still vanish. Thank you. Uh, other questions? Oh, I don't see other questions, so let us thank Hoffi again. Thanks. The last talk of this session will be by Andre Pokraka, and uh, he is going to tell us about the duals of Feynman integrals. Okay. Um, thank you for the introduction, and I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this uh, wonderful conference. It's a real pleasure to be here in person with all of you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to uh, present some work that I put out last year with my uh, supervisor, uh, Simone. Um, so I'll start with some background. Um, essentially what the problem I'm considering is, namely integral reduction, give some, um, uh, a quick review of how we usually do this, and then introduce uh, some of the new technology that I want to talk about, namely intersection theory, relative twisted cohomology, and then define what I mean by uh, dual forms. Uh, I'll then present the, sort of the workflow we, we have to compute loop amplitudes, um, and if I have time, I'll elaborate on a few key steps, and uh, maybe say some words about uh, where we are in the development phase of this uh, new technology, and what kind of roadblocks we're uh, facing, and then I'll just conclude in, with some future directions. Okay, so when we compute scattering amplitudes, um, at some point we're gonna have to compute an integral, some, some L loop Feynman integral. These are easy enough to define, you know, it's some L fold integral over a rational function, of both loop and uh, external momenta. Um, so these functions, they have these uh, uh, universal denominators from the propagators, um, and, and these actually give the Feynman integrals uh, most of their structure. But we also have the option of having some theory-dependent numerator. Uh, in general, this thing can be quite messy, so Feynman integrals already are probably the most challenging part of computing the amplitude itself, and if, you know, this numerator is, is not one, then it gets even harder. So it's very important that we have methods for uh, minimizing the number of integrations that one has to perform. 
And thankfully, there are relations, linear relations among Feynman integrals, which allows us to take any Feynman integral and uh, re-express it as a linear combination of some minimal basis. So at one loop, it looks something like this. Uh, I've given some random one loop Feynman integral, and I want to write it in terms of a tadpole, bubble, triangle, box, and uh, pentagon. And our task in integral deduction is really, it just, it just says simply, you know, compute these coefficients. And, and how do we do that? So um, the two main ways is generalized unitarity and integration by parts. So the idea behind generalized unitarity, as you're all probably familiar, is that we construct, we construct um, solve for these Cs by constructing a large, um, okay, sorry, by taking discontinuities of the Feynman diagram. Uh, so we wanna take um, all different um, sets of cuts that we possibly can, build up this linear system, and solve for the, solve for the Cs. And when we cut, we actually factorize the amplitude or, or Feynman integral into simpler pieces. So in the end, these coefficients end up being built out of these factorized amplitudes. And this is why generalized unitarity is so appealing. We're, we're taking uh, more complicated loop observables, um, amplitudes, and constructing them out of uh, simpler uh, tree level uh, amplitudes. So for example, the simplest case is the box coefficient in four dimensions. Um, it's simply given by the quad cut of whatever integral you have here, and that factorizes into a product of four uh, tree-level amplitudes. Um, so generalized unitarity also highlights the important fact that uh, the analytic structure of a Feynman integral is, is determined by its cuts, or largely determined by its cuts. And however, as great as generalized unitarity is, um, formulas for subtopologies such as the, the tadpole are quite challenging to, to find. You have to solve some very large linear system. And this whole procedure gets much harder when we're not an integer dimension. Uh, the second method is just use, goes by uh, integration by parts, and it's a simple consequence of the fact that a total derivative vanishes in dimensional regularization. So just put an example here. If you expand out this derivative, you get this relation among Feynman integrals. And what I don't like about integration by parts is it's a black box. We have efficient, a tech, uh, efficient code to, to perform these, these kind of computations, but it doesn't really give you a good understanding for why or how or when uh, simplifications or cancellations happen. And it also uh, often, you, you get these squared propagators at intermediate steps, uh, which are unphysical, uh, so you have to either introduce additional formalism, uh, like the IBP vectors of Kosthauer, or do additional rounds of integration by parts. And it doesn't, uh, utilize the, the, uh, the cuts of generalized unitarity without also introducing more formalism. So given these uh, complaints, we're motivated to um, search for alternative ways of computing these uh, coefficients, and one way is given by intersection theory, and this allows us to directly extract these Cs without using uh, integration by parts identities or solving a linear system. And the starting point here is uh, the same as for integration by parts. Uh, we just need to realize that the Feynman integrals are um, not, they're not unique. You can shift them by a total derivative or an IVP. And this really tells us we should be looking at uh, cohomology classes. We should be looking at the cohomology class of Feynman integrals modulo all integration by parts identities. And as soon as we start talking about cohomology, we kind of get for free a dual cohomology. That's Poincaré dual to it. And we can take these two spaces, the dual and the non-dual, and pair them in an inner product called the intersection number. And this gives rise to this nice quantum mechanics-like uh, um, formula here, where if I have any uh, Feynman integrand capital Phi, it's written as some uh, linear combination of our basis uh, integrands small Phi, where the coefficients are given by this uh, intersection number. And moreover, this intersection number is an algebraic operation um, it's simply just a sequence of residues. So this echoes uh, what we liked about generalized unitarity in the first place. Okay, but to uh, continue, I need to uh, explain a little bit how we think about Feynman integrals uh, in the language of intersection theory and differential forms. So uh, a generic Feynman integral will be a, uh, the integral of a product of a multi-valued function u and some single-valued differential form. Uh, this multi-valued function just comes from the fact that we have a, a, a d-dimensional measure. So we take ddl, we break it into some four-dimensional uh, 
uh, physical space, there's a d4l, and we do the angular integration in the, in the perpendicular space, and we're left with a dl perp squared, and also this, this multi-valued function, l perp squared to the minus epsilon. So then a um, generic Feynman integral, grand, uh, has the structure, it's some, some u times this, this uh, phi form phi, and this phi form can have uh, singularities at l perp squared goes to zero or infinity. However, these singularities are, are uh, well understood and they're in some sense regulated by this function u. So we already know how to deal with these from uh, previous explorations in intersection theory. Uh, the new thing is that we have these propagators here which, uh, which, are not, which are unregulated. So what we used to do is we used to add uh, factors of these propagators into here and turn all the, the poles into branch cuts and then proceed uh, using the mathematical theorems. But here we don't want to do that and we want to really ask what is the real object for the un... Whoopsies. How do we deal with these, uh, these, these um, unregulated poles directly? So what we want to do is, com is compute these coefficients and we want to um, build a, a integral pairing between a, uh, a Feynman integrand and something that, that, that extracts these coefficients. And we can actually just read off, after lots of hindsight, what the object, what the pro appropriate dual form should be, just by staring at this, 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 the definition of this integral pairing. Um, this, 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 uh, this C needs to be both single-valued and finite. Single-valuedness forces the, uh, this U dual to be the inverse of that U. And then being finite requires that this, this uh, dual form, it needs to vanish at all the singularities of, of our Feynman integral. So on, on one side, we have Feynman integrals. They have poles at the uh, propagator poles. On the other side, we have the space of dual forms, and these have boundaries or zeros at the, at the on-shell condition. And they actually have to have a more extreme zero than just uh, a regular zero. They have to be compactly supported, which means they're zero in a neighborhood around the, uh, the, the on-shell condition. And what this tells us is that the dual cohomology is actually spanned by holomorphic forms times either uh, theta functions or d theta functions. In particular, note that a, a d theta is essentially a delta function supported on a little contour around this on-shell condition. And this is where we're gonna see the, uh, the, the connection to generalized unitarity. And so for every propagator, uh, our dual forms need to have a theta or a, a d theta. So uh, a generic element of this uh, space at one loop looks something like this. We could start off with a phi form on a zero cut, so some form in the bulk, but this space is trivial, so there's nothing there. The next thing we could have is a four form on a codimension one boundary or on a one cut, all the way down to a, um, a zero form on a five cut or, the, or this maximal boundary. And by realizing that, that this, this compact support about the propagators helps simplify and streamline the calculation of the intersection number. So uh, as an example, if we look at this uh, box coefficient here, we have any one loop amplitude here, and we have the, the, the dual box form. And it's uh, localized via these d, four d thetas to this quad cut. We can move these, this, this, these four d thetas over to the right-hand side here, and they more or less take a residue of this thing here, which factorizes. But, uh, but since uh, um, there were, these things are five forms, there's still one, one variable left over. And so there's still an intersection calculation to do here, and this leftover thing, um, we, we have to apply what's called the CMAP. We just have to make sure that it's also compact support at all the branch points. And there's an algorithmic way to do that. Um, and then the intersection number will localize on those branch points, and we end up with some rational function of the Mandelstam's and epsilon. Okay, so here's the sort of big picture. Um, so we want to advocate that you don't need to think about the basis of Feynman integrals at all. This is more or less implicit. You should uh, choose some canonical, if you can, a dual basis. And if it's not canonical, you know, go back and make a better choice. Um, and then we use a dual integration by parts 
identities to drive a differential equation for the dual, uh, for the dual forms. And then um, because by requiring the intersection matrix between uh, some basis of Feynman integrals and the dual forms to be identity, um, that guarantees that this, um, that the minus transpose of this dual differential equation is the differential equation for whatever this implicit basis of Feynman integrals is. So we don't never actually have to know what that basis is, we just find out the differential equation for the duals, take the minus transpose, in integrate, and we get expressions for the Feynman integrals. Uh, on the other side, we have to make sure that everything has the correct compact support. So we have to go through this compactifying step, and then we can pair that with any uh, general, any uh, amplitude or Feynman integral to extract generalized unitarity coefficients. And then we can take the integrals that we get from this differential equation with these uh, GU coefficients to construct loop amplitudes. Okay, so just a quick word on why the dual differential equations are, uh, tra uh, are transposed. So normally, uh, the derivative of the most complicated topology will include the, the not, uh, topologies with less propagators. Uh, however, on the dual side, it's the opposite. The, most complicated to, the, most, the simplest topology talks to the most complicated. And this is because we have this compact support condition. So, there's all, so if I have a differential form on this two boundary, there's a little theta here for the, for, for the third boundary. So when I do an integration by parts identity, the derivative will necessarily hit this theta and I'll have some component on, on, on this triangle boundary. Um, and while I said I don't like integration by parts identities, uh, we still use them on this dual side. Um, they are at least um, conceptually simpler in the sense that they are only supported on cuts and you can never square a propagator just because propagators don't exist in this, in this, um, in this language. Um, and so in our first paper, we uh, found a canonical basis of differential equations uh, sorry, canonical basis of dual forms at one loop and computed their differential equations uh, in any dimension. Okay, so the second important step in this workflow is this compactifying step. And, uh, right, so, so I've already told you that it's very important that this thing has uh, compact support in order for this intersection number to make sense. Uh, compact support also tells us that this intersection number is not going to be some horrible, nasty integral that we have to actually perform. It's going to localize and just be some simple uh, sequence of residues. So if we are given some uh, form, phi dual, that has some partial compact support, we can always find a cohomologous form that has the right compact support by, uh, uh, you know, cleverly subtracting local primitives. And, and so, so, so we, we, we basically force this form to, to have compact support by putting some theta functions in there. And, and then for this thing to close, to be a closed differential form, we're, we're forced to have these d thetas with some primitives there. Okay? And these primitives, uh, we can just integrate locally as a Laurent series near these singular points. So, so they're also quite, quite simple to co compute. And this whole compactifying step is, is more or less trivial for one forms, but it can get quite challenging once we, uh, once we go to uh, higher degree forms. And there's two main methods uh, for, for, for doing this procedure. Uh, one is uh, vibration, where this one's great because we get to reuse the simplicity of the one form C map. Uh, it's, it's sort of a mixed bag. It's not that hard. It doesn't introduce too much complication, but we do get uh, a vector and matrix value problems out to, uh, once we start fibering. Um, and what's really annoying, though, is we have to construct the compact support forms for an entire basis all at once. We can't do it individually when, when we're talking this language. Also, if our Feynman integral starts with a singularity at infinity, um, after we sort of after we integrate over each fiber, that singularity gets worse and worse and worse as we go down in this, in this vibration. So that means I have to compute these primitives to higher and higher and higher order, which is, which is quite annoying. And uh, this algorithm is actually uh, very sensitive to choice. Um, the, the end result does not depend on any choice, but in these middle intermediate steps, you have to make choices and, and, and it can be quite sensitive to that. Uh, the second way is, is more common to torque. Uh, the good thing about this is we can construct the compact support for a form, one form just by itself, not the entire basis. Um, the, the downside is that we need to know primitives for every single way of approaching a singularity. 
then we need to know primitives for those primitives and primitives for those primitives until we run out of variables. So, so you need to compute quite, quite a lot of things. There's a lot of common torques. Um, and uh, it's, so far, we found it's quite efficient when we have two forms. But beyond that, it, it gets quite difficult. Um, and again, this one is also, you have to make choices at some point in this algorithm. So there are you know, choices that can make your life very hard or very simple. OK. So putting everything together, we can actually compute uh, loop amplitudes. Uh, so in our second paper, we computed both the four and five point gluon amplitudes. Uh, we did this by constructing the, di the dual differential equation, taking the minus transpose and integrating. That's how we got all of these integrals here. And then we computed these coefficients just by using this intersection number where um, you know, we had some dual form, which is localized to a generalized unitarity cut, which takes a residue over here. Um, and then we can just compute this factorized thing by gluing cuts, and then continue with this uh, whatever's leftover piece here. Um, so this was mostly a proof of concept in the sense that these four and five point results have been known since the uh, 90s. Uh, something new that came out of this computation was that we actually know these generalized unitarity coefficients for the five point amplitude to all orders in epsilon. Though it's a gigantic mess and, and I don't know what it's useful for, but if you do, that'd be great. Um, <laughs> uh, so the more interesting thing that we did, I think, is uh, trying to do a systematic study of the four-dimensional limit and trying to obtain rational terms. And we did this in you know, just a very simple way. We expanded this, 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 these, these coefficients in terms of a Laurent series in, in epsilon. And then we wanted to look at which residues um, in the intersection number pull out you know, just the rational term or just the, just the, the most divergent term. So we'd like to, um, so, so what we did is we compute, uh, oh, uh, shoot, yes. So, and, and in particular, notice that um, for these most singular terms and, and the rational term, um, we, we really, we only need to study the bubble coefficient. We don't need the box. So we compute this, uh, this bubble coefficient by using the combinatoric C map and constructing this triple primitive for the bubble dual form. So this, this coefficient is then given by this sequence of three residues on this primitive multiplying the S channel residue of, of our uh, Feynman integral. And depending on which term order in epsilon we want to extract, we just have to take the right residues in this uh, chart here. Uh, so for example, the most singular term is given by uh, the residue when L perp squared goes to zero, so that's the four dimensional limit. And also when uh, in, 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 the, in the, uh, the soft limit of the triangle cut. So that one makes sense. And the, the, uh, the rational term though, it, it, uh, we, we need to include um, contributions both from the four dimensional limit at L perp squared goes to zero and L perp squared goes to infinity. Um, yeah, and all the other variables are, are, are going to infinity in this case. Um, and, and so this works, we get the right coefficients, but, but there's something strange about it in the sense that, uh, you know, back in 2008, Badger was also able to get the uh, rational coefficients for one loop amplitudes, and he only needed to take residues at L perp squared goes to infinity. So we believe that this is a artifact of just maybe some bad choices in, 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 in our intermediate steps, because we can always just sort of, uh, in these intersection formulas here, we can always push things around between different residues that, 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 that may cancel in the sum. Okay, so uh, let me conclude. Uh, what we've done is uh, recover generalized unitarity in arbitrary dimensions from twisted relative cohomology. Uh, our, we, we, we looked up, we, we kind of just did a one loop warm, warm up. We obtained a one loop basis of canonical dual forms, obtained a differential equation for this basis in any dimension, and uh, constructed the one loop and uh, four point and five point gluon amplitudes uh, from their cuts and obtained their coefficients to all orders in epsilon. And then we examined the four dimensional limit and extracted the rational term from epsilon over epsilon type cancellations. So the, the next goal is really uh, cranking up the loops, going to two loops. Uh, we've already started this using a loop-by-loop -loop approach. 
and we've, we we were able to compute the uh, um, tulip differential equation for the 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 uh, three mass sunrise, and we've got it in epsilon form. And Mathieu had a a nice poster about this, so if you're interested, come corner either one of us. Um, but the <laughs> The intersection number is still quite difficult to compute, and I think some, you know, there's some clever thought needs to be put in into how to improve the efficiency of this C map. Uh, you know, what are the good choices? How do we make our life simple? And and then I would like it'd be great to look at the uh, two-loop rational terms. Uh, thank you, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Andre. Uh, do we have any questions? Uh um, hi, thanks for the nice talk, Andre. So, um, as you've been able to use your methods to compute the, the, the coefficients for um, one loop, four, and five point gluon amplitudes, I wanted to ask if uh, your approaches give any insight into the analytic structure of these coefficients. Um, that is a good question. I'm not sure if I have a good answer off the top of my head. I mean, our approach definitely helps tell you why some integration by parts identity should relate other integrals to, 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 to each other, but that, I think, I mean, that, do, that has to do with the singularity structure of the loop momentum, not, not the external kinematics, which you just see in the, in the, in the, in, in the actual coefficient. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not sure if I can give you a great answer. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Is it still too early for you to have generated a com analytic computational program to implement the workflow diagram that you put up or uh, with all these choices implemented? or is that too far in the future? Um, okay, so, so I heard only partial of, of, of your question. So, so you're wanting to know if uh, something about the workflow being uh, like maybe automatized on the computer or something? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, all these calculations I did, on, did, on my, did in Mathematica. Um, so they're not hard to, they're not hard to set up. Um, so I mean, what, what, what in what, what particular aspect are you, are, you, are you interested in? You said there's a lot of choices involved in this. You have to change the mathematics every time. Right, so yeah, there, there's, there's choices involved in like, if I choose to do uh, fiber over one variable in first instead of the other, um, intermediate steps might say my cohomology is, is, is three-dimensional and then one-dimensional, but if I did it the other way around, it'd be one-dimensional, then one-dimensional. So, um, yeah, there's, uh, as far as we know, there's no way around, uh, around this. But, I mean, yeah, so, you, yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that answers. <laughs> uh, I see no more questions, so let's thank Andrew again. <laughs>
kind of keep it at constant distance, <laughs> roughly. Yeah, no, can that's be also a here, but some people are kind of attached to this, no? Hey, <laughs> that's a, it's a bit of a problem, exactly. I think. Uh, <laughs> how are you? How are things? Yeah, yeah, can't complain. Can't complain. Yourself? Yeah, fine. Yeah. I mean, do you feel some some sort of existential freedom now that Sajak is over? Do you no longer have to? Uh, Sorry. <laughs> no, actually. Yeah. It was absolutely fine. I was disturbed by it. Oh, well, we have uh, most active research in the school. Yes. At the same time. Yeah. Okay, uh, welcome to the second afternoon section. Uh, so we will start uh, with a talk by Gabriele Travaglini on the classical general relativity from the double copy and the kinematic algebra of the MS theory. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for, thanks to the organizer for this wonderful conference. Uh, first time that I give an in-person talk since, uh, I think, March 2020 when people started wearing masks and we didn't know why. So it's a great pleasure to be here. So I'm going to talk about some work done with uh, Andy Brandhuber, Gang Chen, Henrik Johansson, and Song Kao Wen. And there will be something to appear maybe tomorrow or Monday, and something else to appear later with our PhD students, uh, our great PhD students, uh, Graham Brown, Stefano De Angelis, uh, and Josh Gaudi. Okay, so motivation. No? So tomorrow will be the, the right uh, gravity day. And uh, I have to apologize, I won't be able to be here. So just as a, as a very, very short introduction, anticipating what uh, Alessandra and Svi and other speakers will say, uh, while we had, there is a lot of motivation to study anything related to gravity, particularly because of the recent discovery of uh, first direct observation of uh, gravitational waves. Uh, and um, <clears throat> as will be reviewed tomorrow, um, the black hole merger process can be described into three phases, uh, the first of which, the spiral phase, uh, uh, can be treated uh, very well with uh, perturbative methods. Uh, and, uh, and that's where we come in. With scattering amplitudes, we can provide uh, very efficient uh, perturbative methods to compute this, uh, uh, anything related to, to these quantities. So what I'm going to talk about, so in the first part, uh, I will discuss uh, the calculation of black hole scattering at two loops, or 3 p.m., uh, using some very efficient formalism, uh, which we call the Heft, I know that the name was used by Higgs people. I'm, I'm afraid we are also using it for something else. It means uh, heavy mass effective field theory, which is some, some sort of uh, uh, heavy quark effective field theory just for gravity, for heavy scalars uh, and gravitons. Uh, and we will see how this can be described very efficiently using the double copy. And because we started playing with the double copy, in the second part of the talk, I will discuss something else. Uh, so somehow we landed on very nice formula for these scattering amplitudes, uh, which had a lot of structure. And from this structure, we were able, or we claim we were able to understand what is the kinematics uh, algebra behind the scattering amplitudes of this half theory, and by using some decoupling limit also of uh, pure Young Mills. So this will be the, what I will discuss in the second part of the talk. 
Okay, just as, because this is the first talk on, on, the, on this topic, let me just very briefly uh, remind you that uh, one can compute uh, uh, interesting quantities in classical general relativity using amplitudes. Uh, and uh, as far as I know, the first person to suggest this was Iwasaki in 1971. And uh, he also pointed out that uh, there was an erroneous belief that only three diagrams contribute to classical processes. Uh, and as we now know, and many people have said and studied, that's not true. The main reason being this factor of H bar, which appears in the Klein-Gordon equation when you have a mass around. So if you have masses, you have to be very careful. Uh, and in turn, that means that the loop expansion is not an H-bar expansion as it's written in many places. This book gets it right, but you really have to read very carefully to understand that. Otherwise, you could get very heavily misled on that point. So if you want to do the computation of the Newton potential at three level, then you simply have to compute this diagram. That's very simple. You don't need amplitudes or anything. Uh, you compute this in momentum space, divide by some normalization, Fourier transform, and you get Newton's potential, which is very pleasing. So this comes from a single Graydon exchange diagram. And I want to mention these beautiful amplitude-based derivations uh, by Neil and Rothstein and uh, Björn Bo, Donoghue and Van Hoff, and they, I think they really started this uh, uh, approach to compute quantities in, uh, uh, in general relativity using amplitudes. And the advantages are obvious. That I don't need to uh, tell this audience what they can be, but uh, one of them is that you don't need to sum over many diagrams. Uh, and in addition, you also find completely relativistic computation that you can then expand. So that's what is called the post minkowskian expansion. Now, one question is what can you reliably compute because the gravity is non-renormalizable. So that's a fair question, no? And the answer is very simple. You want to compute things which have to do with the infrared theory, which is what you know. What you don't know is the UV theory, and you don't want to know about it. Uh, and so the main point is that these low energy gravitons can propagate long distances, uh, and there is a signature of uh, what they do, and the signature is non-analyticity. So you can see these terms, they are all non-analytic, uh, and they correspond to long range propagation, and then you suddenly arrive here, that's something that you don't want to see. So basically, oops, the main point is that these non-analytic terms cannot be reabsorbed by local counter terms. So they cannot be affected by whatever high energy completion of the theory uh, there can be, which we don't know. And of course, the fact that we need to compute non-analytic quantities is great because then we can use unitarity and that's the connection to us somehow. That's one of the connections to us. So let me now enter a bit more into the details of what we have done. So that's the problem we want to address. So that's the computation of, of the black hole scattering. So this is the scattering angle, chi. It's a better quantity than the potential because it's coordinate independent. And we want to compute it as a function of the masses, the impact parameter B, and the velocities of these black holes. Now, the very important preliminary observation is that uh, these black holes exchange momenta that are much smaller than their masses. Uh, and that's exactly the situation that occurs when you study heavy quark effective theory. So what you want to do is to come up with some expansion which mimics heavy quark effective theory with the difference that now you have two massive scalars uh, plus gluons and gravitons. And there is some nice set of papers by these authors uh, that started doing this. Uh, and we want to do this very systematically. So we want to formulate this uh, heft theory or heavy, quark, heavy mass effective field theory. And uh, the main point uh, is that we first want to do this in Young-Mills uh, and then we want to find a, a color kinematics friendly formula so that we can just double copy. And, uh, and, um, and there were a lot of surprises. Uh, one of them is that we could come up with manifestly gauge invariant formula and, uh, and also we could find formula for any number of uh, particles effectively. So all multiplicity formula. And then we want to compute this uh, scattering angle, uh, of course. Uh, and uh, the very useful fact uh, is that uh, this expansion is great uh, to take the classical limit as soon as possible. So you want to simplify the computation before you integrate uh, as much as you can. And that means separate different orders in H bar or in masses uh, at a very early stage. That's what we want to do. And because it's a diagram diagrammatic method, uh, all types of contributions, including radiation reaction, they just come out as diagrams. So 
they are no different than, than other diagrams. And the bonus, which I will describe in the last part of the talk, will be given that we have this all multiplicity formula, we could somehow have a guess of what this kinematic algebra is, and I will try to convince you of our proposal later on. Okay. Now, some examples of these uh, heft amplitudes. Uh, three points, there is not much to say, that's very simple. So let's look at four points directly. So this is the exact uh, expression of the amplitude with two scalars uh, and, uh, two gravit uh, and two gravitons. Uh, and the right hand side is the expansion in terms uh, of the masses uh, in the heavy mass limit. Uh, so you can see that there are two types of terms. Uh, one of them has two three-point amplitudes uh, connected by a delta function over here. And then the next term is what we really call the heft amplitude. And that's effectively is what you obtain by the left hand, from the left-hand side by expanding after having removed all the i epsilons. So in other words, uh, this uh, uh, cut over here, this delta function comes from uh, appropriately expanding while keeping the i epsilons. Now, the very nice property that you can notice uh, is that this expansion uh, separates very neatly different orders in mass which also means h bar. So that's a very important uh, property. And uh, the other thing is that uh, maybe you can say this is very simple, it's just four points, uh, but notice that this expression is manifestly gauge invariant, uh, and later on I will show you more complicated expression with more particles, which are also manifestly gauge invariant. So that's very nice. Uh, and uh, this uh, type of expansion generalizes to any number of points, uh, and you, you have a similar um, similar form, so terms with many, progressively many more delta functions, uh, all the way up to the term without any delta functions, which you obtain by setting to zero all the i epsilons in the propagators, and that's a heft expansion, so the equivalent of this quantity over here. And I will show you examples of these uh, quantities later. So now let's do one loop now. At one loop, you have to write down the following diagrams, uh, and uh, I also indicated here the mass dependence of each diagram. And again, you can see the nice thing is that uh, the, um, the, the order in the masses of the different diagrams is different, so you can neatly separate all the different dependencies. Huh? The solid red line is the delta function that I showed in the previous page, coming from the heft amplitudes, huh? and the dotted line is the unitary cut, which we still want to do <coughs> as usual. So there are these four diagrams, huh? and uh, so it will turn out that these two are classical diagrams. This one is quantum. You can see from the dependence of the masses. So one question is what to do with this diagram, the famous hyperclassical term. So first thing to notice is that here it comes as a separate diagram. You don't need to expand anything. It's just there. Um, but let's see what further simplifications we can make. Well, the first one is that we know that uh, the conservative amplitude is a phase in impact parameter space, and that's where we want to end up. And uh, so let's focusing again on this hyperclassical contribution. Uh, the main observation is that uh, after you perform the Fourier transform to impact parameter space, uh, this convolution becomes a product. Uh, and the product uh, is nothing but the expansion of uh, what you have already computed at three level, which is uh, this diagram over here. Let me make this a bit more precise in the, in the next slide. Uh, what we want to compute is really this exponent. It's a bit like uh, in the story with the Wilson loop. If people who have computed Wilson loop might remember, you want to compute directly the exponent. And there, there is something nice called the non-abelian exponentiation theorem that tells you what you need to compute and what you can discard, which is not needed because it just reconstructs the expansion of lower orders, for example, this delta 0. So here, the, the idea is that you have to drop uh, anything which is not two mass particle irreducible. So anything which you can separate into two parts by cutting two massive lines, uh, you can simply drop. That means, drop means you don't compute it. It doesn't mean you have to extract it from some big integrand, you just forget about it. So the computation is very simple. Uh, it just uh, boils down to the computation of these two diagrams, which is very easy, and I will show the result later. But let's do more diagrams. Uh, Let's do two loops. So let me show you everything. So there are, in this case, there are these three diagrams. These two correspond to the conservative part, and the last diagram correspond to what is known as the radiation reaction. There's also another diagram over here that you may want to check, but in four dimensions, it doesn't give any new contribution. 
And again, just to more advertising, the advantages is that uh, the three amplitude expressions which appear over here, they're very simple, very compact, and gauge invariant. Uh, and the expansion is done at a very early stage in contrast with other approaches. So then you need to compute. Of course, that's also complicated, but that's not what I want to focus in this seminar. So just to show you the results, uh, that, well, just to prove that we have done something. So the results is usually expressed in terms of these three variables. This one is often called sigma in other papers. Uh, <clears throat> this is the total angular momentum, the uh, linear momentum, angular momentum. We compute this uh, uh, phase, uh, and then we extract the scattering angle by, with standard formula by performing a derivative with respect to the total angular momentum. And uh, that's the result. Uh, three level, one loop, uh, and two loops, or 3 p.m. And that agrees with uh, these very, very important papers which had computed that before us. So as a, as a, um, it, it looks like it's an efficient way to compute, and we are, of course, we are trying to use it further in other calculations. Uh, this, let me just, that I will leave for you to read. Uh, and let me now switch to the second part of the talk. Uh, now, so that was a spin-off of what we were doing earlier on, uh, and that's because we were able to obtain these very simple uh, amplitude expressions. So once we had them under our eyes, uh, they, they kind of wanted to tell something. And that, let's see what they try to tell us. So one thing that we know already is that the kinematic algebra in the self-dual sector of young mills uh, is known. Uh, and it was mentioned also in previous talks. Uh, it's area-preserving diffeomorphism. Uh, but we want to go beyond because self-dual young mills is a bit trivial. The S-matrix uh, is equal to 1 at 3 level up to the uh, three-point amplitude. Uh. So what about the full interacting theory? So what we are going to do, we are going to work in this heft theory, so in this uh, heavy mass effective theory with two heavy scalars and many gluons. Uh, and these are the amplitudes which we have under our eyes. Uh, but you then have to remember that you can decouple the two scalars uh, using this very simple procedure. You just replace the velocity with an, extra, with, with an, an n minus 1 polarization vector and then take an shell limit. Uh, and then you get pure young mills. And these steps, uh, do not interfere with whatever I'm going to say next uh, about the heft uh, amplitudes. So after identifying the algebra for the heft theory, then you also have it uh, for young mills So that's our proposal. So let's see how this goes. Uh, it's quite a fun story. Now, the first point is that you want to write down these amplitudes uh, in a BCJ-friendly form. So this is the, these are the <coughs> gluon amplitudes, and this will be then the uh, the graviton amplitude so with these two heavy scalars uh, uh, for which V is the velocity. And the sums are over cubic diagrams, uh, which can be classified as usual, as standard, uh, um, as sums over ordered or unordered nested commutators of the n minus 2 gluon labels, with the first one always fixed to 1 as in standard in the DDM basis. So these are examples of the, what you have to expand on. And each of these gammas corresponds to a cu particular cubic graph, uh, OBCJ numerator. And let me show you one example. So that's a very simple example. So you have two vertices here. And so you have two commutators, one, two over here, and then the next one with three. And you can also read off from the same diagram the propagators. Uh, and this red box denotes the two scalars, which can also then replace by an extra gluon if you want to do so. Now, the very nice uh, uh, idea of uh, Henrik, uh, Gang, and uh, their friends uh, was to rewrite these uh, BCJ numerators uh, using some additional or auxiliary quantity, which they call the prenumerator, which is this yellow thing, and you can see what that means. It's a quantity such that when you <laughs> rewrite the BCJ numerator in terms of the prenumerator, then all the Jacobi relations are automatically satisfied. So it's a very nice uh, intermediate quantity. And it's also simple to compute. Let me show you some examples. So at four points, that's effectively what you have seen already. So that's no big surprise. So three and four are the massive scalars. And one and two, for which you can see here the field strengths, are simply the, uh, the gluons. And I will set the mass equal to one, because it's always constant in front. So linear power for uh, young mills and quadratic for gravity. Uh, this is more complicated, uh, so that's a prenumerator for five points, uh, 
um, what you need to observe is that, um, again, it's a manifestly gauge invariant uh, expression, and also these terms somehow they have a very definite and uh, identifiable structure. They're very simple somehow. You can, you can see something there. Uh, you can also count the number of terms uh, that you have in this prenumerator. Let, let me come back to this point uh, a little later, but there will be some interesting story about the number of terms which appear on the right-hand side of these uh, expressions. Now, the, the main idea here is that uh, you may be able to uh, construct these prenumerators uh, in some abstract algebraic way. So, the idea is to construct this prenumerator from some kind of fusion product of many abstract generators of some algebra, and we want to identify what this algebra could be. So, to do this, to, to, to make this identification, we want to build this map step by step. So, we start from the beginning. So, let me show four points. So, what you see here corresponds to specific formula, which I will show in the next slide. So, contractions of field strengths, velocities, and so on. And, uh, the fact that you can see generators here which have different names uh, means that they correspond to different structures that you can identify very easily. So start with two. Remember, there was just one term. It was v.f1.f2.v with some denominator. Now, if you want to add one more point, uh, by using this formula, you will have to compute the fusion product of this quantity with yet another generator. So you need to compute this. And you will, if you do it, uh, you can identify from the explicit expression that there are three terms. Then you have to take these three terms uh, in turn and start them with yet another generator. Uh, and uh, from the explicit expressions, you can find uh, oops, that there are such terms which appear. So let's do some counting. So you can see here, for four points, there is one term. For five points, there are three. For six, there are 13, which is five plus five plus three more. And at this point, you can start putting these numbers into Google and uh, see what comes out. Maybe something comes out. Well, actually, you need to do the, the next uh, case. That would be 75 if you do it. So let me keep the suspense for a moment uh, and show some expressions. Uh. So for n equal four, this T12 is what you have seen already twice <coughs> earlier on. And these are the expressions of these other quantities which we have introduced with those definitions. And the nice thing, because we were basically able, using factorization, to come up with uh, <coughs> all multiplicity formula. So we have some, uh, it looks complicated, but there is, there's a lot of structure. You don't need to really understand everything of this. Uh, just you need to know that uh, there is a general formula which tells you what are these quantities for any number of uh, points. Oops. So now let me rewrite a little bit these fusion rules uh, using different letters, uh, which will be useful for the identification of this uh, algebra. Oops, let me start from here. So one is always fixed. Uh, I told you that these are DDM uh, diagrams, uh, so there is always one fixed. So two and three are active, so I color them in different colors, and I also call them with letters. Uh. So you see what's happening here? I'm shuffling A and B, but then there is also an extra term at the end. Now let's do more, let's do, yeah, let's do six points. Uh, and you can see, again, there is shuffling of different terms, uh, and then there is an, an extra term which violates this shuffling, so it's a stuffling term. So you then have to contrast uh, what is shuffle with what, what is called quasi-shuffle. So these fusion rules uh, are the fusion rules of something which has to do with quasi-shuffles, uh, and at this point you can Google the internet, uh, and you find this. Uh, so you find something which has to do with Hopf algebras of quasi-shuffles. And these are exactly the same fusion rules uh, that we found uh, from these uh, heft uh, uh, expressions, uh, and they appear in this uh, French paper. So the answer is that uh, it looks, uh, actually our proposal is that this kinematic algebra is a quasi-shuffle Hopf algebra that generates all order partitions of a given set. And this appears in the context of these combinatorial Hopf algebras of shuffles and quasi-shuffles, which are also relevant for symbols uh, and co-products of uh, polylogarithmic functions. Uh, um, and some of this was said in, the, in other talks earlier on. Now, 
just to make this more precise, the generic fusion product uh, has two terms. One is this shuffling term, and then there is the extra term which makes this a quasi-shuffle algebra rather than a shuffle algebra. And uh, these Hopf algebras have a lot of interesting structure or maps, uh, like the coproduct, co-unit, and antipod, and hopefully there will be our new paper uh, coming up very soon on this. Uh, now the question is, how did we get there? That was a bit of magic, sir. Huh? <clears throat> well, we got there by looking at the generic formula for the prenumerator, which is written in terms of these uh, uh, abstract generators. Huh? And uh, the sum over here is over all these ordered partitions of uh, these numbers huh? into R subsets. Huh? And uh, now these numbers, huh? are very well-known numbers. Uh, let me show them all. These are called Fubini numbers. Uh, so you can recognize here the 3, the 13, and the 75. Uh, so basically, there, are, there aren't many algebras which have got to do with Fubini numbers, and that one is the one which is relevant. Uh, so um, that's how we arrived at these uh, algebras. Uh, now it's uh, interesting to know what do they do for a living, these numbers. Uh, well, they count possible outcomes of horse races, uh, but in the old days when there was no photo finish, so you have to include ties. So if you have two horses, for example, either one can win or they can uh, come in a tie. And uh, I leave you as an exercise to count that uh, for three horses, uh, then there are 13 possible outcomes. That's a nice computation. And, but they also count interesting things like the number of permutohedron phases, Cayley trees and Cayley permutations, uh, and maybe there are interesting connections to these quantities. Th this we don't know. Okay, I think I'm almost done. <coughs> oh, just some comments. This is just some advertising on what we are still doing. So we, we find that uh, some of the structures which appear in these Hopf algebras have some nice interpretation in terms of properties of amplitudes and BCJ numerators. Huh? For example, the coproduct corresponds to factorization channels, the, the various components of the coproduct, and the antipodal map that also Lance mentioned in his talk corresponds to inverting the order of gluons in a BCJ numerator. And I also want to mention a paper which appeared uh, earlier on, uh, where we looked at, uh, uh, so this paper also has all multiplicity expressions for BCG numerators, uh, uh, and you can count the number of terms that they have, and it turns out that they've got twice the number of the, uh, twice the Fubini numbers. And uh, for some examples, you can also see that this number reduces to our number. Uh, we haven't seen this in general, maybe there is some, uh, deeper connection with the approach of this paper. And yeah, there are also common features with, uh, with their expressions. So I'm done, so I hope I convince you that, uh, first of all, that this uh, heavy mass effective theory can be useful to compute quantities, classical quantities in general relativity, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, quite nice to, to use. And because we were able to find these uh, all multiplicity expressions, uh, which, uh, so the key point is that uh, these expressions came out, came out as gauge invariant. Uh, that's not what usually happens in young mills with BCJ numerators. Uh, hence the extra simplicity which allowed us to see the structure. That, that was the whole, the whole point. Uh, and we were able to map terms uh, to fusion rules of generators uh, in a Hopf algebra, which is a quasi-shuffle algebra. And there are many open issues. Uh, uh, they are all obvious, and I'm sure this will be also discussed tomorrow for what concerns gravity. And for what concerns uh, uh, this Hopf algebra, one can obviously ask uh, if this uh, algebra can teach us something new about amplitudes. Uh, and uh, also, we don't have explicit expression for these generators, and that's also an interesting question. Sir, and uh, I'm sure there are many other questions. And thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you very much, Gabriele. So, uh, is there any question? Uh, thank you for a nice talk. Um, I was wondering whether, uh, well, or, or uh, uh, do you know how the kinematic Jacobi relations fit into this Hopf algebra um, uh, structure? 
Can you repeat louder? Ah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry. No, I, 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 <laughs> yeah, sorry. I uh, uh, thank you for a nice talk. And uh, do you know how the um, kinematic Jacob relations uh, could be related to this kind of um, Hopf algebra? The, the kinematic what? Uh, the kinematic Jacobi relations, so the, the, these cubic relations between the kinematic numerators. Jacobi relations. Oh, they are, in, they are embedded into this. Oh, well, they are embedded because we, so the quantities we compute directly are these prenumerators. Uh, so they automatically satisfy the Jacobi relations. Effectively, there's nothing to check. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, what I mean is uh, whether this has an algebraic interpretation kind of on this uh, Hopf algebra. You want me to find some additional Jacobi relations for these generators in some way? No, I, no. I, I don't know. Uh, uh, no, uh, no uh, th thank you. Uh, uh, maybe we can discuss later. Thank you. Maybe it's not precise enough that what I okay, want to Okay, we can discuss. Yeah, yeah thank yeah, you. Maybe, yeah. Okay, other questions? Oh, there. Yeah. Uh, very last talk. So, do you have any results for two massive, two heavy massive lines? We have two heavy massive lines. Do, do you have any results for two heavy massive, massive lines? Do you have any two? results for two massive lines? Two massive lines. Ma massive, massive line. Massive, massive lines? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we, we, here we have two massive particles. So yeah, yeah. You, you, I mean want, massive you want uh, lines, so two, two, two scattering with more gluons. So. Yeah, so I mean... So I, you, you mean four massive particles, and yeah. we started looking into that, and it's a bit more complicated, the story. Yeah, okay. we have some preliminary results on that. Okay, the, the, the double copy story is more, is trickier. Okay, I see, thank you. Okay, maybe there is time for one last question. Hey, uh, thanks for a nice talk. So, just wondering, when you decouple the massive particle into pure Yamil's expressions, yeah, do you see additional? Is there a way you can find simplifications to the Yamil's numerators? Well, you find uh, that the formula become much more complicated because the velocity is, is replaced by a polarization vector. So you end up with these polarization vectors uh, in the denominator of the expression. So they perhaps are a little unusual, huh? but they can be mapped to the formula of this other paper which I mentioned uh, for some simple cases. Huh? And uh, there's one thing in common, because you get these polarization vectors in the formula, also in denominators you get reference uh, momenta, and, and spinners, uh, and that's also in parallel with this other paper. So there are similarities between the two expressions. Uh, and uh, th th there's only one more paper which I know which uh, has um, any number, well, sorry, uh, expressions for any number of particles, but these are considerably more com complicated, uh, many more terms, and you don't really see any structures. Here there is some structure somehow, and, and also the fact that this uh, number of terms is related to these Fubini numbers. Uh, it, it gives something. Thanks. I'm not sure it's a very precise answer, but... Uh... Okay, if there's no further question, let's thank Gabriele once thank again. Thank you very much. Okay, our next speaker is Tim Adamo, uh, who will talk about core backgrounds and scattering amplitudes. Okay, uh, thanks very much uh, for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm gonna tell you all about some work with uh, two excellent collaborators, Andrea Christofoli, who's a postdoc in Edinburgh, and Piotr Torquin, uh, about some work we put out late last year and some stuff that's hopefully gonna appear soon when we get our act together. But this also builds on uh, lots of past uh, and, and ongoing uh, work with many other people uh, as well. So uh, the, the, the setup for everything I'm going to be talking about is scattering, so really scattering, so we want asymptotically flat backgrounds in curved backgrounds. Uh, and these curved backgrounds we're going to think of as exact, non-perturbative uh, solutions to the classical uh, equations of motion of whatever theory uh, you want to, to, to deal with. And so examples could be gluon scattering in a non-trivial gauge field uh, background, or gravitational scattering in a curved space-time. 
And there's many, many reasons uh, to be interested in, in these uh, sorts of setups, even though we don't tend to talk about them very much. Uh, first of all, this uh, kind of area is like a playground where all the perturbative methods that many of us deal with uh, also interact with uh, interesting non-perturbative effects. Uh, there's many, many physical uh, applications for this stuff, including right here uh, in the Czech Republic, where uh, Eli Beamlines is, is studying uh, strong lasers, so strong field uh, QED effects. But also, uh, like in a more existential sense, uh, these, considering scattering and curved backgrounds, it's like a robustness test for whatever your favorite amplitudes method is. Um, so if, if it can apply to these setups, that means it's really a robust method and probably has something to do with the fundamental structure of, of, of whatever quantum field theory it is that you're thinking about. Um, but, uh, okay, there's some obvious bad news uh, associated with this question, which is that the textbook setup for performing these sorts of computations is background field theory. And, uh, I mean, this is just a nightmare. Uh, and even the simplest uh, asymptotically flat backgrounds, uh, these Feynman rules that you would get from uh, the background field Lagrangian are an absolute nightmare if you can even write them down uh, explicitly in the first place. That's not always a given. Um, and these backgrounds, generically, they have functional degrees of freedom in them. So if you think something like ADS or de Sitter space is hard, um, where you're not actually doing scattering, but sort of uh, still a curved background, these are much worse. There's really functional degrees of freedom in the background. Um, there's no momentum conservation. Things that we take for granted all the time, like uh, tree-level amplitudes being rational functions of the kinematics, this is no longer true. Um, and there's all sorts of other gnarly effects that turn up. So uh, there's no Huygens principle in these backgrounds. What that means is that you get tail effects generically, which is like you can think of as some kind of uh, nonlinear geometric optics uh, stuff that shows up uh, in your scattering amplitudes. And there's also the memory effect. So the difference between incoming and outgoing states is no longer as simple as flipping some signs uh, in, in, your, in your calculation. There's really functional differences between these things. Um, and I guess maybe the, the, the sharpest way to, to see that this is a hard problem is that uh, the tree-level precision frontier uh, with kind of this background field uh, formalism is four points. And this is in like strong field QED, so QED in a, in a kind of strong electromagnetic plane wave background. People have been looking at this for like 75 years, working really, really hard. And the tree level precision frontier is four points. So if you've heard of something like trident pair production, which is like a detection target for some of these experiments that I mentioned earlier, that's like a four point uh, tree level process. So it's hard, and when you compare it to like what we're able to do in a trivial background, uh, like with, with Pure Yang Mills theory where we know endpoint uh, expressions. So there's a big knowledge gap. Um, but uh, so you might say, okay, Tim, uh, maybe you should stop your talk here because this seems like a pretty uh, hopeless task. But of course, uh, there's two, two if, you, if you take away nothing else from this talk, I'd have you take away these two points. Uh, the first is that, I mean, the whole point of this conference is that uh, there are better ways than the textbook approach to computing scattering amplitudes. And this is, of course, true in curved backgrounds as well. Um, but the other thing, and the main thing I'm going to focus on today, is the fact that even low multiplicity or low loop uh, expressions in curved backgrounds encode lots of information. So even if you somehow don't feel brave enough to try and write down some all multiplicity expressions for scattering amplitudes in curved backgrounds, you can still learn lots uh, even uh, with the bar set a bit lower. Uh, but first, I'd like to have just a quick word on using non-textbook, or if you like, amplitudes methods uh, in, this, uh, in this framework. I think it's fair to say that this is something that hasn't been uh, very well studied. And there's sort of an obvious reason for that, uh, which is that lots of our favorite amplitudes techniques just obviously break immediately as soon as you turn on uh, curved background fields. So if you like doing anything <laughs> with like momentum space unitarity or momentum space Feynman rules, uh, you're hosed. That toolbox is just not gonna work here. Um, but there's lots of other things that we know and love that do work, like the spinner helicity formalism or twister or ambi-twister methods, or there's other things that like the jury's still, still out on, like double copy or uh, kind of more general notions uh, of, of unitarity. So there's lots of work to be done here, but I think we definitely have a smoking gun 
that something can be achieved, which is that we do have uh, all multiplicity uh, expressions for tree-level scattering amplitudes in large classes of at least self-dual uh, gauge and gravitational backgrounds. So it's, it's clear that non-textbook approaches can be used here and can uh, kind of exceed the precision frontier that's been set with, uh, with traditional methods. So I think there's lots to, to do and understand uh, with this. But today, uh, in some sense, I'll talk about what may seem like a less uh, ambitious uh, thing, which is trying to extract information from lower point amplitudes on curved backgrounds. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about what two point amplitudes uh, on curved backgrounds uh, can teach us about scattering in flat backgrounds. So uh, in particular, uh, what I'll try to tell you about is a kind of covariant approach to the relativistic iconal approximation. This may be something that you feel uh, is really well understood, and, and I would agree with you in some sense, uh, but we're going to have a kind of new perspective on it, or what I'll hope to convince you is a new perspective. And what's cool is that you can use this perspective to answer questions that you might have thought uh, were completely unrelated, like what is the massless limit uh, of the Kerr metric? Okay, so uh, just a quick reminder, we've heard lots about this already, I'm sure we'll hear some more about it uh, tomorrow, but uh, iconal exponentiation, or what I'm gonna mean by uh, iconal exponentiation is that if you take two to two scattering in the small angle uh, regime, uh, this will be dominated by ladder diagrams, and the idea is that these ladder diagrams form a geometric series which can be resummed and exponentiates uh, in, in impact parameter space, if you like. And you get this iconal amplitude, which is controlled by an iconal phase, which I'll call chi one. And this phase is basically, uh, it, it is the, the, the Born approximation, so the single exchange diagram, just the inverse Fourier transform of it. And you can show that these iconal amplitudes are um, kind of manifestly classical. They're basically just the tree level contribution times a phase. Um, so this is an extremely powerful uh, statement. It's an all orders uh, statement. And uh, there's lots of great properties uh, that hold when you can say that you have this iconal exponentiation. So uh, it was observed long ago by Tuft that if you have some theory with many different particles, you only have to worry about the exchanges of the highest spin particle. So this is sometimes referred to as graviton dominance, but it's really just uh, highest spin dominance. So if you're doing uh, QED with the charged scalars, you'd only need to worry about photon exchanges. Um, and there's ma it's manifestly classical. I already said it's because the amplitude is basically given by the, the tree level result up to a phase, but also, I mean, if you keep track of H bars, the, the amplitude itself is classical. This phase, uh, it's not meaningless. It also carries information about bound states of the classical two-body system uh, that you're describing. And usually, uh, or one hopes to be able to actually evaluate this impact parameter integral uh, here, and you can get uh, very concrete expressions. So this is a famous expression for the, the iconal amplitude for two equal mass scalars uh, with graviton exchanges. So you get some, some explicit uh, expression that you can work with. Um, but it, to me at least, it's, it's actually surprisingly tricky to figure out when it's okay to apply this iconal uh, approximation. So uh, for instance, the first thing you need to establish is that these ladder diagrams do indeed dominate in the small angle regime to all orders. And so for instance, in scalar, gravitationally mediated scalar scattering, that's true. But if you just take uh, phi cubed theory, pure phi cubed theory, at, uh, what is this, three loop order, there start to be diagrams that beat the ladder diagrams. And so iconal exponentiation doesn't actually hold there. It's not a valid approximation to the small uh, angle scattering regime. Um, but you also need to establish that you can actually resum the ladder diagrams. And so uh, I know something a lot of us uh, in the room are interested in is gravitational scattering of massive spinning particles. So there's this uh, well, well-known uh, GOV, or guevara ocherov bines amplitude for a, a kind of infinite spin massive particle and say a massive scalar exchanging a graviton, but it's not known uh, whether you can actually uh, get a geometric series uh, for this. So, so really whether you can truly justify uh, iconally exponentiating um, this amplitude. So uh, it seems weird 
I think, well, you, let me just make a quick comment. You may say, okay, phi cubed, this is kind of a, a bad theory. Uh, maybe you shouldn't uh, worry too much about the fact that something goes wrong here. But I think the point is really like, you couldn't have just looked at the theory uh, at the Lagrangian and guessed that you would need this diagram to see that things would start going wrong. So I think the real takeaway from this is that I think it's weird to need so much information, in principle an infinite number of diagrams and some non-trivial resummation to get such a simple result for the iconal amplitude. And the basic question is, is there a better way? And so the, the, the basic idea is gonna be that at small momentum transfer, small angle scattering, which is the regime we're interested in, uh, each particle just looks like a fixed classical background to the other one. And so two to two iconal scattering, you should just think of as one to one scattering in a curved background that's sourced by the other particle. Now, uh, I want to be as upfront as possible. This is an old idea. We're not the first people to have this idea. A very famous paper by, uh, by Tuft, who uh, demonstrated this in the case of massless, uh, gravitationally mediated massless scalar scattering. And the same thing was done in the massless uh, charged case by Jakiv, uh, Kabat, and Ortiz. Um, but this has never been fleshed out in a relativistic covariant way in anything involving mass or spin. Um, and there's, I also don't want to claim that this is the only way to understand uh, classicality of the iconal approximation. Um, I know there's uh, been lots of work uh, on this by kind of big k mock uh, e collaborations. Uh, but also, if you saw Ricardo Gonzo's uh, uh, poster this week, there's, there's many, many other ways uh, one, can, one can think about this. So I don't want to make too strong a claim here, um, but this is the basic idea uh, that we'll be thinking about. So let me make, uh, be a, a bit more precise about what the proposal is. So we're considering two to two, let's say gravitational scattering, small angle, uh, with some incoming momenta and some outgoing momenta. And the statement is gonna be that if you have a good iconal approxima approximation and iconal exponentiation holds, then what you can do is take one of these particles and use it as a stationary source in the Einstein equations, then compute the one-to-one -one scattering amplitude, which I'll call M2, of the other particle in this space-time, and then that, that answer basically is the iconal amplitude up to some overall normalization. The M here is the mass of particle big P, or if you like, the ADM mass of the background that you've constructed with that source. Okay, so that's the precise proposal. So uh, some of you may have the howling phantas already because you might say, well, geez, scattering in a generic curved space-time is not well-defined. So this is sort of famously true for black hole space-times, uh, where you have particle creation at event horizons. So you might worry that the proposal just doesn't make any sense. So let me be a bit more precise about what we mean. So uh, the two-point amplitude, this is just gonna be a boundary term because you're just evaluating the quadratic action on a bilinear superposition of solutions to the free equations of motion. And so this boundary term takes this form. You have an, uh, a kind of incoming wave, which you can think of as like a free kind of Minkowski-like thing. It looks like e to the i k dot x. And then you have an outgoing wave, which is the kind of scattered outgoing field on the curved space-time. And you want to whack these things in here and evaluate this on uh, the boundaries. Now, uh, there are two cases to consider. The first is that whatever curved space-time you set up doesn't have any problems. It admits an S matrix, in which case, the prescription is you evaluate this boundary term on all of the boundaries of the space-time. Uh, but now suppose that your, your space-time X doesn't admit an S matrix for some reason. You have particle creation or some singularity or something. Well, then the prescription is gonna be to evaluate only on kind of linearized large distance boundaries. So if you like at large impact parameter, far away from wherever there are gonna be problems. Um, so in principle, this will mean spatial, or, or, or in practice, this will mean spatial in all infinity. And so if you want some kind of example to carry around uh, in your head, you can think of the Schwarzschild metric. You have particle creation on the event horizon, and depending on how you want to define your space-time manifold, you might cut your manifold off at the horizon, in which case this is a boundary, but uh, if you evaluate the two-point amplitude with contributions from this boundary, you're gonna get nonsense because uh, this boundary is precisely the reason why there's no S matrix uh, in, in the Schwarzschild space-time. So instead, you, you'd evaluate out at infinity far away from the source, uh, the gravitational source of singularity which is causing 
the problem. So that's the prescription. Now, uh, again, in practice, we're gonna deal with stationary backgrounds at large distances, so kind of linearized in one over R, if you imagine there's some kind of Bondi coordinate system that you're, you're doing this in, and that R is always gonna come with powers of G Newton, so really, you're effectively looking at the linearized metric uh, in G Newton, so let's say it has this form, and the wave equation you're then trying to solve is just this uh, uh, linearized wave equation, but with an effective source term given by the, the, the curved uh, linear metric. Now the strategy is to make a WKB approximation for the solution, where the zeroth order bit is just the kind of free Minkowski-like solution, and then you just put some boundary condition on the kind of first uh, order correction to this, solve for this boundary, uh, solve for this first order correction, wang it into the formula for the two point scattering amplitude, and see what you get. And the amazing thing is that you get a very concrete expression that's completely controlled by this phase, which is just uh, the, 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 the WKB, the order G Newton WKB phase evaluated at spatial infinity. So, okay, if, if all of those words kind of don't mean anything to you, what's the upshot? The upshot is that one-to-one -one scattering with this prescription, this large distance prescription for what you mean by the scattering amplitude, on any stationary spacetime is structurally equivalent to an, I, an iconal amplitude. Okay, so if you like, you can make the identification up to these overall uh, normalizations, where M is the ADM mass of the background. Now, the conjecture, and for which we have no proof, so I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna be able to, uh, to prove this conjecture, is that if the spacetime that you did this two-point scattering amplitude calculation on has a particle-like source, then this isn't just a structural equivalence, this is a true equivalence. The amplitude you computed is the iconal amplitude for scattering between the scalar, which was the probe, if you like, on the, on the curved spacetime, and the source uh, of the metric. Okay, so that's, that's the conjecture. And it passes all the easy tests uh, that you could think of. Uh, the, the prescription is uh, diffeomorphism invariant with respect to the background, so it doesn't care what coordinate system uh, you chose to, to represent your, your curved space-time with. Um, and like I say, it's already been shown that this is true in the case of massless scalar scattering by Tuff long ago. In that case, the curved background is, is a shock wave. Um, and we did the computation on Schwarzschild and correctly reproduced uh, the massive scalar uh, iconal amplitude. So that works as well. But also the prescription kind of interestingly enough, detects cases where iconal exponentiation fails, like phi cubed. So I've, I've set all of this for gravity, but of course you could set it up, uh, this prescription in similar terms for any theory, and it, it, it fails in, in, in phi cubed precisely because the kind of uh, coulombic solution that you'd write down isn't actually a solution. So uh, it, it also detects cases that fail. So now the idea is, all right, we have this prescription or conjecture, or what have you, it seems to make sense. Let's go out and test it on something where we don't really know the answer. Um, and so the obvious thing to do is test it for scattering with spin. Yep. So uh, here we're talking about scattering a mass M scalar uh, with some mass big M infinite spin particle. And it, like I said before, it's kind of unclear how or if iconal exponentiation actually holds in the setup. I think most of us in the room who've thought about these things would say that it should or ought to. But in any case, in our prescription, this is now should just correspond to one-to-one -one scattering of a mass M scalar in a Kerr, in a Kerr metric uh, at large distances, so linear in G Newton. And uh, for practical purposes, it's useful to use this kind of form of the metric in harmonic coordinates that was found by, by Justin Vines a few years ago. Um, and what you get is precisely uh, iconal exponentiation of this Guevara Otra Vines uh, amplitude. So I've written out the corresponding iconal phase for you if you're, if you're interested. Um, but what's really cool is that we can actually do the impact parameter integrals and get an expression for this iconal uh, amplitude, which I don't believe uh, was, was, was known before. Uh, it's surprisingly complicated. Uh, we had to um, essentially use a kind of holomorphic factorization to, to do the integral. So it's like doing a string amplitude computation. 
And the answer is pretty gnarly. It involves products of confluent, hypergeometric, and gamma functions. If you're interested in the details, uh, come, come talk to me later. Uh, so the upshot is that this, in the Kerr framework, it suggests that iKernel exponentiation should hold for these kind of infinite spin particles. And it also gives us a new explicit expression for the iKernel amplitude. Um, I think it's surprising that this has this KLT-like structure. Um, there's some old work by the Ferlindas that maybe lends some light on this. And uh, the phase of the iKernel amplitude has some interesting structures. So the, the, po the poles have imaginary parts, which suggests some instabilities uh, in classical bound states, but we don't uh, really have a great interpretation for this right now, I think it's fair to say. Um, but just to, to end, I'd like to kind of talk briefly about this kind of surprising application of this, this frame, or at least I think it's surprising. And that's just uh, consider the following question. What's the massless or ultra-boosted limit of the Kerr metric? If I replace Kerr by Schwarzschild, we all know the answer. It's the eichelberg sexel uh, shock wave, but what about uh, the Kerr metric? This is sometimes referred to as a, a gyroton or an impulsive gyroton, but surprisingly, there's a, a, a huge lack of clarity in the literature about this. Um, you just uh, go on Google and you'll find many different answers, uh, many of which contradict uh, the other answers. So it's not clear what the right answer is or if there's a good answer. Um, but more precisely, uh, I guess the question I'd like to, 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 to really answer is, is there an interesting, that is with spin effects, massless limit of the Kerr metric in this class? So uh, you might think you could call this impulsive PP waves, but it's just a, a Kerr shield metric, say in light front coordinates, where the interesting part of the metric is localized on a light front and controlled by this kind of profile function in, in, in the transverse space. And the spoiler alert is that no, there doesn't seem to be. Um, and so uh, why? Well, uh, these, these space times are WKB exact, or the, the wave equation on them is WKB exact, so it's very easy to determine uh, the, the, the wave equation for scalar scattering on them. And our prescription immediately implies that this uh, profile function that determines the metric basically is the iconal phase. Uh, and that gives you this two-way street. So take your favorite metric from the literature uh, on, on this, and from that you can read off a four-point amplitude by just taking the Fourier transform of this iconal phase and see if it makes sense. <laughs> or you can take your favorite amplitude and uh, exponentiate it, get an iconal phase, and read off a profile function and see if the metric that you get makes, makes sense. So uh, what we find is that if you ultra-boost the Kerr metric directly, there's two things that can happen. You can either do it parallel to the spin axis or orthogonally. If you do it parallel, uh, it's very easy to see all the spin effects vanish. If you do it orthogonally, it looks like maybe they don't vanish, but actually what you get is just diffeo equivalent, a diffeomorphism equi equivalent to a non-spinning shock wave. And that's actually the case that covers at least the naive massless limit of the guevara ochrov uh, vines formula. Um, there's another gyroton in the literature by Ferrari and Pendenza, but this just doesn't have the correct stress tensor to, to describe uh, the massless limit of Kerr. Um, but th there's kind of the most interesting case was done by Balasan and Nachbegauer, and this is obtained by ultra-boosting not the line element or the metric of Kerr itself, but the source. And so if you've drank enough of the Kool-Aid in this game, uh, you know that this is something that was written down by Israel back in the 70s, I think, or, or early 80s. And basically the profile function you wind up with is something that looks like a shock wave plus something that is like a kind of dust uh, but only turns on when you're uh, below a certain radius uh, from, from, from the origin. And so what this means is that at large impact parameter where R is much bigger than A, you don't see any spin effects. But what's, what I think is really cool is that if you forget about this kind of large impact parameter thing and just say, well, okay, I don't, I don't care so much about being at large impact parameter. Let me just consider uh, the, the scattering amplitude that I'd get from this. You get an incredibly simple formula, <laughs> which is just this. So this is clearly not a scattering amplitude between a scalar and a point particle because it breaks uh, Lorentz invariance because you have this spin direction uh, in it. But what it might be is a scattering amplitude for uh, between a, a four-point amplitude between a scalar and a null ring, so something with some kind of extended structure. I just think it's remarkable that it takes uh, such a simple form, although I don't have much more 
uh, to say about it other than it's quite surprising. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up just uh, by saying I think there's lots to think about uh, here and uh, yeah, lot, lots, lots to keep us busy uh, over the coming years. So thanks for your time. Uh, questions. Really nice talk. Um, so I'm interested in this connection with Guevara, Ocarava, uh, Guevara, Ocarava, and Vines in the case where you have one graviton coming in and one coming out. Can you say anything about the Compton amplitude for higher spins from this? Sorry, so, so you imagine, ah, ah, with, with, external grav with external gravitons. Yeah, I'm, so I'm, I'm thinking about the four-point amplitude where you have your one massive uh, line representing the black hole and then two gravitons coming off. Yeah, so, okay, sorry, sorry, I understand your question now. So, so in principle, yes. So you, you could imagine graviton scattering on a Kerr metric with this prescription. We just haven't done that calculation, but... Yeah, you'd have the exact same prescription. The boundary term would not be the scalar boundary term anymore, but the boundary term in the Einstein-Hilbert action. Yeah, that's a completely feasible calculation to do, which we've not done yet. So, yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, other questions? Hey, uh, about one of the, the points on this slide, you say beyond leaving icono. So at some point we know that you're not in the probe limit, so there's kind of recoil type effects. Do you have any ideas about how to take those into account? Um, like, y yes and no. So, so this is one of these things, I mean, you could, <laughs> in some sense, you're better positioned to answer this question than I am. I, like, when people talk about subleading iconal, I, I don't feel like I really understand what, what they mean. Probably there's many people in the room who, who, who have a better understanding of this than me. I think in this prescription, what we would, probably mean is going to lower order in this WKB expansion, but this clearly cannot capture all of what you mean by subleading iconal precisely for the reason that, that you're talking about. So um, in terms of back reaction effects or recoil effects, generally just in the curved background strong field framework, usually the way you deal with these things is perturbatively. So you have a fixed background and then you start computing, say, graviton emission amplitudes on that background. So what you, the short answer to your question is, like, I don't really have a precise idea, but I think probably what you need to do is go to next uh, order in the WKB approximation and start computing emission amplitudes on the background, and some combination of these things will be what you or some, some people might mean by, <laughs> by, 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 by subleading iconal. It's not a great answer, but, uh, yeah. Okay, very good. There's a question over there. Uh, uh. Thank you for a very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering, um, so Kerr is kind of very special and uh, there are so-called Wilson coefficients and uh, can you um, have anything to say uh, for uh, when you turn on these Wilson coefficients? Because we actually looked at this uh, amplitude for a very special case of massive um, spinning uh, with uh, massless particles uh, scattering off. And we did see something that looks very similar to exponentiation at one loop, but uh, didn't quite look like ordinary um, exponentiation. Yeah, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, let me try to give two quick answers. The, 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 the first answer is we haven't looked at what you're actually asking about yet. But, but generally with this, I mean, the general framework here I think is very robust. If you hand me a line element, <laughs> Uh, that you claim describes whatever object it is you want to scatter off of. I don't care how many coefficients are in it. We just follow this dictionary and we'll get an answer for the two-point amplitude on, on that background. Um, and then one can ask whether that's a satisfactory answer or not. But, um, but in terms of these massless limits of, of Kerr, there are papers in the literature, some of them by people based here uh, in Prague, I believe, uh, that, that talk about just uh, kind of doing some sort of multipole expansion for any metric that's in that class and then fixing the coefficients that come with those multiples. Uh, and they always slam you down onto one of the cases that we've 
considered here. But you could and probably should just say that the assumptions on that multiple expansion were too restrictive. So I should, I should also just say generally, they're get out of jail cards to this like massless limit of Kerr. It may be that the class of metrics we looked at here is too restrictive. So you might need to go outside of this impulsive uh, PP wave class. And then you may find something, but uh, I, d I don't have anything to say, to say about that. Sorry, it's not a totally satisfactory answer to your question. <laughs> There is time for one last question. Uh, great talk, Tim. Um, I, you started by saying that you're doing things on exact backgrounds, but it sounded like the calculation in the e at the end was in linearized curve. So I was wondering uh, what would you get by going to full curve, and you, you might be the best person to actually do it, have you done it or considered doing it? So, so it's definitely something we're, we're thinking about. Um, and yeah, so I, sh I should also point out, I mean, I think I've put it here. There, there was a recent paper uh, by Rick, Ricardo, Tristan McLaughlin, and, and Andrea Poom that in, in some sense did a bit what you're suggesting. So, so here, because we were always interested in making this connection with the iConal, we only considered these kind of leading one over R stuff at infinity, which basically means you're linearized in G Newton. But you could just use the same prescription of scattering at large impact parameter, but keep all of the one over R uh, terms in the, in the metric. Um, so it's something we've thought about, and I guess uh, Ricardo and, and collaborators have, have done, I don't know, is that a fair representation of your work? <laughs> it, yeah, but, uh, but uh, They've done something that has more than, than what we're, uh, we, we've done, I think it's fair to say. But yeah, the, the, the full calculation, no, uh, we haven't done. I guess part of the problem is that then you have to solve the wave equation on Kerr, right? And I mean, there are people that make their money uh, doing this or trying to do this, but usually they, they're using some mode expansions in harmonics or something. And, uh, I don't think that's really going to give you the answer, uh, the kind of answer that you're, you're, you're asking for here. So I'm not saying it's not tractable, but uh, we don't have a good, uh, we haven't done yeah. the calculation yeah. yet. Thanks. Okay, very good. Let's uh, thank uh, our team once again. <laughs> and the last speaker for the day is Natalie Paquet. Can you hear us, Natalie? Yeah, I can hear you. Can you okay. hear me okay? Okay, very good. You can start. Okay, great. Um, so thanks a lot for the invitation to speak at this conference. I'm sorry I couldn't be there in person. Um, today I wanted to talk about some work done in collaboration with Kevin Costello. And it's based on a couple papers that appeared on the archive earlier this year. Um, so this work, uh, comes about because of a confluence of progress in a few different subfields. There's, um, there are ideas coming from the conformal and um, also the amplitude bootstrap, and in particular, I'll focus on the emergence of chiral algebras where we have operator products with this um, holomorphic position dependence uh, for most of the talk. There's also been a number of complementary developments in celestial holography, um, and you heard about that uh, earlier today at this conference. Um, and the point of view that I've come from, which kind of has informed my perspective on this subject, um, is that of twisted holography, which is about uh, roughly leveraging open closed duality in topological string theories to try and get uh, concrete toy models of the ADS CFT correspondence. Um, and so in all of these different arenas, we noticed the emergence of some very similar and complementary formal structures, um, and it seemed like there was a way to um, tie together some of these subjects, at least at the level of uh, symmetry protected or universal physics. Uh, so in particular, um, work was really motivated because of the appearance of particular chiral algebras arising in a few different places that looked like they could be uh, related to one another. So chiral algebras, as uh, you probably already know, are most familiar as kind of the holomorphic symmetry algebras uh, that appear in ordinary 2D conformal field theories. Uh, but we know that they arise in a number of other places as well. They come about when studying 
the uh, algebra of asymptotic symmetries of four dimensional theories in asymptotically flat space times. Um, and in particular, so called conformally soft modes have a nice operator product that furnishes a chiral algebra, at least at tree level. Um, and they also emerge um, as protected subsectors of higher dimensional supersymmetric theories uh, and closely uh, in a closely related fashion. They emerge also um, as protected subsectors on world volumes of D brains in twisted string theory and twisted holography contexts as well. Um, so, as I said, there was kind of a hope that some of these chiral algebras could be related to one another and we could tie these structures together, at least at the level of universal physics. So, in either case, we seem to be having some symmetry protected structures, whether that universality comes from uh, infrared or soft sectors of certain theories, or whether it comes from um, supersymmetric or BPS protected quantities uh, that you can access by twisting in other contexts. Oops, there we go. Um, so today I want to flesh out some of those connections um, and point out a correspondence that I hope uh, will be of interest uh, in particular to this audience. So the unifying structure that I'll use to tie some of these points of view together um, is that of a local holomorphic theory on twister space, which is of course six real dimensional. And uh, local holomorphic theories turn out to provide a very clear bridge uh, between four, dimension, uh, four dimensional and two dimensional structures. Um, so the construction that I'll describe today works for any local holomorphic theory on twister space that you'd want to study. And I'll focus on a particular one. But to any local holomorphic theory on twister space, well, on the one hand, we can associate a four dimensional theory um, that's conformal uh, because local holomorphic theories on twister space capture massless physics. And that's of course a very well-known story uh, with a very well fleshed out dictionary that's uh, very familiar to many of you. What might be less familiar is that to any such twister theory, we can also associate a two dimensional chiral algebra using a construction um, that is sometimes called Kazool duality, and I'll explain later in this talk. So to any local 6D theory, we can associate on the one hand, a four dimensional theory as usual, and on the other hand, a two dimensional chiral algebra. Um, and because of this uniform origin of these two structures, we were able to prove a theorem in one of our, our papers from this past year. Um, and in particular, we're able to show an isomorphism between correlators of our Kazool dual chiral algebra associated to the 60 theory and form factors in the corresponding 40 theory, where form factor is, of course, just a scattering amplitude in the presence of a local operator insertion. And so for the particular um, 60 theory that I'll be talking about today, uh, the form factors can naturally reproduce some familiar formulas um, of uh, gluon scattering that are quite familiar and we'll, we'll see why uh, that, that's true. Okay, so before I tell you about the particular 60 theory that I'm going to be interested in, let me just briefly remind you uh, what's nice about 40 theories that uplift to local uh, twist, uh, 60 holomorphic theories on twister space. So I'll call such a 40 theory twistorial. Um, and these are really special um, and quite rare theories that have a lot of uh, structure that's not typically enjoyed by your generic 40 theory. So first, let me just remind you um, the twister space is given by this non-trivial uh, vibration of line bundles over CP1, um, which I'll call my twister sphere. And I'll always give this, this CP1 a local holomorphic coordinate Z throughout this talk. So as a real manifold, uh, twister space is equivalent to R4 cross CP1. So to every point in four dimensions, I have an associated two sphere or copy of CP1 in my twister space. And for things associated to twister space, it's most convenient to analytically continue um, to complex four-dimensional space, so C4, um, because the observables uh, extend to entire analytic functions on C4. And at the end of the day, you can always restrict to various, uh, take various real slices and specialize to whichever signature you want. I'll work in the analytically continued setting throughout this talk. Um, but the key point uh, that simplifies all of these twistorial theories just comes from a basic fact um, about the geometry of twister space. And the fact is that um, two spheres associated to say two points in four dimensions called X and Y will intersect in six dimensions if and only if 
the corresponding points in four dimensions are null separated, or at least um, in this analytically continued sense, uh, separated on the analytically continued light -like cone. So as a result, observables in these tutorial theories are entire analytic functions, in fact, rational functions, with singularities only on the light cone. So the analytic structure of observables is extremely constrained, um, highly non-generic, um, and all of that follows just from um, the presence of this local twistorial uplift. So indeed, we expect these four-dimensional theories to be quite special, uh, but nonetheless, um, I think we'll be able to draw some interesting physics from these, uh, these very special uh, structures. Uh, and finally, let me just remind you of the very well-known Penrose transform. Uh, so one of the convenient elements of the Twister Space Dictionary is that uh, we know how to build Delbo cohomology classes on Twister Space uh, with some extra data that relates to the helicity of corresponding massless particles in four dimensions. Um, and from these Delbo cohomology classes, we can we can readily construct these classes and integrate them over the Twister sphere, and we'll land on uh, holomorphic massless fields on C4. So in particular, as we specialize to whichever signature we're interested in, um, the Penrose transform enables us to neatly geometrically encapsulate solutions to, in general, nonlinear massless field equations in 4D. So that's a basic and familiar element of, of the dictionary that, of course, we use a lot. Um, so the setting for today's talk, just in picture form to review, is the following. We'll have a local holomorphic theory on twister space. On the one hand, we can reduce it over the twister sphere and we'll land on a four-dimensional uh, conformal field theory. But in the case that I'll be interested in, we'll see that I'll get a self dual yang mills theory coupled to a real scalar field that I'll call the axion. And on the other hand, we can consider uh, a two-dimensional chiral algebra that will be supported on that same twister sphere. And this chiral algebra um, arises from data in the six-dimensional theory by considering a sort of universal defect construction, which I'll describe later in the talk. And um, this is what get, gives what I call the Kazool dual chiral algebra. Um, so that's the other uh, leg of the correspondence. And because I have these uh, nice holomorphic theories that are very redolent of the kind of space-time theories that we get in twisted, uh, string theory or twisted holography. Um, I think there's an expectation that there will be a nice string theory understanding of these structures as well, but um, I don't have the full understanding for these theories, so I won't discuss that further in today's talk. It's just part of the motivation. Okay, so let me now introduce the particular holomorphic theory that I'm gonna be interested in for today. Although again, I'll, I'll stress that this, uh, that the theorems we prove are, are general for any choice. So let me start in the gauge sec uh, sector and then I'll introduce uh, the matter sector. So first I'll consider a holomorphic BF theory on twister space. So I have two fields, curly A and curly B. So curly A is um, a partial connection or a holomorphic gauge field and curly B is a three one form. And both curly A and curly B satisfy, uh, have non-trivial gauge transformations. So they correspond to um, states of positive and negative helicity, respectively. Um, and it's been well known for quite some time that if I reduce this holomorphic BF theory on the twister sphere, I'll land on self-dual gauge theory in four dimensions with the normal BF action, where B is now an anti-self-dual two form. And I have states of both positive and negative helicities coming from this twistorial construction quite naturally, but they um, have a BF type Lagrangian. Um, and as you know, if I were to add a deformation term to my Lagrangian proportional to trace B squared, then um, that deformation would give me a theory that's perturbatively equivalent to ordinary Yang-Mills in the first order formalism, but I'm just focusing on um, the BF type theory today. Um, so I have this self-dual uh, gauge theory in four dimensions with states of both helicities, um, but this four-dimensional theory actually fails to be twistorial at the quantum level. It doesn't have a 60 local twistorial uplift, um, although classically the correspondence is perfectly good. Um, and the reason that it, uh, that it fails to be twistorial is, is pretty simple. Um, it's that the holomorphic BF theory in twister space actually suffers from a one-loop gauge anomaly. So it's just not a well-defined theory at the quantum level. Um, and that anomaly is encoded in a familiar box diagram. Uh, however, there's a nice mechanism to cancel that gauge anomaly and obtain a, a nice twistorial theory 
uh, as a result in four dimensions. And that will involve coupling to the additional matter sector that I mentioned. Um, so the anomaly cancellation for these uh, twistorial theories was studied in these papers. And there's a nice green Schwartz mechanism uh, that permits uh, the anomaly cancellation. So I'll add some extra degree, uh, an extra degree of freedom whose tree level exchange will precisely cancel the one loop box diagram as is familiar uh, from the green Schwartz anomaly cancellation. Um, so this mechanism works uh, for particular uh, gauge algebras and I'll focus on the pure gauge theory case today. Um, one can also cancel the anomaly for more general algebras if you also add matter. And I think that will be an interesting case to study, but I, I won't focus on that case today. So by adding in this extra anomaly, cancel uh, anomaly canceling contribution, we'll obtain a twistorial theory in four dimensions. And um, I'll just tell you the, uh, the four dimensional uh, answer for, for what this anomaly canceling contribution is. So we get an additional real scalar field uh, that I could call the axion because it couples to the F wedge F term in the usual way. And it couples with some coefficient that's precisely tuned to cancel the gauge anomaly on twister space. Um, and this axion has a, perhaps a somewhat unusual quartic kinetic term. Although such kinetic terms may also be familiar in, in other contexts uh, where they arise to cancel conformal anomalies in four dimensions. So at the end of the day, in sum, we get this four-dimensional conformal theory um, that comes from self dooley yang mills theory coupled to this axion-like field. I'll just call it the axion for the rest of the talk. So that's the theory that I'm going to be interested in. Um, so let's just pause for a moment and think about the kind of observables that we could get uh, with such a theory. So if I just focused on my self dual yang mills sector for a moment, I have this plus minus propagator and a plus plus minus vertex. And from those basic ingredients, I can build a one loop all plus diagram. Um, but as far as self dual yang mills goes, uh, that's, that's all I can do. Uh, it doesn't have a very rich uh, scattering theory. Of course, I could get something more interesting if I started uh, computing form factors. So in particular, if I wanted to insert a local operator of the form trace B squared, say it's in space time position X and then integrate it uh, over all of X, um, you would naturally expect that I could reproduce some QCD amplitudes just from the combinatorics. So diagrammatically, a form factor would correspond to adding this extra bivalent vertex. Um, and so the corresponding form factors would give me um, a gluon scattering for some prescribed number of negative helicity states and some uh, and an arbitrary number of positive helicity states. So um, for my talk today, it will turn out that from the twistorial perspective or the chiral algebra perspective, it's most natural actually not to integrate over the space time position of the local operator insertion, but rather to consider it at a fixed space time location. So I'll focus on insertions of single local operator at the origin. So for the remainder of the talk, whenever I uh, talk about form factors or amplitudes, it should be understood that I'm really talking about this, this integrand version of these quantities or this unintegrated version, which again, just turns out to be most natural from, from the perspective that I'm working with. Um, okay, but of course my self uh, my 4D theory is not just self dual yang mills theory. I also have an axion. So it contributes this extra uh, vertex, which should be counted as a one loop contribution because of this uh, green Schwartz mechanism. Um, okay, so for the talk today, I'll be focusing on um, form factors that just have a single local operator inserted at the origin uh, for most of my talk. More generally, I could of course consider quantities where I have a large number, say of local operator insertions in four dimensions. Um, and to study these more general quantities, I'd want to compute their OPE, expanding, um, expanding this expression in some basis of uh, local operators with some OPE coefficients. And because the theory is twistorial, these OPE coefficients will be rational and will be constrained by associativity because it's a CFT. So in this more general context, these OPE coefficients in 4D will dress uh, the corresponding chiral correlators. Um, but I won't focus on those more general computables today. I'll just focus on um, form factors with a single local operator insertion, which are just isomorphic to 2D chiral algebra correlators. Okay, so I just wanted to start by 
presenting to you the particular form factors in the 4D theory that we explicitly computed. And we computed them, again, by um, just computing correlators in a chiral algebra. So let me tell you the answers that we got. And then for the remainder of the talk, I'll tell you where the chiral algebra that we use to compute these things actually comes from. So um, a bit of notation. As usual, I'll parameterize null momenta in the spinner helicity formalism, where lambda is related to a local holomorphic coordinate Z on the celestial sphere at asymptotic null infinity um, in this choice of affine coordinates. And that uh, celestial sphere should be naturally identified with the, my twister sphere with the same holomorphic coordinate. So we computed some explicit tree level and one loop results. So at tree level, um, we have a form factor with a single insertion of trace B squared at the origin. Um, and I've already written these uh, in a kind of a, manly fest, a manifestly two-dimensional notation that I'll explain in more detail. But you should read this as uh, J tildes corresponding to negative helicity gluons and J's to positive helicity gluons. So for this form factor at tree level with one trace B squared insertion, two negative helicity states and arbitrary positive helicity states, we were able to, of course, reproduce the Park-Taylor formula um, for color ordered MHV amplitudes at tree level. It's as you might expect from the diagrammatics on the previous slide. And similarly, with three negative helicity states and arbitrary positive helicity states, um, we get an expression from the chiral algebra uh, governing the NMHV amplitudes in a naturally factorized uh, CSW-like form. Um, we also computed a couple quantities at one loop, uh, when here, of course, uh, our axion field uh, really comes into play. So at one loop, with one negative helicity state and arbitrary, arbitrarily many positive helicity states, we have now a non-vanishing answer with a single trace B squared insertion. And we computed this form factor, and you see that we get this incredibly simple and compact result. So this should be contrasted with the corresponding quantity that you would expect at one loop in QCD. Um, and so we really see that the axion uh, contributions um, are canceling a lot of non-trivial contributions on the gauge theory side and giving us something in total that's extremely simple. Although of course we computed it from a chiral algebra point of view. Um, so again, this, uh, this kind of bolsters the contention that these twistorial theories are extremely simple and the formulas that we should expect from them are quite nice. Uh, and finally, uh, I just want to mention another one loop result, um, in part to emphasize that trace B squared is, of course, not the only interesting local operator that we could insert um, in these form factors. So if I wanted to study a process, say, with all positive helicity states, um, it can be interesting to insert or choose as my local operator this axionic uh, contribution. And so by the Green-Schwartz mechanism, we know that tree-level axion exchange cancels that one loop, um, that one loop box diagram. And more generally at endpoints, we expect that uh, suitable axionic uh, processes will cancel the corresponding endpoint one loop uh, gauge, um, gauge diagram. So by choosing a local operator whose role in life is to precisely kill the axionic dynamics, uh, we are left with, or we've managed to isolate the corresponding all plus one loop diagram. So again, from a chiral algebra perspective, we're able to reproduce this famous uh, one loop formula uh, for gauge theory. Okay, so those are the things that we've computed so far. Um, as I said, we computed them uh, by, by computing uh, chiral algebra correlators. So in the remainder of the talk, um, I want to introduce the chiral algebra to you and explain where it comes from. Uh, and I'll do this in uh, a few steps. Um, so first, let me ask, uh, is there a five minute warning uh, on Zoom that I'll be able to, to get at some point? What, what sorry? Oh, is there a, going to be a five minute warning just because I, I can't see the screen? Yes. Uh, so uh, so um, you have approximately five minutes left, I would say. Okay, great. Thanks. Okay, so in the, maybe in the last a little a little longer than that if you need. Sure, sure. I can uh, take a couple extra minutes if that's okay, but, but it should be fine. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so for the remainder of the talk, let me just tell you where this chiral algebra comes from. And I, I know uh, uh, that it's been a long day, so I'll try not to, to belabor this point too much. But let me start by telling you the chiral algebra generators. 
Um, so the generators of my chiral algebra or the states in the vacuum module come about quite simply by considering particular on-shell background field configurations in my 60 theory that are localized at particular points on my twister sphere. So here's an example for curly A with some uh, distributional delta function uh, coefficient that's localizing it. Uh, and this corresponds to those uh, generators uh, J that I told you were associated to positive helicity states. So similar configurations for curly B uh, correspond to the J tilde operators that were in correspondence with the negative helicity states. So these are some on-shell uh, gauge theory configurations in six dimensions. So by the Penrose transform, I can relate them immediately to on-shell uh, gauge theory states in four dimensions. And in particular, it turns out uh, you can check that these kind of localized field configurations are in fact conformal primary states with respect to a natural action of the Virasoro algebra. Um, and they have negative uh, integer conformal weight as one can check. So correspondingly, uh, these will reduce in four dimensions also to a basis of conformal primary states with negative integer conformal weight. And in celestial holography, these were recently identified as kind of conformally soft modes. So these generators that I'm producing should be identified naturally in four dimensions with um, the algebra generators of conformally soft modes. Um, now, for computing scattering and form factors, as usual, it's more convenient, or it's often more convenient for us to work in the momentum eigenbasis. So I use this notation on the previous slide, where I've resummed the soft generators with appropriate powers of the energy to recast everything in the momentum eigenbasis instead. Uh, so in total, we have four towers of generators, the J's and J tildes that I've mentioned before, and we also get uh, two additional towers coming from the 60 uplift of our portic axion. So we get a large number of generators with mostly negative integer conformal weight. So we have some very large and quite non-unitary chiral algebra. And because this chiral algebra is non-unitary, it actually has an infinite family of possible conformal blocks, which means um, uh, an infinity of possible ways to consistently define correlation functions that are compatible with the chiral algebra OPE. So the analogy to have in mind here is the WZW model uh, on a, that chiral algebra on the boundary of 3D trans Simons theory, which you may remember, uh, depending on uh, your boundary geometry, can have interesting families of conformal blocks. Here too, I claim that the chiral algebra is best thought of as the boundary chiral algebra for three-dimensional theory, but it's not the boundary algebra for a topological 3D theory. Instead, it's the boundary algebra for a holomorphic topological theory, which has a bulk local stress tensor of its own. Um, and so that accounts for um, the contrasting properties of this funny non-unitary chiral algebra with something more familiar like WZW. But nonetheless, let me explain how we get the conformal blocks from the twister space perspective, um, because uh, it has a twistorial origin as well. So we can take twister space and let's consider removing uh, the CP1 that corresponds to the origin of R4. So that leads to a space like this, and I can reduce on CP1 as usual by construction, get R4 with the origin removed, or this space. And so I can radially quantize my four-dimensional theory on this space to obtain the Hilbert space of states on S3, of course. And by, because it's a CFT by state operator correspondence, this is isomorphic to the space of local operators of my 4D theory. But on the other hand, I could instead reduce on the S3 instead of the CP1. And if I do that, I can show that I get a certain 3D holomorphic topological theory uh, supported on CP1 cross R. And I can also radially quantize that theory to get the Hilbert space of states on CP1, which if you like, um, by the kind of Chern-Simons WZW analogy, is the definition of the space of conformal blocks of such a chiral algebra. And moreover, uh, we proved that these two spaces are isomorphic. So this relates to the notation I was using on the previous slide, that a local operator in 4D inserted at the origin corresponds to a conformal block or a way of defining the correlation function in the 2D theory. So these chiral correlators um, could perhaps best be thought of as correlators in a 3D bulk boundary system where I choose a state in my 3D theory at zero and the holomorphic boundary conditions supporting the chiral algebra at infinity with some local operator insertions and I pair those things. Um, and finally, I just need to tell you about the OPEs. Um, so uh, based on what I've told you so far, it's going to be natural to consider these couplings um, that are holomorphic generalizations of familiar AJ uh, current couplings. 
um, and they're local and uh, they're localized on CP1 uh, for the reasons that I told you before. So um, to obtain kind of the OPEs of the chiral algebra that I want to study, we simply demand that these uh, holomorphic current source couplings are gauge invariant or BRST invariant. And demanding that will give constraints on the OPEs of the chiral algebra generators. You can derive OPEs by just demanding gauge invariance. Um, and the result is what we call the universal or Kazool dual chiral algebra. And of course, you might as you might expect at tree level, we just recover the current algebra for the gauge symmetry by demanding that the coupling is gauge invariant. But I wanna stress, that there's a prescription for computing interesting and non-trivial deformations of this chiral algebra at the quantum level, which these holomorphic algebras generically have. Um, and I'll refer to my previous papers for details on that. Oh, I see there's a message in the chat. One minute left. Okay, I'll wrap up. So here's the answer for the chiral algebra. So first of all, here's the tree level answer. Um, let's ignore these last three lines that just come about from turning off the axionic contributions. Uh, the pure gauge theory answer is the top two lines, and one might recognize a level zero Katz-Moody algebra that's been studied recently as uh, the celestial asymptotic symmetry algebra for 4D gauge theory. So we recover that quite naturally from this point of view if we turn off the axion. Um, and we also characterize the quantum deformation of this chiral algebra. Now, the OPE limit in two dimensions coincides with collinear limits in four dimensions, which you can see by the identification of the celestial sphere with the twister sphere. And so these quantum deformations are related to, in this case, one loop collinear splitting amplitudes and the corresponding amplitude for gauge theory has been understood and it contributes uh, to this OPE of the chiral algebra at the quantum level. Um, but it turns out that if we turned off the axion contributions and only looked at the gauge theory OPE, and, in, and studied this quantum deformation for the one loop collinear splitting amplitude, um, we would fail to get an associative chiral algebra from this quantum deformation. In fact, the axion contributes also these normal order terms, which restore associativity for the self-dual gauge theory with states of both holicities. So I just wanna emphasize that. Um, and I would love to have a, a more kind of four, intrinsically four dimensional characterization of these normal order terms that restore associativity from axion exchange. So we completely characterized our algebra at the uh, our chiral algebra at the quantum level, um, and I'm out of time, so I'm just going to conclude by uh, resummarizing the main theorems that I told you about today that we proved. So we have a correspondence between the 2D chiral algebra and 4D physics. Conformal primary generators co uh, coincide with conformal primary states in four dimensions, or uh, states in the boost eigenbasis. The OPEs coincide with collinear limits in 4D conformal blocks to local operators, and then putting these pieces together, uh, correlation functions in the 2D chiral algebra can be related to form factors in the 4D theory. Um, and I think there's a lot of interesting questions left to explore, um, so I'll leave this slide up. Uh, in particular, I think it would be very interesting to study self-dual gravity with these methods. As I say, the methods generalize to any local twistorial theory. Self-dual gravity also suffers from a one-loop gauge anomaly, um, but there's work coming out soon uh, that will teach us how to cancel it, and therefore this prescription could be employed um, in that case. Um, and finally, maybe for this audience, something I hope to think about more um, in the near future would just be uh, whether this perspective can be at all useful for studying more general QCD amplitudes or perhaps coupled to matter um, by trying to isolate these interesting multipoint axion exchanges that are canceling a lot of the transcendental contributions uh, in these amplitudes. Um, and perhaps uh, this can give a useful alternative perspective or useful formulas uh, for more general things. Uh, but I'd, I'd like to dig into that and understand precisely what this construction can tell us in a bit more detail. Um, so that's uh, all I have time for. Uh, thanks for your attention and um, hope to see you all in, in person soon. Thank you very much, Natalie. Um, is there any question? Tim has a question here. No worries. Um, sorry, I have two quick uh, very dumb questions. The first one is about the all plus one loop uh, amplitude you were able to get. So of course you want all the J's, but how did you know to put down uh, Laplace in a row? Why not another trace B squared at one loop? Um, 
Right. So uh, I wanted a local operator that when inserted would serve to get rid of the axion dynamics. So I have a 40 conformal theory. So I have no non-trivial scattering in my full theory, which means I'm expecting that diagrams corresponding to axion exchange have to cancel um, the one loop diagram coming from the all plus amplitude engage theory, um, because those things have to sum to zero. And we saw that most explicitly Schwartz mechanism at four points, but it also works at endpoints. So I chose that um, axion uh, local operator precisely to kill off the axion contributions. And so I, I would I was left with then um, the all the corresponding all plus amplitude. I see. But if if you put trace b squared, would you have just gotten zero, or would you have gotten some yeah. mess? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, the other question. Sorry, this is like probably really really dumb. The twister representative that you have for the axion, I guess you called it eta? That looks like it needed to be yeah. a, a, a 2-1 form on twister space? Totally, yeah, it's a 2-1 form and it's actually constrained. Um, there's an additional constraint that one has to impose. Um, okay, sorry, I think you're uh, answering my, my question. eta is zero. Okay. Because naively yeah. you thought it had to be an H1 valued in one zero forms. Mm -hmm. So is that what your constraint yeah. reduces it to? Yeah, there's, um, so depending on your perspective, it can be nicest to think about eta as coming from a twist of closed string theory. In fact, that's where this anomaly cancellation comes from. Um, but if you think about this from a B model perspective, you can naturally exchange the eta for something like a poly vector field. Um, or you can wedge it with the holomorph or the meromorphic form on twister space to get a two one form. Um, but additionally, I mean, in either perspective, you have uh, this del constraint which um, is also best imposed homologically, but the details are a little bit messy. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Okay, maybe I can ask a question. Um, so how far did you get in looking at gravity in this formalism and can you see any double copy structure? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, because we did, so we didn't work out the details of anomaly cancellation in gravity. So everything we did in the that uh, in the papers that appeared on archive are very classical. So we can easily reproduce the tree level W one plus infinity chiral algebra. Um, but again, self dual gravity fails to be twistorial at the quantum level. So you need to add something else to cancel the anomaly. And there's upcoming work by Biddleston, Skinner, and Sharma that does that in detail. Um, and they promised me it's going to appear this month. Uh, but so once we have that anomaly canceling sector, I think um, then we'll be able to uh, kind of run the same program. And in particular, I think uh, there's been work in progress by some authors um, comparing collinear limits with algebra OPEs in this case as well. Um, but yes, I think it would be extremely interesting to actually compare the form factors and chiral correlators and see if you can see these structures. But first we need to just nail down the anomaly canceling piece before we can really dig into that. Thank you. Other questions? Natalie, this is Lance. So what's worse, failure of associativity in 2D or failure of unitarity in 4D? What's worse, a failure of associativity in 2D <laughs> or failure of unitarity in 4D? It sounds like if you want the associativity on the boundary, you need to give up unitarity in the, in the 4D theory. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if it's, if every um, 4D theory re that realizes an associative chiral algebra has to be non-unitary. Although, so twister, the twister space construction will guarantee an associative chiral algebra. But yes, those theories are on their own or some non-unitary things, but perhaps they could be completed with massive states to some nice unitary structure. I don't know. Um, as, as to what's worse, I mean, I'll say that for holographic motivations, I would like to have an associative chiral algebra structure because I, I understand what would be a, some kind of putative dual CFT structure better when I have associativity. Um, 
you know, I don't think, I don't know if non-unitarity is, is so bad in 4D. Maybe I'll say, I, I don't know, I, I'm being filmed, so I don't want to commit to an answer. Clearly there's trade-offs and maybe what, what you want to give up at a given time depends on precisely what you want to compute in the setup. So maybe I'll be agnostic. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, any last question? Otherwise, let's thank uh, uh, Natalie once again. And let's give a round of applause for all speakers in the day.